Assassin's Creed. What is left to say about the series? Since starting in 2007, we've gotten 11 main games in Ubisoft's flagship franchise, all exploring different eras and unique protagonists. Gamers are all too familiar with the centuries-old struggle between the Assassins and the Templars. We have run across the rooftops of so many historical settings to assassinate so many historical figures hell-bent on world domination that it has become second nature to us. But 11 games is a lot, and in 2017, Ubisoft's Golden Goose had begun to lose some of its panache. After a series of disappointing releases, it was time for Assassin's Creed to completely reinvent itself from the ground up. The series had gotten too familiar and stale for a premise based on mystery. The appeal of unraveling a secret conspiracy for world domination in a different time in history had become formulaic, and the company wisely took a year off in order to return to the drawing board for the yearly franchise. And thus, Assassin's Creed Origins was born. The company had gathered its best and brightest in order to create the greatest Assassin's Creed ever for the franchise's 10-year anniversary. A soft reboot, retooled as an expansive role-playing game, far more open-ended than the previous installments. The game would be a prequel in order to introduce the lore to a new generation of gamers while staying true to the originals. We had Jean Godon, the game designer of Assassin's Creed 2, Ashraf Ismail, the creative director of Assassin's Creed 4, Martin Schelling, the producer on Revelation and the Prince of Persia games, and Sarah Shashner returning to composing after her incredible work on Unity. And we had Anna Mercier as lead writer, known for... Known for... Ogoki Knights? Oh my god! Look who it is! Oh fucking fuck! March! I was born and raised in a furrow. Fucking got laid for the first time, lost my virginity in a clear cut. And I tell you where I'm going when I die, straight to the swamp, man. You're gonna be dinging your shovel off rocks for the whole fucking time. It's good to see you guys. Welcome to the Agoki. That can't be right. You're right. I didn't edit that clip. This is really our new writer for the franchise? Oh. Okay then. Yeah, the reimagining didn't go exactly as planned. Though Origins was successful at launch and is generally loved by the fanbase, it also started an identity crisis for the franchise. The game sparked a division within the fanbase that has only been worsening with each new installment. Fans question whether the new games even respect the themes and spirit of the originals. The game also put into place many gameplay elements that the sequel, Odyssey, would double down on to far less positive of response. And today, with a brand new game from the same team looming on the horizon, I want to take four and a half hours, oh no, to look at exactly what this game represents for the series from a narrative, gameplay, and philosophical standpoint. What it means for the future of this franchise, a franchise that is near and dear to me. Expect full spoilers for every game in the franchise, and without further ado, let's examine Assassin's Creed Origins. Significance comes not from a single act, but the context within which it is performed. So the game starts and you're immediately welcomed by a screen that screams cash grab. A static piece of key art with advertisements for microtransactions and the next game installments. I mean, this art was used in all kinds of marketing. This menu screen looks like the decorative page of a wall calendar. In fact, I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, there it is. This feels like it was slapped together at the 11th hour by an uninspired marketing team. And nothing screams quality quite like advertising other products on the very first screen of the game. You might think I'm nitpicking, but first impressions are essential. A menu screen is important in setting the tone for the adventure to come, and can often be used to enhance the experience and the narrative. A striking menu screen can hook players before they've even had a chance to play. And it's not like the previous games had amazing menus, but they all gave you that animus feel, preparing you for the experience of being placed in the simulation, just like your modern day counterpart would. Black Flag and Unity went so far as to explain the advertisements, since the animus is... Animi? Is it animus is? Animi? Since the animi you were using in those games were corporate machines designed to steal money from consumers. It could be at least seen through a more tongue-in-cheek perspective, and there was some effort put into making the setup believable. 
Here, all pretense of satire is thrown out the window for a blatant corporate bid for your wallet, without any sort of self-awareness. The music is nice though, so there's that. But from the get-go, things aren't looking too promising. You start the actual game, and it establishes the world of 49 BC quite efficiently. We're shown the beautiful vistas of Siwa, our character Bayek and his love interest Aya going about their lives. We are given a half-second glimpse of his son, Hemu. So far, so good. We have decent visual storytelling. Showing, not telling. Ptolemy, the pharaoh, as the game so kindly indicates to us, is shown arriving into town. But something isn't right. The character card, the look he gives Bayek, and the look Bayek gives back, they all mark the pharaoh for a future assassination, which sounds awesome. What's that? You never get to assassinate him? Oh. Well, alright then. No, what is causing Bayek concern, and what you're actually supposed to notice here, is the two masked figures behind him. Hope you noticed them in the second and a half they were actually on screen. We then flash forward as we are shown the traditional corrupted memories that Assassin's Creed so regularly does, making it obvious that the masked men are up to no good. We then go back to... one year later. Hold on. I thought the whole point of the corrupted memories was that you needed to sync up with your character better in order to decrypt them in a stable manner and actually access them properly. In other words, you had to first live earlier memories in order to access the more traumatic ones. Can you skip ahead to a later memory? No, it doesn't work. Well, that sounds familiar. It was a narrative device to get a glimpse of the future, not the other way around. We keep trying to sequence memories out of order, which is why we're crashing like this. If we progress further with Shay's life in the colonies, I'm confident we can get better results from these Paris memories. Very well. I guess the rules of the Animus don't really matter anymore, huh? We're sticking to the lore. There, that is, we hold sacred, you know... I mean, what is the point of the time jump then? All it does is tell us our protagonist has a tragic past for the sake of... Mystery? I guess? But all it really does is confuse the player and creates a disconnect between him and the protagonist. We then witness Bayek kill someone who we can only imagine as one of the masked men, Rujek, while repeating what we could have guessed. And I will kill you all! Everyone who sniffed the air that day in Siwa! Something bad went down in Siwa. Spoilers! They killed his son! This scene does a good job of establishing the hatred Bayek has for this organization of masked men, his anger and his dedication to finding them, mainly through Abu Bakr Salim's excellent voice and physical performance. The intensity in the line delivery really helps the scene land despite the lack of context through the sheer charisma of the protagonist. We then cut to black and- Another time jump? Actually, I'm not even sure about this one. The transition is handled so poorly. My first playthrough, I legitimately thought I skipped a cutscene. We move from a dark pyramid to outside in a desert sandstorm without any warning or any effort for a natural transition, just getting rushed to a different space with a new character. There's no indicator of whether this is immediately afterwards, weeks later, earlier, or if these scenes are related in any way. The dialogue alleviates the confusion a bit, I will revenge my master, Rujek. But the timeline is still incredibly muddled. This is Hepatos, Rujek's bodyguard, who's trying to avenge the death of his master. We then enter gameplay, confused about where we are, when we are, and why we're fighting these people aside from it's a boss fight. I mean, look, Hepatos rushes up to us, but it's suddenly polite enough to remember this is the tutorial, giving you an opening. There is a clear disconnect between the player and the character. The world feels so much less genuine because of the lack of context given to the action. You interact with the game properly because you know the tropes of the genre, not because you know the characters. The game does not even try to establish a reason for the cliches to exist, and it makes for an incredibly shallow introduction to the experience. And this disconnect is a problem all throughout the game's prologue. I can appreciate that the game attempts to start in medias res, that is to say, in the middle of the action, but this narrative technique is an inherently disorienting experience for the player. It needs to be used in moderation, but the game instead revels in it, throwing us three different intros in the span of three minutes, the one in Siwa, the assassination, and the Hippotos fight, as we skip from location to location with no effort put into transitions. There's no visual cause-effect relationship drawn between them, and the dialogue is so sparse that it's easy to miss. You killed my master and left me for dead! That was a mistake! Your master was a murderer. 
I am his sworn bodyguard. It's a question of honor. In medias res functions, when characters are locked in specific activities that the audience can catch on to. For instance, Assassin's Creed 4 opens with Edward defending the ship he's on before getting shipwrecked and hunting the man responsible for his predicament. There's a logic A to B to C relationship between these events that makes getting to know our protagonist a focus for the player. In Origins, what we witness is technically linked, but these relationships are not telegraphed visually or mechanically. As far as I know, in fact, the game never states anywhere how much time passed between Rojek's death and the Hippotos fight. Bike moves from location to location, from the Great Pyramid to some random desert near Siwa without context, and the game never supplies this context. Similarly, we're never even informed how the Heron or the Ibis were identified as masked ones. Bayek just asks Hepsifa about the Ibis when entering his hometown of Siwa, and we're suddenly revealed he's Medunamun. Tell me about the Ibis. Medunamun. Is he here? He is the plague on the oasis. But this means nothing to the player. We don't know what the Ibis is, who Medunamun is, or how Hepsifa came across this information. The game never supplies the player with the necessary information to piece together these essential story beats. There is no unraveling of the conspiracy. Instead, the UI carries the heavy load of storytelling. It reveals Medunamun as a target, and we're expected to care based on our knowledge of Assassin's Creed tropes. He's now a checkmark on a list towards completing the game, not someone I have any personal investment in. This structure of withholding key information means the player spends the opening hours of the game trying to understand what is going on, looking for information that is simply not made available to him, rather than actually learning to understand and appreciate who Bayek is as a character. Additionally, in Medias Res should both streamline and enhance characterization, as who our protagonist is becomes clear through his interactions with the world and its inhabitants. Let us hurry. There is nothing to fear here. That's what scares me. And Origins does this, but only in half measures. Sure, it's nice to hear everyone recognize you and call out your name. Thank Amunre. Bayek has returned to the Oasis. It's like having our Medjai back again. Yeah. By the gods, Amun and Iset! Bayek is back in Siwa! It hints at your role as a popular public figure in the past. But simultaneously, the game does not actually delve into Bayek's relationship to Siwa or its people. Characters are introduced and then forgotten, without ever showing why they matter to Bayek beyond they know each other. Kit? Is that you? What are you doing? Bayek, I heard you were back. We are told these relationships run deep, yet this is never depicted. For instance, you spend one quest interacting with Hepsifa after he seemingly shows out of nowhere. Hepsifa! Watch out! Fire! Is that you? It is an ambush! But then after he lets you go off on your own. The game puts no effort into actually developing their bond in a meaningful way. Hepsifa's main use is to be an exposition machine for the writers as he describes the horrors Siwa is experiencing. No one in the Wahat can make a move without being questioned, threatened, taxed or beaten. We all have learned to obey and keep our heads down. You see how it is. The game is content with stating that he and Bayek are friends and have a history, so you should care also. You're told they share a beer, but never see it. I'm not saying you have to show us every casual moment they share, but you have to show some. You know, the old adage, show don't tell. One session of bow training interrupted by a guard attack isn't that. What do they do when not killing or training to kill? And the same can be said for Rabia or Chanzira. On second playthroughs, this is less of a problem, as you then know where the story is going. Quests like Hideaway actually have some depth when you understand the context. It's my fault about Khamu. They asked where you were, and I didn't think it would hurt anybody if I told them. Chenzera, don't feel bad. You had no way of knowing what they would do. Anyone would have done the same thing in your place. I guess. But as a first-time introduction to the game, it utterly fails. Everyone in this introduction is aware of Bayek's past, yet it is never talked about. In fact, Bayek avoids discussing it as much as possible. Are you going to go to your house? Nothing there for me. Promise me you will not become consumed with your vengeance, Bayek. I think of nothing else. By the grace of Amun, one day I will be free of it. 
When everyone's connection to the past is not developed in a natural way, all it does is create a disconnect with the player. He feels left out, like an observer on the sideline rather than a player in this story. In Media Service is a technique that should allow you to jump into the action, but it should not come at the cost of characterization. When done properly, the player should naturally unravel who they are as past events reveal themselves. Look at Assassin's Creed 4 again. We were thrown in the action, but never felt we were missing information or context. Characters were introduced and developed naturally, with clear personalities contrasting to Edward's, and our protagonist's actions were always clear at a first glance because of this. Yet as we progressed, we learned more of his past and realized he was more complex than we initially believed. In Origins, the introduction uses the opening in the middle of the action to skip that step of characterization. Narrative motifs and the protagonist's entire drive are not properly introduced until the flashback at the one hour mark, making the prologue ring hollow. The player takes on episodic side quests in order to level up, not because he's invested in the themes and character choices. It's as if the developers were terrified players would grow bored if they didn't immediately play the game, and rush to the gameplay at the expense of context and narrative depth. By withholding essential knowledge, it hurts the player's ability to relate to the characters or the world. Very quickly he checks out, losing interest in the story, not caring about anything beyond following the little yellow diamond that indicates the place he needs to go to next, because that's all that's left. The gameplay. The developers hope you'll be wowed enough by the gorgeous rendition of Egypt that they've created to be immersed, and it does work on the gameplay standpoint, but not a narrative one. The game expects you to go around the world accepting quests and killing people because that's what you do in games, not because that's what you understand your character would do. So until the reveal of Bike's motivation, the narrative experience is incredibly lacking. So let's look at these actual motivations. Bayek eliminates Meduna Moon, the Ibis, and their discussion triggers flashback memories. We discover that he had a son, Chemu, who was accidentally killed by Bayek when the masked men attacked them. So this is going to be another story of revenge. What is that, our one, two, three, four, fifth in this franchise? Great. Even then, it's a shame that we spend so little time with Chemu, and the dialogue is so unsubtle about his approaching demise that we wind up feeling very uninvested in the character. Oh, Papo! I'm so excited to be Magi one day! You know all the secrets of Siwa. What if I never go up to be a Magi? Uh, of course you will. You are my son. In Assassin's Creed 2, there were hints at a tragedy approaching, but we got to spend a good hour with our family before it struck. Here, not only do we wait two hours before giving our character's backstory, even once we are given it, it winds up being rushed within five minutes and has us very unattached. The scene exists less to develop Chemu, Bayek, and their relationship, and instead exists more to give us the backstory of the Leap of Faith. Guess Ubisoft can check that off their list. We prequeling now, boys! Who needs an emotional connection when we're filling everything with this fan service? This lack of investment in anything is a problem when the entire story's plot revolves around our character's attachment to Chemu. This death should make us feel justified in going on a vendetta, murdering an entire organization in order to avenge our son. But we don't. Yes, it's sad. I'm not heartless. I can understand the pain Bayek is going through, but only at the most basic level of empathy. I feel bad because Bayek lost his son, not because the character of Chemu is dead. Chemu's entire screen presence was built around his death, and it makes caring for him so much harder, making it difficult to put yourself in the shoes of the protagonist you're playing as. The stone circles give us some desperately needed additional moments with Chemu, where Bayek talks about different facets of life with his son in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But these are limited to voiceovers, which really restrains their potential impact. Papo, what is best in life? My friend Kenan said it was to crush our enemies and to hear the lamentations of their women. Speaking of impact, everything about this scene is predictable. You feel no surprise, no shock, and thus no anger towards those responsible. Chemu's death is telegraphed so hard and handled so awkwardly that the tragedy of the situation is seriously undermined. The audience sees the death coming from a mile away, and the cutscene direction only heightens this. The overuse of slow motion makes the entire process seem avoidable. We feel Bayek had time to stop, that he could have shifted to the side to save his son or something. The snake takes that as your answer. Yeah! The game insists he didn't, that it all happened in the blink of an eye. Imagine if the execution of Ezio's family played in slow motion. 
it wouldn't have the same impact. It would lessen that feeling that things happen faster than Ezio could react. Father! I'll kill you for what you've done! And that's not to say the preventability of Chemu's death couldn't have been used to emphasize Bayek's tragedy. The idea that all this was avoidable, pitting some of the blame onto Bayek, could have been used in the story. It could have highlighted his grief, perhaps some feelings of guilt and responsibility regarding his son's death. I mean, he was holding the knife after all. Had he approached things with a clearer mind instead of being driven by emotions, his son might be alive. But the game never explores this aspect of the character. The only reference to guilt we see is this line. Perhaps he is the masked one that forced my son's death upon me. Everywhere else, the story focuses instead on his rage, on how he holds the masked ones accountable without ever questioning his responsibility in the matter. What cause of you to kill me? It was you who murdered my son before my eyes! I'm still looking for the men who killed my son. You defiled the dead and enabled the people who killed my son. The game continually insists that Bayek is a classic tragic hero, a poet of the kill as the game keeps repeating. Bayek, you are a poet of the kill! I will write a play for you someday, Bayek. Bayek, we are blood poets now. Cold, calculated, poets of the kill. Remain in our tempest of blood poetry. I like this idea. It would be really interesting for a game set in the classical era to take on a structure similar to the plays written around then. But Bayek is not that. Classical Greek tragedies, such as Sophocles' Oedipus Rex or Antigone, are built on this idea of the inescapable embrace of fate, highlighting how the protagonist's flaws and hubris drive the decisions that lead to their inevitable downfall. Chemu's death is never framed as such. It's presented throughout the game as being the fault of the masked men, not Bayek's or even the gods. His role in the matter is never brought up. He's never made to question the fact that he held the knife, never challenged to study his actions. Bayek and his flaws are not the root of his son's death. We have an example of this immediately after the flashback, when Medunamun states, You could not even save your own son. Only to be brutally murdered and raged by Bayek rather than having him ponder the accusations. And here is your nobody! The game presents him as entirely justified in his murders and vindicates his actions as he kills half the population of Egypt to put his son's spirit to rest. There's no depth to our protagonist's plight, only paper-thin justification for the game to happen. So what's left? Just another story of revenge that brings nothing new to the table? You can't even argue this is the first time a child is the one who dies since we saw 13-year-old Petruccio Auditore hang back in AC2. All that's left to distinguish Bayek's journey is his religious side. In ancient Egyptian culture, the heart was the source of the life and being. It was essential in order to reach the afterlife by weighing it against the feather of truth and justice. Any damage to it would have resulted in a second death, in which all parts of the soul would be destroyed. In other words, without a heart, you could not reach the afterlife. And since Chemu was stabbed in the heart, he could never reach the field of reeds. This is an interesting angle to take the story in. But I wouldn't be surprised if most players never caught on to this. It's never explored in game. We're never told that the stabbing of the heart was an important factor in Bayek's Mendetta. This essential symbolism is never elucidated or expanded upon, making Bayek's reactions difficult to properly understand. In fact, the game never really delves in any cultural nuances in the story, limiting everything to the surface level. I will cut the heart from the boy. Oh, wait, 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 wait. He will never know the afterlife. The whole game. Baig's journey is presented as a trial of emotional revenge, not one driven by religious beliefs. And I fully believe it could be both, but the game makes no efforts to present it as such. It feels as if it was a lucky coincidence on the writer's part rather than something they actually put any thought in. If I need to do additional research into side novels and actual Egyptian history to properly understand my character's motivations, then the game has failed at presenting a coherent narrative. Ultimately, ask yourself this. What did the story gain from having Chemu's death in a flashback? The memory itself doesn't recontextualize the first hours of gameplay. We're not shown Bayek's relationship with Hepsifa or Rabia before things took a turn for the worse. We only hear mentions of Aya, a character who's revealed later to be crucial to the game's plot. We never get to see what kind of a couple they were, or how they acted as parents. This could have helped us better understand why they're both driven by revenge, given clues into how much they lost and sacrificed. 
but the game never explores this aspect of their past. We don't even see Siwa in its prime, the whole sequence taking place on the outskirts of the city. Contrasting happier times could have given context to Baik's shock when returning to his hometown. But it doesn't. All this flashback does is introduce a character we know is doomed to die. It clarifies Baik's quest moving forward, but it doesn't improve any prior sequence. In fact, it undercuts the death of both Rujek and Medunamu, as they occurred before we were even given our protagonist reason to hate them. In some cases, it just raises even more questions, such as why the Masked Men didn't kill Bayek after knocking him out. We thought you were dead. Oh, that explains it, I guess. So why even hold off with the reveal in the first place? Because the player will grow bored if they have to endure a few minutes of character development before being thrown into a boss fight? Prior Assassin's Creed games managed to blend tutorials through story beats really well, allowing for the gameplay to enhance the story and vice versa. Here the pacing hurts the game's narrative in order to rush to the gameplay, and it's really sad to see. Either way, the flashback ends and Baig rejoins Hepzibah, who sends us off to Alexandria to meet Aya, our wife, ending the game's prologue. Goodbye, my friend. This long journey serves as an intermission, and we're introduced to the game's modern day, and... Oh shit! Layla, you need a refill on Cyclosporin. Stat! Layla! Wakey wakey! Layla? Layla! <laughs> Come on back! Wait a minute. Is it... is it actually pretty good? We have a new third-person protagonist, Layla Hassan. She's working with Abstergo, and is trying to prove herself to the company in order to join the Animus Project. Along with her friend Dina Gary, who's off-site, she's testing her modded Animus on Bayek's mummy, which she was only supposed to retrieve. Immediately our protagonist is presented as proactive, or at least more so than Desmond. She's unaware of the evils of Abstergo, making her uncovering of the Assassin's Templar conspiracy an interesting character beat to come, especially as she's currently working with the villains. And we have a small little area to walk around in, promising some minor exploration. The game is pitching some interesting developments to come from both a narrative and a mechanical standpoint, which is great to have after the blank slates the franchise had had since Black Flag. All in all, a really good first impression. After this quick introduction to the new face of the modern day, we're thrust back into the game proper and... Oh, you have got to be kidding me. This is the best title card you could come up with. No build-up, no slow transition into it, no narrative heart, just a rushed, pre-baked view of Alexandria? This is beyond belief! The music just fades in midway through the main theme, as we go from a load screen straight into the title. It's almost as if the developers forgot to include it and then had to scramble to place it somewhere, anywhere. I wouldn't be upset, but previous title screens included this... and others I will bring up later, trust me. These reveals tied into character moments, presented the world in dramatic ways that sparked emotions beyond, ooh, what a nice view. So anything less sticks out like a sore thumb. This is just shallow, as if the developers expect you to be impressed and invested because they reproduced all of Ptolemaic Egypt. Prior title screens showed they were telling a narrative with themes, now it's just displaying their technical achievement. Even Black Flag, that had a similar title reveal as we loaded back into the Animus after the Modern Day's introduction, at least took a few seconds to build up the reveal. It let you bask in the atmosphere of Havana for a few seconds, as the music slowly grew more bombastic, until the title reveal. Here, there's nothing. No time to waste, guys. They need to know they're playing an Assassin's Creed game. But the reveal should not take a second longer than it has to, otherwise the player might grow bored. Title screen even ruins its own dramatic unveiling. 
When you take control of Bayek, you're in the middle of the desert, the dunes blocking your view. You need to ride over them to discover the true scope of Egypt. This could have been a neat way to involve the player, allowing them to discover the view on their own time, if the developers hadn't already spoiled that site less than a minute prior. How is it this game has a two hour prologue, yet still feels rushed? Is it because the developers were more focused on recreating the map of ancient Egypt than inhabiting it with compelling characters and engaging gameplay? We wanted that the exploration of the world to really be jaw-dropping. We wanted people to be lost in this world for hours and hours, so the game is quite huge. The world is massive. I do not care. You must help him. That pretty face is his only asset. You go around doing side quests as you move up towards Alexandria in order to meet up with your wife Aya. Along the way, we help people in need and meet more characters that have a history with Bayek that we don't share. But what doesn't take long to realize is how gorgeous the game's rendition of ancient Egypt actually is. I honestly have nothing bad to say about it. The game's aesthetic is absolutely jaw-dropping, with details crammed into every corner. You truly feel the sweat and tears that hundreds of artists at Ubisoft put into making this world. The game manages to make a map that could have just been desert feel varied, full of mystery, and encouraging you to discover everything it has to offer. Those moments as you ride alone in the desert truly have a lonely beauty that few games can emulate, as you're surrounded by nothing but sand, but feel the presence of civilization in the far distance. Every desert seems to have a story, such as how a viewpoint in the Mariotas Desert is an abandoned boat, hinting at how the lake used to stretch all the way out here, or how the Black Desert feels more mountainous than any of the others, all of which contrasts with the lush areas bordering the Nile and the Mediterranean. Every area feels like it has its own identity, as do the cities. Alexandria is at the image of its population, a mixture of Greek, Roman, and Egyptian, as poor and rich live in varied districts. Meanwhile, Cyrene is fully classical, a population composed of only Romans and Greeks. Siwa feels more quaint, abandoned on the edge of a desert, and Memphis feels messy, built on top of the river and intercut by canals. When you add on top of this the aspiration the game has to be historically accurate, you really can appreciate the effort that was put into this world. NPCs also contribute to this, breathing surface level life into the world. Every single one is given a routine as they change activities throughout the day. You won't see people cultivating or hunting at night as they're in bed. There is true effort put into giving a feeling that every single character has a role to play in society and strives to achieve it, roaming around the map with clear intentions compared to the purposeless NPCs of old. Taking elements from games like Far Cry, the fauna acts in a systemic way. Should different beasts meet each other, they will fight. It's not uncommon to find the dead remains of an animal that was hunted by another, and should it be left alone for too long, vultures will come and feast. They will also attack humans, giving you opportunities to save NPCs for small XP rewards. This systematic approach to the game breathes life into the ancient world in a way few other games have managed. It really gives you a sense that things are going on in all of Egypt, even when you're not looking or following a quest. Even better are the scrolls, items you can find in the world that indicate to you the location of hidden treasure not marked by a question mark on your map. You need to read actual descriptions and use your actual skills of observation in order to find the loot, similar to the treasure chests in Black Flag. They help present the world as more than just a series of points of interest the player needs to discover and complete the arbitrary objectives at. Every location is also rife with letters and messages that add a bit of spice and soul into them. You can read the messages left by a mason on tomb walls, or letters of disgruntled soldiers in camps that give every location an ongoing history that makes the world livelier, distracting from the copy and paste nature of many assets. The world is huge, varied, lively, and all around beautiful. Back in the story, you reach the Great Library of Alexandria, where you're contacted by Aya's cousin, Thanos. And for the first time, Bike's reaction mirrors my own. I wrote a tragic comic pastoral epic centered on him. Ah. They've never met before, that's why. He explains Gennadios, a Philakotai, which is a kind of bounty hunter, is hunting Aya, who's now in hiding. Oh, right there! Hm. Have a little faith. You get to her hiding spot and... Whoa! Hello there. I missed you. <laughs> this is Aya, wife to Bayek and mother of Chemu. 
and she is uh, really eager to be reunited with her husband. Let us be together. Us two. Each to each. Except not really, because the conversation immediately switches to the subject of murder. I have news. I bludgeoned Medunamun with this. That is um, an odd tonal transition. You bang and then Aya reveals she killed two of your five targets. I killed as well. Off screen. With barely any explanation as to how she identified them. Cool. Would have been nice to be involved, but whatever. This isn't helping how foreign this whole revenge story is when three of the five kills occur outside of gameplay. Everything is flying by so fast I have no attachment or hatred for anyone involved. Just the most basic, let's find the members of this list because that's how the story will progress. What, you expected to get to assassinate people in an Assassin's Creed game? Game barely seems to want to have me around and won't let me avenge Chemu on my own, taking the reins away from me. One more person to kill immediately becomes two when Aya sends us after both the last masked man, the snake, and Gennadios, the man hunting her, for the murder of two others. We have one more. Then, we will be done. In addition to the snake, I will see what I can learn of this Gennadios and silence him. Okay. Aya adds her information is coming from Cleopatra, much to Baik's disdain. But Cleopatra? She's been declared a criminal. As has been firmly established, he believes the Ptolemies have failed Egypt and holds them responsible for the ills of his homeland. It is Ptolemy's sick regime. He is a bad pharaoh. Ptolemy. He has brought great sorrow to us all. He destroys their statues and claims to be Magi to no one. I want you to keep this in mind for later. But it's okay. Cleopatra gave Aya a hidden blade to help with the killings. That's enough to get Bayek on board. <laughs> Ingenious. After one easter egg for old timers like me... It's an ancient blade that killed the tyrant Xerxes. You are let out into the open world with your new weapon. So now might be a good time to look at this game's gameplay loop. Assassin's Creed gameplay has been built from day one on three core pillars. Combat, parkour, and social stealth. We identified our three main gameplay pillars. So the fight, the navigation, and the social stealth. This combination not only defined the franchise, it also distinguishes it to this day from every other game on the market. Other games may share one or two pillars, but never all three. In no other game can you hide in plain sight in a crowd until your target comes to you, fend off his bodyguards after you assassinate him, and then escape by climbing the nearest building. These are the elements designed to make a game where you feel like an assassin. At GDC, Jean Goudon, creative director on Origins, shared the Ten Commandments of Assassin's Creed, the rules that the franchise must never break, the ones that feed into the game's fantasy. Uh, with the com Ten Commandments of the franchise. And rule number four states, the assassin should always be agile, socially skilled, unbeatable with a blade, and a stylish badass. The ability to leap from a building with parkour, to hide in a crowd with social stealth, and a strong combat system all feed into this fantasy. So let's look at how Origins managed to modernize these aspects. So let's start with social stealth. What's that? It's gone? What do you mean it's gone? Like, do you unlock it later in the story? No? They just removed it completely. You can't hide in crowds? Or interact with them in any way? And large crowds are entirely gone? Can you at least hide on benches? Oh. So let's start with parkour. In theory it's fine, and even expanded. You can still climb up buildings, and they allow you to scale virtually any natural surface which is pretty cool. But when you look at it for more than a few seconds, it becomes quickly obvious that the system has been completely stripped down to its basics. Climbing anything is interesting, until you realize it means that climbing is just a question of walking towards any surface. In prior games, climbing a cliff required you to find specific nooks and crannies in order to properly make your way up. You needed to approach the parkour with a degree of realism and forethought. Now the process is mindless, with climbing up a wall being as simple as pushing forward towards it, as Bayek Spider-Man's his way up any surface he sees, aside from some specific monuments such as the pyramids in the Lighthouse of Alexandria. The parkour requires no skill whatsoever. So many moves that gave the parkour depth have been removed over the course of the franchise. 
Things such as the ledge grab, back and side eject, the manual jump have all been taken out for the sake of streamlining the parkour, but in turn have taken away player control. There's no opportunity for expression beyond what the developers intended. Don't expect to do anything crazy like this anymore. And in a way, it makes sense. Ancient Egypt is not a map built with complex parkour in mind. Most buildings are one story high, and a large portion of the map is fields and deserts. One of the regions that is most common to use parkour in is the mountain ranges, but those are so huge that the developers couldn't limit where you could climb. But unfortunately, the game's focus on natural environments over urban ones means the parkour system has been completely gutted. That is not to say the cities are designed in ways that work with the systems in place. In previous games, parkour had a reason to exist. It allowed for faster horizontal travel. You see, particularly in the early games, getting to an objective by walking through the streets was actually an irritating process. The streets were labyrinthine, and bumping into crowds would slow you down a huge amount. As such, you naturally climbed to the rooftops, where the environment was less crowded and you could get to your objective as the crow flies. Yes, it was a little ridiculous that Altair couldn't run down a street without falling over after brushing against someone, but it served the mechanics, forcing you above the streets. It put you in the shoes of a loner assassin, living his life apart from the rest of the population, and forced you to put the parkour mechanics to good use. In Origins, however, parkour no longer serves this purpose. The streets are wide, pretty much empty, and bumping into civilians doesn't slow you down. And the cities have layouts that are straightforward, with large main streets intercut by perpendicular side ones, making the fastest way to get around just calling your horse and bolting down one of the roads. There's no longer this serpentine layout that made you zigzag in the most inefficient ways if you stayed on the ground. There's no incentive to climb on the rooftops. In fact, it tends to slow you down as the buildings are so spread out you can only cross streets by finding the rare clotheslines. Similarly, outside of cities, the map is so large and the routes so flat that there is little reason not to use a horse to get from point A to point B, making parkour essentially superfluous, and only included because it's an Assassin's Creed game and it needs to be here. So what use does parkour serve aside from reminding you that this game bears the name Assassin's Creed? Well, it's the easiest way to move upwards by climbing along cliff sides and diving down into chasms, but that is precisely the problem. The focus of parkour has shifted from a system made to encourage horizontal movement to one that encourages vertical movement. The parkour button is no longer a parkour button, it's a climb button. Parkour used to work for the franchise as it fit the core loop of investigate, assassinate, escape. It helped encourage players to outrun guards by jumping around rooftops in ways they couldn't. Vaulting used to play into this, so that even when running in the streets, there were ways to optimize your speed. The tutorial area had you vaulting over objects with fancy animations, something you can't actually do in the open world. It's as if the game's opening was tricking you into thinking the parkour was more complex than it actually is. The reality is that the fastest means of travel in the rural areas, as well as the urban ones, is on horseback. Now that the parkour is designed with this vertical focus in mind, parkour is less of a requirement to escape enemies. Again, the easiest way to run away is to get a mount and ride it out of there. If you try to climb your way out, you can, sure. You'll be hit by arrows, but it barely matters as the game no longer punishes you for climbing at inopportune moments. In every other game in the franchise, if you were hit while scaling something, your character would lose their grip and fall to the ground. This nudged players to make their way up using the poles and crates laid out as it made for faster movement. Climbing straight up the wall was discouraged, as it was a slower, less efficient, and more punishable process. But now that those are barely an option anymore due to the level design, the game doesn't even bother punishing you for approaching parkour in what is both the simplest and least challenging manner. Ultimately, the parkour system feels it's been simplified to the point of mindlessness, in part due to the map layout. The core utility of the mechanics is completely undermined by other ones, and its presence here is solely so that the game can still claim to be an Assassin's Creed game even though it completely misses the point of its inclusion. So what about the combat? I mean, that's gotta be improved at least. As the game director Ashraf Isma so kindly reminded us. We've drastically changed the paradigm of what is fight. You know, we looked at combat and we said, okay, we need to bring something fresh, something new, change our paradigm completely. The combat has been built from ground up. We wanted to go with a, a different paradigm. I think the combat's gonna really impress people and surprise people. It's something that's new. We've built it from ground up. Uh, with a very different paradigm. So how did the combat system turn out? It's fine. It's nothing special, really. 
The developers took heavy inspiration from the hitbox-based systems of games such as Dark Souls and Witcher 3, with light and heavy attacks. They had the right idea in implementing a more involved system. By removing the one-button counters of yore, the combat actually requires the player to take positioning into account, as he observes which weapons the enemies are using and looks for openings to attack. Counter-attacks are actually satisfying to attain. Yet for all its design improvements, and it is a better system than the old one, it never really clicks with me. Combat is entirely bogged down by the game's RPG mechanics. The system is more determined by facing your character's numbers versus that of your enemies than your actual skill. When they are at your level, the system is actually fairly satisfying. The fighting someone even a few levels above you turns them into an absolute damage sponge as you wallop them and they barely react. Conversely, if they hit you once, you immediately lose most of your health. In other RPGs, there are systems in place that allow you to offset the numbers game. To use Witcher as an example, yes, combat works similarly, but the game also gives you signs, potions, and oils that can be used to turn the tide of battle. If you get damaged, you can heal yourself with potions. If you're not dealing damage, there are oils to bring yourself up to level. And if you're outnumbered, signs allow for crowd control. In Origins, there is no room to outplay the game. Once you're in combat, you're in combat. If you get hit, well, there isn't much you can do to gain health back. You could wait it out or have a weapon magically regenerate it for some reason. If you're not dealing damage, well, I guess this fight is going to be a slog. The RPG mechanics ruin any urgency the combat can have. Either you're underleveled and you can't win, or you're overleveled and the game becomes an absolute cakewalk. You never feel you're outplaying enemies, dodging into their attacks and punishing them when they leave an opening. You're just gaming the system in place, pitching your numbers against that of the enemies. This would have been fine if it was done to encourage running away from fights you can't win, but as stated before, the parkour is an afterthought. The map lacks the verticality necessary for outrunning enemies. You're not going to be ducking in and out of alleyways to lose them. Odds are if you run, you'll be hit by a stray arrow you couldn't possibly dodge, and that will instantly finish you off. And no, the addition of selectable difficulty levels doesn't help with this. All it does is change enemy health, so you get to choose between the game being incredibly easy or the enemies becoming damage sponges that are dull to play against. This completely ruins the feel of what should be a visceral combat experience. The enemy's excessive health turns into more of a joke. I mean, look at this animation. I just stabbed right through this man, but he's okay. He's still alive. The same thing here happens to me. Yeah, now I'm just gonna shrug this off. Biocan enemies have barely any reactions to getting hit. Hitting someone doesn't consistently stun them as they dodge around you no matter how wounded they are. You can set a man on fire and he's just going to keep fighting you as if he hasn't even noticed. <laughs> I guess you got to appreciate the commitment, but it makes everything feel artificial and unsatisfying. From a gameplay standpoint, it makes every encounter feel less intense, less exciting. From a narrative standpoint, it makes it obvious these enemies exist in the world for no other reason than to fight you. They went through the trouble of giving them day-night routines, having them take a leak in bushes, and yet they have no instinct of self-preservation whatsoever. Enemies stand until they ragdoll, and that's it. Remember how in early games guards would run away in fear if you murdered too many of their companions? It made these underdeveloped clone models feel more alive than anything in Origins. Or let's compare the animations when you throw a weapon. Die, you dead dog! You should see the <laughs> yeah, it's not even a contest. Origins animation is far slower for a weaker final result. That kind of says it all, doesn't it? The system is longer, drawn out, and yet has none of the weight and impact behind the old games. In previous games, if your attack connected with an enemy, you felt like it hurt them. Here it feels more like a pantomime fight. I mean, I remember when people complained that Ezio should have defeated Rodrigo Borgia far more efficiently, but at least he had an Apple of Eden. What's this random thief's excuse for surviving this? The issue with animations is worsened by how few there actually are. Hope you like seeing the same overpower move every fight, or this finisher, again, and again, and again. And again, trust me, this gets repetitive really quickly. And sure, you could switch weapon types, but that seems more like compensating for the game's blatant flaw than an actual solution. Enemy types also don't help. Hope you like small guy with sword, small guy with sword and shield, big guy with club, and big guy with spear and shield. 
because that is all you're going to be seeing outside of boss fights. Combat systems such as these live and die by the variety of situations they can thrust the player in. Outside of boss fights, once you've gotten into one encounter, you've seen them all. It quickly becomes obvious that the heavy attack is superior in 99% of situations, so you use that until your special attack is charged, and then you activate that for invincibility frames and an unblockable attack. Rinse and repeat. By the end of the game, every fight goes like this. Hey, what? Which really just demonstrates how restrictive the system actually is. So while the combat shows promise, it's let down by the RPG mechanics. All this time and effort put into this new combat system, and ultimately it only varies between unfair and unchallenging. We've drastically changed the paradigm of what is fight. The change we decided, the paradigm that we shifted is we went to what we call a hitbox system. But back to the story. You do a bit of investigation and find out the identity of the snake. Who he is actually doesn't matter. Do you care? I don't care. It's some guy you've never met who you're going to kill. You head to the bathhouse to get him and- Oh, you have got to be kidding me. Really? Really? This is how the game frames your first assassination with the hidden blade. With the blade distinctly not hidden? This just looks stupid. I mean, how blind is everyone around you? The whole point of the hidden blade is that it's an unexpected way to kill someone. And here it is, just sticking out in the open, much like Bayek. This kill is the living embodiment of this game's disregard for the fantasy of being an assassin. The setting is nice, but the crowd is only set dressing. There is nothing you can do to upset them, and it takes a lot of effort to get anyone's attention. You can climb up a wall and apparently no one finds that suspicious. You can't pickpocket or interact with anyone. This isn't gameplay, this is a glorified cutscene. It's as if the developers knew they should have included social stealth, and so they decided the first kill with the hidden blade should be in a social setting. But once again, why would you pick a setting where the hidden blade isn't actually hidden? Is it so that we get this moment? <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. You know what? Let's talk about social stealth and how its absence from this game is an insult. One of the core fantasies of Assassin's Creed was hiding in plain sight, being a blade in the crowd. It was literally one of the core tenets of the Creed. The second tenet is that which gives us strength. Hide in plain sight. Let the people mask you such that you become one with the crowd. From a mechanical perspective, it enhanced the games, allowing you to interact with the world in a creative way that made it feel more tangible. You viewed the NPCs as part of the mechanics, a random element of the game that the player could use to his advantage, adding depth. But more importantly, it added character to the games. Becoming a part of the crowd conveyed that fantasy of being always ready for a fight. It was a superhero fantasy, that dream of having a dual life and a secret identity. Assassin's Creed gave you that feeling of being an infamous vigilante, ready to spring into action at the moment your enemies least expected it. And the franchise did so through its mechanics as well as its narrative. You know, like a video game should. Every game introduced new aspects to the mechanic. Two had groups for hire, Liberation had the three persona, Unity had gigantic crowds, and Syndicate had taking hostages. All of these highlighted different aspects of the secret life of assassins, much like parkour. It added to the mystery of the brother, that feeling that the person you least expected to start a revolution could be its instigator. And the hidden blade was part of that fantasy, as you extended your blade while everyone around you was oblivious. It was the physical embodiment of being a secret killer, a blade in the crowd, removing social stealth from assassins Creed is like removing hacking from watchdogs or disguises from Hitman. You can't do it without completely destroying the core fantasy the franchise appeals to. And yet, here comes Origins, throwing this major pillar out the window. So now stealth no longer makes you feel like a hidden badass, a man with a hidden persona waiting in the shadows. No, you're just another straightforward badass, the guy that walks down the street and people say, watch out, that guy means trouble. God knows we don't have enough of those. This is stuff we had down path from the very first game. Do you remember? Because as I hear it, you chose to expose yourself, drawing attention before you'd struck. 
And sure, there's still traditional stealth, but that's a downgrade from what could be found in Unity and Syndicate. Removing the one-shot assassination was a terrible idea. In an effort to force character progression where none was needed, the developers decided the player would have to upgrade their hidden blade in order to deal damage. If they don't, they'll not be able to kill enemies in one hit. But the developers couldn't even come up with a distinct animation for when a one-shot kill fails, so it looks ridiculous. Yep, stabbed him in the throat, but he's fine. I don't know why I'm surprised. They couldn't even come up with an animation for ziplining. Bike just uses his hands and must have the worst case of rope burn ever. Or for when you try and stab the tall guards. Your hand just clips in their chest as Bike doesn't even bother going for the throat with them. Either way, this whole system just discourages using stealth because you could be going around an outpost only to find an enemy that you straight up can't kill quietly. Nothing discourages using stealth than knowing that you will not be able to silently clear the area. It could force you to ghost the environments, making your way through without ever harming anyone, but this doesn't work when the objectives in almost all the areas include eliminating commanders. The game is simultaneously encouraging the player to kill these enemies, but builds its mechanics in a way that it's likely impossible to do it stealthily before they've grinded. Gotta make sure the player enjoys that new combat system. Go out there, hunt some animals to actually play the game how you want. Go on. The issue with stealth and animations is made worse when you realize they removed the double assassination. You what?! Yeah, remember that mechanic that allowed you to quickly and stylishly take down two enemies when they were near each other we had since 2009? Yeah, well now it's replaced with the Far Cry system of chain assassinations. Let's see how that looks. Hey, what? Hey, you not have come here. Here. Uh, uh. Wow. Let's see the previous games. And back to Origins. All together now. Once again, the animations in Origins are languid and lacking any sort of weight. There's no satisfaction in getting a chain assassination when it means I stab one person and then his friend stands there waiting to die. And don't give me that Bayek only has one blade so he can't double assassinate bullshit. Arno only had one and it led to the team making even more creative and expressive animations for the attack. Hell, Origins' last cutscene shows an NPC doing a double assassination. But no, let's remove yet another feature and replace it with a slower, less creative alternative. Additionally, the game's equipment feels incredibly limited compared to previous games. Sure, the bow can be used for long range, but you can only equip one tool at a time because... reasons. I guess a weapon wheel is too dated a technology now. Poison darts and firebombs rarely come in handy, since you will most likely be carrying a weapon that also deals either fire or poison damage, making these gadgets redundant. And the same can be said for sleep darts. And anyways, in this game you have the bow that works at long range and is silent. In old games, sleeping darts served a purpose, as they were your only means of eliminating enemies from afar without a gunshot. In Brotherhood and Unity, you didn't have sleep darts since you had the crossbow and phantom blade anyways. So sure, you can try and raid a camp non-lethally using the darts, but really there's no incentive to do so. So sleep darts are also redundant. But they let you tame wild animals, so that's neat, except it's worthless outside of combat. What does that leave? Using berserk darts is limited to lower level enemies, so you can't even use it to gain an advantage in a fight you're outmatched in. At least you still have smoke bombs, could sabotage alarms. Compare these options to previous games, where not only did you have more tools, you could switch them without having to go to the pause menu, and could use them in combat as well as stealth. The selection here is blatantly limited, and a downgrade from past games. The inherent appeal of stealth is outwitting enemies that hopelessly outgun you, except here you can't. Stealth can't be used to play dirty, to gain an upper hand on higher level enemies, only to quietly deal with enemies you could probably take on in a one-on-one -on -one fight anyways. It's just a different playstyle, just as limited as the combat. Not that any of this matters, since the AI is some of the worst I've ever seen. Here's a clip of a guard accidentally firing an arrow on his mount, poisoning himself and dying. Stop! You! I rest my case. Once again, these guards have no sense of self-preservation, jumping around trying to find you rather than act in any rational way. You just have to poison one body and they will repeatedly step over it until they drop dead. Yeah, I really feel like it took every skill I have to outplay these idiots. 
Assassin's Creed AI was never the most brilliant, but you'd think 10 years after the release of the first game, we'd have seen some kind of improvement. Sometimes the game just seems to entirely give up on stuff, creating ridiculous situations. I mean, look at this quest. Follow the merchants. Yeah, I'm following them, standing right on top of them. They really don't seem to care, so why should I? I know people disliked the tailing missions in previous games, but like everything else, they fed into the fantasy of being an assassin. I don't think leaving them in while also removing any gameplay they had was the solution. Eagle vision was removed and replaced with drone vision. Bike's bird can mark points of interest and enemies for him, allowing him to see through walls. At first, it seems like a neat alternate means of discovering the world. It gives you a view you couldn't enjoy otherwise. It's a decent mechanic. I mean, it worked well in Watch Dogs. Though same as in that game, it can turn the UI into a mess, as the screen gets covered in the outlines and numbers of every enemy in the vicinity. It undermines the work put into the gorgeous environment by covering it in a needless immersion-breaking interface. Yep, really need a guy pinged through 30 walls right now, game. It sometimes even spoils story beats. Look at this quest, where I accidentally ping an enemy in an underground cavern I didn't even know existed. Rather than naturally discovering the secrets of these runes, the game just tells me what to expect through its UI. I'm not saying the old systems were perfect, but I don't remember this much UI clutter ruining my immersion in previous games. To make things worse, the game never makes any effort to justify this narratively. Eagle Vision never made much sense, but at least there was an attempt to explain it. Here Senu is just thrown into the game, and we're meant to accept that this magical bird exists in this supposedly historical setting. According to Ashraf himself, scenes that delved into their bond were cut for pacing reasons. So yet again, important narrative elements are glossed over for the sake of making sure players are killing more than they're thinking. And all that we have left are a few cute animations, and zero explanation for the existence of this game mechanic. Every mechanic is included because it's Assassin's Creed, but implemented in a way that fails to understand their reasons to be there in the first place. Just look at the assassination of the snake. The game is quick to remind you that your input in assassination doesn't even matter. You stealth your way to your target, get the drop on him, stab him, and then in the next cutscene he's fine. And even gets the upper hand on Bayek. This is the Assassin's Creed equivalent of beating the boss but losing in the cutscene. If you want me to miss my target, then don't actually show me catching him off guard. Previous games got this. Once they were dead, they were dead. No bait and switch where the narrative and the gameplay are at odds with each other. It just makes me less invested in properly assassinating future targets when the first one you attack with the hidden blade is actually a failure. So why is this? Is it so we can have Baig lose his finger in the fight? Great, really worth undermining core mechanics for the sake of some half-baked lore and fan service. And the memory corridors only add to this. Sure, they're here to make a statement. This isn't your grandpa's Assassin's Creed. This is the new, slicker one with dramatic conversations as the environment shifts around our characters. And it looks good. The cinematography is actually pretty great in these scenes. But I can't help but feel it completely misses the purpose of these confessions. I always thought they served as moments of quiet after the storm, a moment of peace that contrasted nicely with both the action that had come before and the escape that would take place just after. The music would cut out, and there was really this sense that it was a simple moment where the protagonist got to talk in a one-on-one -on -one with the person whose life they had just taken. And there generally was this sense of respect between the two, bred from the calmness of the scenes. And I mean, it makes sense, right? They just got stabbed in the jugular. You don't really expect your target to be dancing the mariachi. But now we have these moments where the two characters battle it out Dragon Ball Z style, and it just doesn't have the same feel. In the case of Meduna Moon, you kill him once in gameplay, and then Baig does so a second time in the cutscene. In prior games, once you got the kill, you could feel it was just a matter of moments before they dropped dead. It felt far more involved, as if you were the one who got the kill, not the character without your input. In Origins, the player's role in the story is superficial at best. It falls in the pitfall many long-running franchises fall in of always going bigger and better. They tried to make the coolest, best-looking confession possible without looking at what they added to the pacing and why they were employed in the first place. They look great, but now assassinations are always turned up to 11, even after you defeat your opponent. And it makes your victory over them less satisfying when you're still fighting them even after beating them. But the role the scenes play in the pacing of assassinations is an afterthought now anyways. 
Most assassinations transition into cutscenes. Even if guards are still around you when you kill them, it doesn't matter. Look at the assassination of Medunamun. There are guards around me when I stab him, but the next time we see Bayek, he's walking casually. I guess he didn't need my help to get out of that situation. Great, I love feeling left out of my game's narrative. Most of the time, after completing a main assassination, the enemies despawn in order to let the storyline happen in a cutscene. What were you expecting? Having to employ parkour to run away from armed thugs in an Assassin's Creed game? In the past, even if the kill happened in the cutscene, you were still expected to deal with the outcome and escape. The gameplay loop looked like this. Social stealth, assassination, memory corridor, escape, cutscene. But in Origins, they removed the interactive consequence of the assassination, and the gameplay loop looks like this. Stealth, assassination, memory corridor, cutscene. It's a straight downgrade. So this new, more intense approach to the memory corridors makes sense given Origins removed the interactive consequence of the kill and replaced it with action and cutscene, which in an interactive medium is a straight downgrade. So ultimately, what did Assassin's Creed gain from becoming an RPG? Not much. We have a new loot system that constantly undermines story moments. My personal favorite is when Hepsifa dies and you're gifted your dead friend's weapon. But because of this system, you're probably only going to use it until you find a better weapon, which won't be long, at which point you'll just drop it and never think of it again. Really hammering in how much this death affects Bayek there, game. Hepsifa would have wanted you to have this. The weapon he prized above all others. I am honored. We also have a skill tree, which is pretty much worthless. Many of the skills are ones your character should absolutely have from the start, such as parrying. When Bayek arbitrarily learns how to carry more than one weapon at a time by spending a skill point, I don't feel he's grown over his journey, discovered something through his and my experiences. I only feel like I've bypassed an arbitrary limitation the developers imposed on me. It doesn't even make your second weapon appear on your in-game model. The non-equipped weapon just magically appears when you switch. Beautiful. And many other skills the game offers you are ones that just give you more XP from different kinds of kills, or deal an additional percent of damage. Great. Once again, I'm really not feeling like Bayek is growing as a character. The system is far too abstract and gamified for that, and thus it's difficult to really care about your unique character's build. Ultimately, there are too few skills to actually give you new moves and tools to work with. Older games did limit the abilities you used, but they were tied to story beats, creating a bond with the character as they learnt new skills alongside you. So, how did I do? I've seen better. Ah, you wound me with your cruel, cruel words. Here there's no sense of progression, only one of jumping through artificial hoops placed arbitrarily by the game designers. And I know you can amount it to the Animus, your XP and level representing how in sync with Bayek you are, allowing Layla to use skills he actually always had. That doesn't change the fact that this system only makes the early hours of the game a slog, as you grind to get some essential skills. It was irritating when Unity did it, and it's annoying here. The RPG system is not designed for exploration of character and player expression. It limits the player for the sake of artificially creating a sense of growth, while undermining significant story and gameplay beats throughout the game. Mechanics are introduced due to their prior existence in the franchise without any consideration for their implementation or lore. About that dead end. That never happened, I was misquoted. But speaking of lore, let's look at Baya cutting his finger real quick. This is a prequel that aims to explain all Assassin's Creed iconography after all. Telling an origin story, you get to put some pieces of the puzzles together and explain a little bit more to the player. So they must have gotten that right. Right? Assassin's Creed 1 and 2 established that the blade required the removal of the ring finger, until Altair brought modifications to it. Though the blade once required a sacrifice, it's been modified. You can keep your finger. The ring finger sacrifice was a neat piece of fluff in the lore that added to that feeling of being part of a secret organization. But in comes Origins, and suddenly this was never a requirement? Just a recommendation? Born out of a mistake when Bayek wore the blade incorrectly? I have no difficulty in believing that the removal of the finger was more symbolic than it was practical in Assassin's Creed 1. In fact, I quite like the idea. But the games have clearly mentioned the blade was modified to fix the issue. Let me just ask, what change could fix the risk of cutting your hand with a blade that extends right next to it? When you look at the animations in all previous games, the assassins always extended their hands in a way that kept them safe. The risk was clearly always there. So Altair's modifications weren't foolproof. So what differentiates the original blade from the modified one? As far as I can tell, they function completely identically. Was the modification just a note saying don't extend the blade with a clenched fist, dumbass? Fascinating. 
It wouldn't bother me so much if the game wasn't about the origins of the Brotherhood. I never questioned how Edward could just clip the blade on his wrist, or how the blade was modified over the years, because those were details, like I said, fluff that added to the spirit of the games. I can think of a hundred different explanations for any of these problems. But Origin's whole premise is explaining all these pieces of lore, and all it manages to do is make things more convoluted by discarding previous rules and refusing to explain anything. We, we actually wanted to make a game that was completely coherent with the games that have already existed, right. with the lore, with the universe of AC. That, yeah. that was actually important for us. Either way, Bike loses his finger. Hope you like how much of a trial that was for him, because it'll never be mentioned again. Ubisoft checked that point off their list. So Bayek, having instantly recovered from his wounds, heads off and kills Gennadios, who tells us in another overly dramatic Animus Corridor what we knew, I as a killer. Your whore of a wife is a murderess, wafely and wantonly. Bayek doesn't even really have much of an answer to this either, so I think he actually knows he's in the wrong here. Anyways, turns out killing a member of a paramilitary group of mercenaries is not a great idea, as Gennadios promises his compatriots will hunt you down. This introduces the closest thing the game has to a wanted system, except it isn't that at all. In previous games that bothered with infamy, such as the Ezio games and 4, how hunted you were was always dependent on your actions. The more you killed guards or raided ships, the faster enemies would identify you as a wanted criminal. It let the player feel that their actions had true repercussions, and was often used to add even more mechanics, as the player tried to lower their notoriety, either by tearing down posters or bribing officials. It fed nicely into the fantasy of being an assassin, otherwise known as a wanted man. Origins tricks you into thinking it's introducing such a system, but in reality it's all smoke and mirrors. All the Philakotai represent is one higher level mini-boss in each region, one who just roams at random, never actually hunting you, and never reacting to your actions. As long as you stop any distress beacon from getting lit, you could completely decimate a guard outpost, and the local Philakotai will not care more or less than if you'd let them live. It makes for an incredibly shallow system. From this moment onwards, you always know where they are, and once you kill them, they're gotten for good. Clearing a region's Philakotai means you'll never have to worry about their presence in the vicinity ever again, no matter your actions. There's no sense of them actually hunting you personally. I could understand if these guys were given any sort of unique personalities, sacrificing a more player-driven system for a narrative-driven one. Each mini-boss could demonstrate a unique perspective on Bayek and his crimes. Maybe they could use different unique movesets, make them actually play like mini-bosses that catch the player off guard. But no, they're just more of the same enemy types, just at a higher level, so that on the off chance they catch you off guard, they'll one-shot you. Just great. So after having murdered two more, you reunite with Aya, and you bang. Again. She doesn't even have a reaction to your missing finger. You just show up, tell her who you just killed, and she says she wishes she'd been there with you, and then you do it, right there, right now. It was Eudorus. He died flailing in the baths. I wish I had been there. You just murdered two men, have been told more are coming for you, but you're still going to do it for the second time today? Aya's introduction and her relationship with Bayek has generally been really bizarre. In their first scene together, we go from them sharing an intimate moment I missed you. <laughs> to talking about murder I bludgeoned Medunamun with this. To them having just done it I've missed your touch. I have missed touching you. Only to start talking about murder again. I killed as well. Now this could be an interesting way to present our characters, as so consumed by the thought of revenge that it finds its way into every aspect of their relationship. The revenge brings them as much carnal pleasure as sex, if not more. If I am honest, I took pleasure in it. Yet the game presents these as genuine, intimate moments, not ones that should leave us uncomfortable, or at least questioning our protagonist's morals. My wife. My wife. So instead of exploring the inner turmoil of a couple consumed by revenge, the scenes read more as two sociopaths who get off on murder. I hate that we have to do these things. But I am grateful that you did. It's at the very least a little tone deaf. The problem is their relationship under normal circumstances is never explored. So as far as we know, 
This is basically their status quo. We never see or learn much of how they interacted before Chemu died. Aya actively avoids speaking about their son. Well, we only have each other without Chemu. Let us be together, us two. So their inner feelings about the situation are unclear. Aya claims to hate having to murder, yet is still in heat enough to do the hanky-panky with Bayek, then boasts about the murders she's committed. And though Bayek expresses some kind of concern to her having taken a life, he immediately reminds her they still have more killing to do. Later, we see Aya and Bayek in the post-sex afterglow, and they're still talking about murder. Is that just how they talk dirty to each other? By listing the people they've killed? Bayek expresses concern that they've not killed all the masked men. What if he was not the last? So these two really are psychopaths. You can't even argue that them having sex after killing the snake was after they satisfied their need for revenge as parents. No, Bayek feels his job isn't done. It's still concerned about needing revenge, but it didn't matter. I had snoo snoo. Look, seriously, this wouldn't bother me if I knew why they love each other besides them both being healthy and attractive. But I don't. All it would take to remedy this would be one normal conversation between the two. Each to each. The game refused to show them together with Chaimu in the flashback, so you have to give me something. And this is not for another 10 hours, so no, this doesn't count. I buy they're physically attracted to each other, but why are they married? Why do they love each other? I couldn't tell you without reading the prequel book. And don't worry, we'll get to that in due course. In previous games, romance was always presented as something that bloomed from experience. You know, like in real life. We understood why Haytham fell for Zio, why Edward cared for Mary Reed, what Ezio saw in Sophia. We saw them in context that didn't involve murder, and it made their relationships feel genuine, raising the stakes in later sequences. Even Claudia, who appeared in one cutscene and two, felt more genuine with this line. May I come in? Fine, but only for a minute. A minute is all I need. Indeed. Well, wait, uh, that came out wrong. You feel there's a history there, moments that have been shared before the events of the game. Here, Aya's role and her relationship to Bayek are integral to the writing, so how is it this aspect is glossed over? Why is their past, their history, deemed not worth exploring? Right, because any superfluous writing is unwanted here. Can't let people grow bored by making them feel emotions. Either way, this ends Act 1 as we cut back to Layla and... Aya's here. Who's Aya? Bayek's wife. I can feel her nearby. You can feel her? Pretty sure that's the bleeding effect. Um, excuse me, what? There. What is it? The bleeding effect is leading me to Aya. Oh god, no. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. Well, there goes another chunk of lore. The bleeding effect is a disorder wherein people who spent too much time reliving memories in the Animus started to confuse what was real and what were memories. They perceived both simultaneously, causing paranoia and multiple personality disorder. The important thing is that it was still tied to the memories you relived. So why does the bleeding effect lead Layla to Aya's mummy? Look, I'm no expert, but I'm pretty sure once you're dead and mummified, you're no longer making memories. It makes no sense that a memory of Bayex could show Layla that Aya is buried at the bottom of a cave-in that happened presumably after his death. I could come up with a thousand convoluted explanations, but the game never tries to justify it, indicating some serious plot holes in the writing. This whole thing is triggered by Layla experiencing doing the hanky-panky with Aya, twice. You could see how an emotional experience like that could trigger some memories, but the game never explores it. It's really upsetting when this entire premise could lead to some really interesting exploration of gender identities, how experiencing sex from the opposite gender could influence your view on things and your emotions. But no, we've got to get the player back in the animus as quickly as possible. No time to waste on themes and interesting sci-fi concepts here. This whole portion of the game grows even stranger when the game ends with Bayek and Aya parting ways seemingly indefinitely. So why are they buried together? Is it so Layla can get both their DNAs? So that we can play Aya for all of five quests? I guess plot convenience really does trump narrative. I mean, the bleeding effect used to be a real concern. The representation of how spending too much time in the Animus was dangerous. It put pressure on the modern day sections, as Desmond could constantly be on the verge of losing it. Symptoms? What symptoms? Degradation of cognition, temporal hallucinations, Multiple awareness issues, overlapping realities, you know. So what you're saying is... What we're saying, Desmond, is if you're not careful, you may not need the Animus to visit with your ancestors. This tension was even greater due to Subject 16's story. 
The process of reliving the past completely destroyed him physically, and the risk was always present for Desmond. After 3, the games dropped this whole aspect of the modern day, but with the return of a voice protagonist, I'd have hoped they'd have brought back this aspect in order to raise the stakes. But no, it's now just plot convenience, something the character uses in their stride rather than something that could possibly worry them, and you know, create drama. Oh great, more fuel for your superhero complex. The player has always got to be the coolest person in the room, and everyone around you must know this. Can't have a character who blends into a crowd and can't have superpowers come at any cost. The player is always right, never to be challenged. The whole thing is made even worse by Dana's reaction. Everything she says in this section is true following established lore, yet Layla blows it off as the ramblings of an overly cautious friend. She isn't! She's correct from a lore standpoint, so why is the game downplaying her? I don't know if this is rushed or the game trying to hide the fact that the established rules of the Animus no longer matter. We're sticking to the lore. There, that is, we hold sacred. Anyways, we return back to Bayek and his uncertainty that his quest is done. After pandering to every 12 year old playing this game, Aya directs Bayek to Apollodorus and Cleopatra to verify if they actually killed the right man. Instead, it's revealed that the five men we killed were part of a larger organization that are manipulating Ptolemy and that exiled the queen. But the writing in this scene is bizarre. After making a point that Aya was satisfied with the assassination, and Bayek wasn't... What if he was not the last? Of course he was the last. They are all dead. Justice is done. Suddenly they switch sides. Bayek is all... And why should I care about them? And Aya is all... He was not the last one. All of these are... The whole reveal that there is more going on rings hollow, and I think it boils down to how underdeveloped their desire for revenge has been from the start. And look, I know Bayek is told, The snake takes that as your answer. With the snake being the whole organization. So you could argue that that is what's driving Bayek, that he wants to put a stop to the snake, whether it be a person or an organization. But the scene plays out so quickly, and Bayek is so willing to keep killing, that this nuance really isn't made clear to the player. In fact, I would argue the game's UI worsens this reveal, causing a disconnect with the player again. Look at the target screen. Wow, I truly can't believe there were more people to be added to this list. I mean, no, 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 only five people to kill for sure. The empty space is really not that important. The game essentially spoils itself with this screen, as anyone would guess that these five targets are not the only ones. The player fully expects more is at play, and thus the reveal of the snake being a larger organization has no impact whatsoever. Compare this to Assassin's Creed 2, where the circular structure of the web, mixed with the random placement of targets, left you guessing exactly how many people were involved in the conspiracy. Or Odyssey's Cult of the Cosmos. From the start, you knew how many people were involved, and the game doesn't try to catch you off guard with a half-assed reveal. The whole reveal that the snake is an entire organization rather than an individual doesn't land because one, we've been dealing with a group of individuals from the start and fully expected more to come, two, the player was never made to piece together the identity of its members outside of Eudorus, so has built no expectations, and three, Bayek reacts so nonchalantly that I wouldn't blame players for not realizing the protagonist had made an error of judgment in the first place. So the snake is the Order of Ancients? Yes. Eudorus was known as the Hippo. We need decisive action. It is time for assassinations. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! Bayek just accepts that he must go on killing more, without any sort of hesitation or soul searching regarding the five men he already killed based on erroneous assumptions. We still have not found the man who killed Remu. Our son shed will weep with joy when we clear the map of those figures. So it shall be. If the reveal wasn't meant to surprise me, it wouldn't bother me. But the game goes out of its way to remind you that Bayek is after five individuals. He had the names of his targets tattooed on his body for Pete's sake. We never learned how he obtained those names since they were never mentioned in the vault, but whatever. He was driven. From the start of the game, we were told Bayek was after five men. Four more. The game really wants us to believe his quest for revenge will be over once he's killed five, although only two in gameplay, but you get the idea. And the uncovering of the conspiracy is supposed to come as a shock to Bayek, but has no impact because every player expected it from the very start. So the scene just feels like a necessary beat to keep the story going rather than a scene that adds narrative in any way. 
Baek's goals have changed, but not his motivations, which makes for very dull character development. They added more of the same goal, but with no change to the actual characters. Anyways, Baek quickly decides to ally with Cleopatra to help him achieve his vengeance, becoming her personal Medjai. After once again banging Aya, Tonight, we drink, celebrate, make love. Snoo, snoo! Can't we just cuddle? No! <sighs> Our hero ventures off to stop the four new targets spread across the land. Oh wow, I'm sure these guys will be the last ones. There definitely won't be anyone after these four. No, no, no. The things I do to save the world surprise me time to time. So now we enter what is the bulk of the game. Hunting the scarab, the hyena, the lizard, and the crocodile. The structure becomes the traditional Assassin's Creed shtick of travel to new city, reach out to your local contact, find the oppressor of the region and assassinate them, and the game manages to vary it up quite efficiently throughout. However, in order to progress through the story, you are expected to level up by doing side quests. When you reach Saïs, your contact Harkouf recommends you help out the locals in the hopes to find out more about the Scarab. It's a neat idea! The game is attempting to recapture the feeling of Assassin's Creed 1's investigations, where side quests gave you clues and information about who your target was, where they resided, where guards were going to be. It really gave you that feeling of planning out your attack, like preparing the perfect heist, gathering all the information you needed to execute it perfectly. Unity emulated this feeling with opportunities, and Origins does it with its leveling system. Except it really doesn't work in Origins for one simple reason. The game needs to let you do the quests in any order. As such, while the side quests do give a bit of perspective on how the Order of Ancients affects the lives of the people, helping them never really yields any information on them. You'll be given some generic comment about how much control the Order of Ancients has on the region, or how powerful they are, but you never feel like you're getting closer to them, that the net is closing in on them, or that you're unraveling any sort of conspiracy. This is because the only way to get any information on your targets is through the main quest, and this becomes increasingly obvious as the game progresses. The game acts as if you're closing in on them, but this is all smoke and mirrors. You can do this quest before or after the target's death and it doesn't change anything. It even makes the game's overall pacing feel worse when you assassinate your target, but NPCs still talk about them as if they were still alive. Like the quest feeding Fayum. If you do it after killing the crocodile, you still find a letter from her and the butcher claims to work for her. But she's dead, so where are these payments coming from? Or in the quest Odor Most Foul, where this guy references the lizard and Bayek reacts as if he's never heard the name before, even though he's already killed the lizard. Watch out for crocodiles. And lizards. Did you say lizard? It means something to you. Uh, I've heard it whispered in taverns. Rumors only. It feels like there should be some alternate dialogue for some of these quests, which the game does. Kamshetje. <laughs> I think I have already solved your problem, Benipe. And I didn't even know it. Like three times? Maybe. Here are your tools. And look, this would be fine if the story was pushing for this no matter what Bayek does, it's all in vain. Cut off one head, two more shall take its place kind of thing. But it's not. Bayek is presented as the instigator of change, improving the lives of the people. They won't let another crocodile plague the Fayum again. Your people are free now. It's just lazy writing. I know this stuff can be chalked up to the animus showing memories in the wrong order, but this game went for a narrative RPG. Quests should be influenced by my progress. There should be some agency put on the player to let them feel like their work is required and helps the land. It never ceases to make me laugh that the game has a point of no return, as it casually reminds you, but as far as I know, it actually locks you out of exactly zero quests. In other cases, it can be utterly ridiculous, like the quest of Bride, about a woman thinking of committing suicide. You can start talking to her. Why don't you step away from the ledge, huh? We can talk. Leave. We used to come up here to watch the herons. Two of them built a nest together in that place. Return three days later and resume where you left off. You are sad because you did not have any. You're not very good at this, Magi. You're not making me feel any better. Sure, it's convenient for the player, but it makes the interactions with the characters feel very lifeless, like they exist for the sake of the player rather than for the sake of breathing life in the world. But what about the quests themselves? They basically boil down to this. 
Meet an NPC who has an item stolen or a friend kidnapped. In other words, a MacGuffin. Go to the bandit camp or Roman fort to find it. Carry your MacGuffin out of the camp. Return to learn something terrible happened to either your quest giver or your MacGuffin. It creates a very shallow feeling world, where missions become so predictable that Egypt starts feeling artificial. This isn't helped by how poorly these missions tie narrative into the actual gameplay. Most are barely capable of conveying any emotion outside of the voice acting, as your characters stand across from each other, unmoving, sometimes waving their arms in a pantomime fashion. There's no effort at transition from gameplay to this. If you talk to them while on horseback, you'll teleport to the ground. If they're sitting, they will suddenly stand. It makes these interactions feel artificial. At least in Unity, when quests were given this way, you still had control over your character. You could walk around the room and made starting quests, if you'll pardon the expression, feel seamless, like they were part of the world. Here there's nothing to do aside from sit around and wait for the dialogue to end, and feels completely disconnected from the game world. It's worsened with how these moments sometimes clash with cutscenes. Some quests include proper cutscenes, with cinematography and camera work that lets the player actually see the emotion in the character's eyes, but these often and transition into the lifeless exchanges. What? Why? Pick one and stick with it. A handful of quests give you proper shot reverse shot cutscenes, and it makes the characters instantly more relatable, as you see their emotions up close. It's as if Ubisoft cared for some quests, but not others, but still had a certain number required to fill the world. Speaking of artificiality, these quests constantly try to justify you carrying someone out of a camp because they can't walk, or their leg is broken, or some other excuse. I am weak with hunger and with love. Will you carry me to Teta? If I must. Yeah, all you need to do is take them three feet outside of camp, and suddenly they spring to life. Yeah, this guy really looks like he was wounded so horribly that he couldn't walk. Yep, there he goes. All on his own. Not a care in the world. This really makes Bayek and the player feel even more useless, like everyone is taking advantage of you rather than you actually needing to be there to help the people. I'd like to say I'm capable of walking, but that would be a lie. Set aside your pride. I will carry you. Don't let anything through. Time is up. I've nothing to reward you with except my thanks. So many quests are there to make you feel like the defender of the poor and downtrodden, but it's ruined by this AI that doesn't take context into account. The only other type of quests are investigations, but those are incredibly dumbed down from previous installments also. Remember how in Unity and Syndicate, you had to gather clues and then deduce the culprit using actual detective work? You could actually accuse the wrong person, and sure, the game didn't make you lose, but you did get less reward for half-assing the investigation, forcing you to actually think. The challenge didn't come from finding all of the clues, but from putting the pieces together yourself. Yeah, now I hope you enjoy following Yellow Diamonds, because that's all they amount to. Investigations end when you find all the clues, which are automatically pinged by the game. So all you have to do is interact with one clue, then the next. Eventually you will have found them all, and Bayek will then identify the culprit. I think I understand what happened here. Yep, no, that, that's great Bayek. Glad I could help, but it seems you had things covered without me. This isn't streamlining, this is removing interesting mechanics and writing without replacing them with anything. These investigations are glorified cutscenes that leave me with no sense of satisfaction when they come to an end. It's made even worse when some of these mysteries are painfully simple to solve. My favorite comes in Curse of the Pharaohs, where you meet Sutek, handling an apple. You then immediately investigate an area where someone left a half-eaten apple, yet Bayek still doesn't make the connection. The relic replaced with a half-eaten apple? <laughs> the thief has a sense of humor. It's one thing to force me through a dull detective sequence, but another when I solve it several minutes before my character does. Not that the writing in any of these quests is ever anything to write home about. The game tries to take a grim approach, but it mainly comes off as trying to be edgy. As far as I can make out, edgy occurs when middle-brow, middle-age profiteers are looking to suck the energy, not to mention spending money, out of the quote-unquote youth culture. So they come up with this fake concept of seeming to be dangerous when every move they make is the result of market research and a corporate master plan. So many stories end on downer notes even when it barely makes sense. It doesn't make your world feel deep, real, or even dark. I mean, look at the quest Book of the Dead. This old man asks me to find his book, and he looks in perfect health. I am then gone for less than an in-game day, and when I return, he has passed away, 
and I'm expected to feel bad because he won't find his way to the afterlife without his book? You see, if the quest ended this way, if I took too long, it would be fine. Really cool, in fact. Giving some weight to my choices and actions. But no, I can be gone for all of five minutes, and he still just croaks. Again, I get that's how the Animus works, but we've already established that most of the rules have been thrown out the window anyways. So why adhere to lore here, when all it does is lessen the game's impact? The whole situation is trying so hard to get an emotional reaction out of me that it gets absolutely nothing. This goes so far as to ruin moments later in the game where darker sections could have had an impact on the player. When every breath of positivity gets snuffed out for the sake of shock value, it undermines the potential of making the player truly care for the characters. You expect something horrible to happen and are far less likely to be surprised by any dark turns. Contrast is key here, something that the game greatly lacks. And yes, there are a handful of actually sweet and funny quests, such as the Flea of Cyrene or the Last Bodyguard, but they are far and few between. The best quests are without a doubt the ones that either involve children or dealing with the loss of a loved one. Coincidentally, these are the two concepts that tie the most into Bayek's story. Funny how tying your game together with themes makes it more enjoyable. These quests are great as they give us some insight into who Baik is, his genuine affection for children, and his pain for the son he lost. Hearing him show his understanding at those who share his pain really does help bring the character together, especially with the excellent voice acting. I understand your grief. That's why you knew what to say, isn't it? Did you lose someone too? Many have lost loved ones to the Ptolemies. Does it get better? It gets better. But you will never be the same. But every quest seems to have to end in violence, even when the situation doesn't call for it. Look at Thanos' questline. He's trying to get his play performed, but the censors are stopping it. So you kill them and save the actors. So far, so good. But later, you go to a party to celebrate, and again you're attacked. And again you're sent out to assassinate people. This second quest could have been the perfect moment to develop these characters, see them interact in an ordinary setting. But no, the game has to cram in its millionth combat encounter because otherwise the player might get bored. Everything feels artificial, like it revolves around the player, which is a flaw when your game is trying to create an immersive world like this one. Previous games managed to beautifully contextualize the game's mechanics into ordinary situations, like tailing a florist to find out where he gets his tulips while preparing for a date, or tracking down a bride who'd gotten cold feet in order to encourage her to go through with the wedding. Those games never felt the need to fill these little moments with combat because they were the moments that made us love the characters, that made us see them as more than just pixels dancing on a screen, and instead see them as real people that we knew and understood. Here, every moment is intercut with combat. Sometimes it works, like in Lady of Slaughter, where you're performing in a play and cannot lose the fight. Other times, not so much, like in The Bride, where a quiet conversation with Tua, a suicidal woman, is interrupted by a hyena attack. I'm not saying this is always bad, but there should be a balance here, one that Origins never achieves. Even worse, there's rarely any follow-through for any of these quests. The game continuously throws new NPCs at you for one, maybe two quests before dropping them forever. You never get a feel of the impact Bike is having on the world because of this. To go back to Thanos' questline, after all of that murder, you're just left to assume that the play is performing. You never see it, Bike never reacts to it, and it's never spoken of again. The game could contextualize, justify your actions and violence by letting you feel the impact on the world. But instead, Bike just glides in and out of people's lives, never to be heard or seen from again. This is probably the major reason the game feels so grim. Your impact on the world is never felt, which is kind of amazing when everything in this game revolves around you. These side quests seem to have been implemented to fill out the world rather than flesh it out in any way, which misses the point completely. You enter a new area that's just as downtrodden as the last, help the people, and then leave. Your actions are never given long-term consequences, and you never grow attached to characters because they will never return. The game never commits to characters or even plot lines seemingly out of fear that the player will grow bored. I would have loved to see Kara or Tua or Asiocles become recurring characters in the main game. They were charming people and their evolution throughout the game could really add some perspective to your actions. But no, the game prefers to give you one-off characters. Some may leave an impact, others may not. But ultimately you don't grow attached because they're gone for the remainder of your playthrough. Once you've gotten your XP from them, there's no reason to care anymore. Go do your hero work. Be safe, Tua'a. Go save the world, Magi.
they may as well despawn from the map, and the end result is exactly what the developers wanted to avoid. I'm uninvested and bored. And yes, I know that certain characters have bookending quests, such as Hotafress or Harku, but these are so few and far between they leave little impact in the scope of things. And I can't help but wonder why these narrative arcs of these characters found in the main story are locked behind optional side content. Adding these to the main campaign would have helped flesh out Bayek's quest. Instead, the main plot seemingly introduces characters only to abandon them without a proper resolution. By refusing to commit even to characters essential to the main plot, and then wasting all these characters' bits and side content, the game hinders its overall story structure and narrative. Ultimately, the side quests never feel like they're building towards anything. The only ones with weight are the ones that resolve loose ends from the main game. In the Ezio games, I was working with courtesans and thieves and the world seemed more optimistic. You saw cities get rebuilt, felt like helping the factions was helping your cause. Here I'm working for ordinary folk and no one seems to be able to crack a smile, and I really don't know if I'm making a difference. The game shows us the horrors of Egypt without ever focusing on the good. Depth is bred from variety and diversity, not how grim you can make everything. It's easy to make a world feel utterly full of despair, but depth comes when the characters in a dark world can still see the good in it. Without this, it never feels real. One Note worlds avoid challenging you in order to engage with you on the simplest level. For a world to feel immersive, full of depth, and above all else feel believable, it needs to display a full spectrum of stories. Origins never manages this, as it's far too focused on being a newer, darker take on the series. After Syndicate's more light-hearted spirit, fans wanted the story to be taken seriously again, but Ubisoft veered too strongly in the opposite direction, dragging the game down in the process. I want to bring that edge, that, you know, that spice. I mean, look at the most popular protagonists in the franchise, Ezio and Edward, characters who lose almost everything that they love, and yet still manage to view the world through a positive, often optimistic light. Bayek's adventure has him going from depressing scene to depressing scene, with the only respite coming from short interactions with children and sometimes friends, and even those often get twisted in a negative light. The problem is not so much how the quests are given, but just how they're presented and how they just oppose against each other. This quest design feels schizophrenic. The game wants you to grow attached to the characters, but also doesn't give them any development. It wants you to feel agency, but also doesn't want you to miss out on any content. It wants to be cinematic, but keeps cutting to these dull pantomimes. This dissonance leads to some particularly bizarre moments, such as this cutscene in Smoke Over Water. <laughs> My cousins have a farm nearby. You clear a village of looters, only for a cutscene of Jessica killing another. No dialogue, no character development for Bayek or for her. The developers just thought it was time for a cinematic. When I first played the game, I thought this was to foreshadow her joining the Brotherhood. But no, she never joins. It's just a scene. That happens. And then it's done. This happens a lot, and it makes every side quest feel superfluous. Like it's not really building up to anything coherent. And that's because it's exactly what's happening. Principle and practice are two very different beasts. So once you've leveled up enough, Bayek investigates the dealings of the Scarab. And this is when you realize the game's visuals and gameplay seem constantly at odds with the story and the player. Let me show you. You find Gupa, an old man who was tortured and had his tongue cut out by the Scarab. You return him to his family and they lead you to Latopolis, where the father of the household, Tahaka, is. After a short conversation, the game has a neat combat section in a sandstorm, as you help him eradicate bandits attacking the city. However, when you celebrate, surrounded by the reunited family, you are betrayed and realize Tahaka was the man you were trying to kill all along. I really like how the game foreshadows the poison drink by making a point of showing by expelling it earlier on in the quest. The revelation is cool, if a little rushed. You meet and are betrayed by Tahaka in a single quest. Sure, he fights bandits by your side along the way, but ultimately you've not grown to trust or bond with this man. There's no sense of deception or treachery, just, well, that kind of makes sense. He's the only NPC I really got to know. The game never tries to actually build up a friendship that is then broken. We had one simple conversation around dinner, which I was legitimately enjoying before it was interrupted. For once, the game was taking the time to let me know a character, but nope, better have him immediately revealed to be a villain. Let's rush the player off to the next section. No time to waste. It's inane pacing. 
Compare this to Belek or Horngold, who showed up regularly throughout their games, leading to familiarity, which gave weight to their betrayal, and the difference is night and day. One hits home, the other one doesn't. You then go through a neat little escape sequence where you save yourself from dying in the desert by calling your mount. But really, would it have been that hard to have whatever mount I have equipped in my inventory show up? For some reason, the horse that comes is just a random horse I've never seen, really ruining the sequence. I could have a camel equipped, and yet it's still a horse that shows up. It could have been a neat moment to show Bayek's attachment with his chosen mount, like the game constantly does with Senu. But no, Bayek whistles and a magical horse that he's never seen appears. Brilliant. You recover your equipment and go to assassinate Tahaka, in the second assassination set in a temple in this game. By the way, here again the game removes the need to fend off enemies and run away after the kill, switching to a cutscene after the assassination instead. Anyways, Tahaka's kid rightfully hates you for killing his dad, and you do truly feel Bayek's sadness at hurting this child, but he also expresses no shame at his deed. Instead he gets Gupa and his family to understand why this had to be done in one sentence. Try to make him understand if you can. You have brought blood and death to my house? You are blind. But now you must open your eyes. Your husband was a scarab. He did this. Your father was tortured and scarred by this man, as were so many others. No! It is up to you to raise your boy into the light. Why? This was the perfect moment for some introspection on Bayek's part. Is sacrificing what makes him human and relatable to others worth it to avenge his son? Is he willing to continuously isolate himself from living a normal life by being consumed by rage? Is it worth causing trauma to other children in the name of Chemu? But no, the player can't be forced to question their actions. Bayek must always be justified and goddamn this game is gonna make sure that's always the case. One quick chat with the widow and a nod from Gupa and you're let go with a pat on the back because the scarab was a mean guy. Bayek's actions are never viewed through the lens of those he harms. This is always swept under the rug. I loved him! He promised me a better life! You took him from me! Now I see. You're Rujek's mistress! Well, your fucking lover killed my son! I feel nothing for you! And I know Kawab returns in the Hidden Ones DLC as an older man out for revenge on Bayek as the Shadow of the Scarab, but all it takes is a two-minute conversation for him to turn into an ally. It's even worse when Kawab calls Bayek's assassins a gang of murderers, rightfully so, at the beginning of the speech, and then embraces them as the liberators without any explanation as who they are from Bayek. The Hidden Ones. Your gang of killers in the shadows? I will renounce my name. My family. I will find a new one as a liberator. He just goes with it because Bayek is our protagonist and therefore in the right. It's not like this series built itself up on the morally gray conflict between freedom and order. What was it again? To say that everything is permitted is to understand that we are the architects of our actions and that we must live with their consequences, whether glorious or tragic. Thank you. Bayek is the founder of the Creed, yet he is never challenged by this Maxime. The game never opposes him, forcing him to suffer the consequences of his actions or to ponder the nature of his actions and his moral code. For instance, in the quest Rites of Anubis, Rujek's wife yells at you for killing her husband, but is swept aside so fast and is so unimportant that she's never even given a name. That was Rujek's wife. Did you expect anything less? No, I expected a whole lot more. I feel bad for her, but it had to be done. Or also, the game never acknowledges that Bayek was holding the blade that killed Chaimu. Sure, ultimately the Order of Ancients orchestrated the events that led to his death, but Bayek's role in it is completely understated. For all we know, Aya is not even aware Bayek is the one who stabbed Chaimu. The topic is never brought up. This could have helped flesh out their grief, but gotta keep moving. Can't have any drama in this game, just killing NPCs in a beautiful open world. And this wishy-washy approach to the story leads to a really muddled narrative. The game keeps framing Bayek's actions in different ways, and it can't seem to make up its mind on what it wants. Did Bayek kill Tahaka to avenge his son? It is not for my soul that I walk this path. Or is it for the good of the people? I am proud to serve those in need. It's probably both, but it really seems to switch depending on what serves the scene best. I wish to bring my son to the afterlife where he belongs, not... Ah, I like you, Cleopatra. 
But the royal matters that seduced my wife do not sway me so. Our land is being oppressed greatly. I realize we cannot let the order rise again. You never get a real sense of Bayek's turmoil as he leaps around Egypt killing people, and it muddles the whole narrative. Bayek leaves by saying, I'm sorry, my son. And I don't even know who he's referring to. Is he apologizing to Tahaka's son for ruining his life, or to Hemu for no longer being the caring father he once was? I just don't know. And the worst part is, I want to. Bayek is a charismatic character. He shows across the game a wide variety of emotion and has a whole bunch of subtle animations and cutscenes to make him seem human. And the game keeps hinting at more happening under the surface, inner demons he deals with, ranging from rage to sadness to fear. But the game never establishes what his central conflict is. Bike is filled with all these feelings, and that's great, but they're often in opposition with each other. The psycho killer just doesn't mesh well with the loving father whose heart melts at the sight of children. I'm sorry. The game keeps throwing him in situations that should affect him. The scarab, the hyena, the lizard, and the crocodile all have quests that involve children in some form or another, forcing Bayek into difficult situations that should affect his various emotions, but we are never shown how he manages to balance them out. Revenge is one of the core themes of the game, but it's never explored in any way. Its toll on the individual is never placed at the forefront. Compare this to Assassin's Creed 2, where Ezio went from I'll kill you for what you've done! To Vengeance clouded my mind. It would have consumed me. Were it not for the wisdom of a few strangers. In Origins, Bai keeps flip-flopping how he feels, and it seems like he's constantly slipping through multiple personalities that don't really influence each other, like how he can go from murdering people to a loving sex scene without a hint of introspection. There's no consistent friction between his different emotional states, and it makes the character seem less genuine than he could be. Instead, he comes off as a character built to fit whatever scenario the game wishes to throw at him without actually putting effort into any of the character development. Bike is a great character, one with a huge amount of potential for growth, but the game never gives him anything to work with. He's put in situations that should affect him, but they never seem to. Aya's memories suddenly kick in. You might say that transition was weird. There was no thematic link or cohesion to what I was talking about. That's because the game doesn't care to find a subtle way to do it either. The developers are just really eager to remind you that they made Assassin's Creed 4, so they just had to shoehorn naval combat in here. And it still plays fine, like a simplified version of what was in 4 and Rogue, which is exactly what it is. It feels out of place here. Being relegated to so few missions, you have to stop and wonder why they even included it in the first place. In 4 and Rogue, it worked well because you grew attached to your ship, as you upgraded it to venture further into the world. In Assassin's Creed 3, naval missions were relegated to specific quests like they are in Origins, but at least you could still upgrade and care for your ship. Here there's nothing of the sort. This quest only exists so that the player can learn about Cleopatra's plan. She's looking to gain the favor of Pompey Magnus, sending Aya and Foxidas' mercenaries with gifts for him. The end result is this. Cleopatra offers gold to win my favor once I've won Rome. <laughs> is that what friendship means to your queen? She wants more than an ally. She seeks a king. Hmm. A valuable friendship indeed. Agreed. My fleet will soon be ready for Egypt. That's it. Hope you like Pompey's character and role in this story, because the next time we meet him, he won't be looking so good. If I can say anything positive about these naval missions, is that Foxidas is actually an NPC that stuck with me. He has charisma, seems more inclined to discuss the protagonist's issues than they are, and returns regularly throughout. So there, the game managed to make one memorable NPC. Hooray. You then return to Bayek, who moves on to find the hyena, and here things go even faster. Immediately after meeting your contact, you get their names, and I do like how the game varies up the contacts you meet. Merit's self-centered, I'll help you if you help me approach contrasts nicely to the helpful allies we found in Sice, especially when you find out he tricked you into stealing a horse for him in exchange for information. And it gets even better. Hey! That's my horse! You can't steal something already stolen, Merit. You can punish him for it. The game is actually tying in player expression into the gameplay. How about that? Shame Merit never shows up again after this quest, though. Would have been nice to see what more cons he might run. Anyways, you chase the hyena into the pyramid, and I like as you head to her lair there are packs of hyenas. It's a nice little detail that adds character to the quest. You head in and oh shit, we get our first Isu structure. And a future where, just perhaps, 
we can all still exist together. Nothing? Wow. Bike has no reaction to discovering sci-fi technology whatsoever. This is another common trend throughout the game. Bayek's lack of reaction to the more supernatural elements of the world. Throughout the game, you can interact with different pieces of futuristic technology, yet he never reacts beyond the most basic of reactions. He gets teleported Star Trek style, and this is all he can muster out. In Curse of the Pharaohs, Baia can venture into the afterlife, yet his reaction is never one beyond perhaps a slight gasp. What is this? Can this be... Aru? People tend to amount this to his religiousness, with lines like It is not meant for us! justifying his blind acceptance of things he cannot understand. But come on! He reacts to them just fine in other story sections. He has a reaction to the stupid Final Fantasy XV crossover quest, Light shining up to the gods. My Ra, what have I done? No, his lack of reaction is due to poor craftsmanship and lazy writing. I'm pretty sure if you were religious and found a gift from God, you'd at least fall to your knees, show a modicum of respect. But he just dashes past it like it's nothing. Or to return to Curse of the Pharaohs, if you accidentally walked into what you believe to be the real afterlife, I feel you might have a few questions, like am I dead? And I know future games retcon this as messages sent directly to Layla through the Animus. Messages that Bayek never interacted with. But that makes no sense. How would the Isu leave a message to her through Bayek's DNA? When Subject 16 left messages to Desmond, this was because Desmond was using a strand that had been tampered by Clay first. We transferred 16's memory data from Abstergo into the Animus 2.0. He must have hacked the machine when Vidic left him alone between sessions. But the Usu are dead and have no way to get their hands on Baik's DNA. The Animus is not a time machine. It lets you relive memory. Layla should only see things Baik did and experienced. We're sticking to the Lord. But at this point, the Animus might as well be a quantum leap machine, sending you into the body of a person in the past and allowing you to change history. In fact, fuck it. That sounds pretty cool. Ubisoft commit to this. Let us have actions in the past that affect and modify the modern day. Make the parallels between past and present explicit by letting us influence them. Don't do this half-assed bullshit of concepts that don't line with the rules you previously established, requiring every game to retcon the previous ones. But whatever, even if his religiousness did excuse any of this, let's look at how it ties into the character. As I stated previously, Baik's revenge is partially driven by his religious beliefs of the afterlife, but is never actually studied in any way. He's very respectful of death and mummification rituals, often going out of his way to fix issues or put a stop to corrupt priests. Yet this belief is only useful when it serves the story. The game's loot system encourages you go grave robbing, grabbing riches from the burial grounds of the long dead. Simultaneously, the game insists on Bayek being pious. Hey, I am no grave robber. I am no grave robber. I am no grave robber. Must be very old. Set. I am no grave robber. This isn't just inconsistent writing, this is the mechanics of the game being actively at odds with the narrative. Ubisoft really wanted a gear system with levels of rarity, so they added loot across the whole world. They also wanted you to be able to explore ancient tombs, rightfully so. Yet the game claims Bayek is a man who respects the right of the dead, but then pitches these mechanics that actively encourage you to go and pillage these tombs. It's ridiculous to see him break his way into tombs in order to find valuable weapons, when in ancient Egypt, they were given to the dead to help them fend off enemies on the dangerous journey to the afterlife. Wow, Bayek. Really showing respect to that guy by dooming him to eternal damnation. This ludonarrative dissonance is absolutely baffling. They could have written a character that fit these mechanics, a character who might not care as much about tradition, who questioned them more. Yet they chose to go with a character that seems at odds with the player's objectives. All it does is undermine Bayek's personality, as he acts in gameplay in ways that contradict his main motivations. Bayek eventually realizes that the hyena went rogue from the Order in order to use the Isu technology to revive her dead daughter. Huh, that's an interesting development. This is a motivation that Bai could understand. Her parting ways with the Order after they killed his son could really trigger some interesting moral dilemma in him and... Nope. She attacks Bayek who kills her in a boss fight. Great. Wouldn't want to think about my actions. No, no, what, no, no. We got this list of targets and we better deal with it. 
Come on, what did you expect? To be morally challenged? Or to get to actually stealthily kill your target for that matter? No, let's chase her into an arena, at which points we flail at her for a few minutes until she drops dead. The fact that you have to confirm the kill is additional salt in the wound. I don't hate the confirm kill mechanic. It forces you to kill enemies stealthily, as using your hidden blade automatically confirms it for you. If you decide to instead use the easier solution of shooting them with a bow or running into the fray, then you put yourself at risk having to deal with other enemies nearby first. But here, I wasn't given the choice. All I could do was enter the boss fight. So why did you still force me to confirm the goddamn kill? It just leads to this awkward pause between you killing her and getting the actual confession. Do I walk among the dead now? After this you head off to Memphis and hey, a character I know! I mean, Pasarenta had a grand total of two lines when we first met him. Delightful. You are joining our efforts then. All is cast in my land. Even the sacred Apis bull himself. The one called the Lizard has worked a sort of diabolical power. But hey, it's more than any other NPC I've met this game. He's arguing with his pregnant wife. Tamotep, as the city is afflicted with a disease. You offer to help and head to the local seer who is preparing a ritual to help her give birth. The drink bike takes is spiked, giving him nightmares as we play through a fairly fun set-piece boss fight against the snake god Apep, using arrows Ra has left behind. The game clearly wanted a sequence that leaned into the mythology of Egypt, and a drug-fueled hallucination is as good a way as any to do this. Having defeated the literal embodiment of chaos, Bike is at peace for a short while. He ventures through the Duat to the Field of Reeds, where he sees his son. Wait, what? Oh my god! Remu did manage to get into the afterlife despite his heart getting destroyed. Baik's quest for revenge is over! His son's soul is at rest! All is good! All is bloodshed, but now we know Remu is fine and this is not going to change anything for the character, is it? No, of course not. This reunion means nothing, and the game makes doubly sure of this by not letting us hear what Remu whispers to his father. It could have served a purpose if words were spoken, and drama and character development had ensued, but beyond reminding us what Remu looks like, this scene is worthless. It tells us nothing new about Baik, only that he misses his son, and in fact compromises his whole justification in seeking revenge. The interaction and its meaning will never be approached again either. He'll mention it to Aya. What afflicts you? Dreams. Of our son. Only for the conversation to turn to- You said dreams troubled your mind. Do you want to tell me of them? No. I would rather not burden you. We will need to speak of it someday, once the sands have settled. That conversation never happens, and we never learn more about this dream aside from one side quest, A Dream of Ashes. In it, after completing three fetch quests, it's revealed that this has been a recurring nightmare for Bayek. I saw what has lain behind my eyes every night for the past year. I'm sorry, what? When has this game indicated that Bayek had this dream regularly? It's not even said when we get to play the sequence. What is this god's forsaken place? We were just supposed to know this through our own powers of divination? Even worse is when Bayek describes the dream that has supposedly been haunting him for months, without our knowing, and it doesn't even coincide with the one we saw! I claim my lost heart from an altar and travel to the field of reeds. In the distance, I see my son. When I reach for him, he turns to ashes. But he didn't. Let me check again. Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, no. You, you can't just show your player one thing only for the game to make a 180 and say, no, 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 that didn't happen. This quest is absolutely baffling. Not only is it locking major character development behind an extended fetch quest that some players might not want to take part in, it also contradicts the very knowledge the player has acquired through gameplay. And it's not like the game uses the extra time of having this be a side quest to explore more slowly or thoroughly the issues at hand. No, you meditate once and the seer accompanying you vanishes. No dialogue, no follow-up quest, nothing. And for the player, nothing has changed. The recurring nightmare haunting Bayek is now gone. Great. It doesn't feel like my character is growing when the entire conflict this quest resolved was only introduced five minutes ago, but has been affecting my character from day one without my knowing? How do you fare, Deliverer? My mind is more peaceful. Tonight, 
Your sleep will come without dreams. There's no sense of closure because the game withheld important information, and when it did present it, it was inaccurate and faulty. This entire story is borked beyond belief, as the game clashes with itself. No wonder the game's narrative is a complete mess to follow. It can't even keep track of its own plot. When the assassin said nothing is true, this is definitely not what they had in mind. The writing is attempting to paint one thing, while the visuals paint another, and the gameplay yet another. The game's entire vision is so haphazardly thrown together that you can never grow invested in anything below the surface level. The game constantly undermines every aspect of itself, contradicting the very rules and themes it tries to establish. Characters born from action, not statements. But here the game is content in telling you something, and that should make it true, even though it shows you the complete opposite. This goes beyond just bad writing. This is poor direction and flawed creative vision. Is this my reward for believing the best about man? After helping with the ritual, the seer reveals that the temple food is poison, meaning the local trouble comes from the priests. You meet Aya randomly, and within seconds of being reunited, well... This is ridiculous! They meet and immediately walk into the bushes to have sex, out in public. Look, I'm not a prude person by any stretch of the imagination. I'm French for fuck's sake, but this isn't cute, and this certainly isn't mature. This reads like a 13-year-old trying to write what he thinks an adult relationship is. Vincent Adultman, how are things at the old 9 to 5? Good. I went to the stock market today. I did a business. At least after that bizarre moment is gone, we get some actual interaction between the two for the first time ever, as Bayek expresses his pride at serving Egypt, and Aya hers at serving Cleopatra. It's a nice little contrast hinting at their different ideologies. In fact, this quest is the first time they flesh out their relationship. They work together, race, talk. Why is the game suddenly 10 hours in trying to get me to care for Aya? Is it because she's suddenly going to become an essential part of the story after wasting hours not delving into her or her relationship with Bayek? Oh yes, yes it is! But hey, better late than never. Together they investigate the temple and eventually find that the lizard is Hetepi. But he is amongst my closest advisors. Sure, Pastor Remta. Whatever you say. I mean, it would have been nice to get to meet the guy once before we're going to kill him, but if he's supposed to be important, I'll take your word for it. Once again, the game tries to get us emotionally invested in this kill, through his ties to Hemu's death, his betrayal of Pastor Remta, through his blatant disregard for religious rules and rituals. But it falls flat when none of these personal ties have been presented in a visual manner to the player. There's no weight to anything, and as far as I know, we never see Hetepi's face. Even once you kill him, he appears with his mask on the target list. The developers came up with faces for the Vulture and the Ram, who you never interact with and were killed off screen, but not for this guy? Why on earth should I be invested then? But beyond the narrative context lacking, this quest is actually pretty good. In fact, it's absolutely my favorite one this entire game. While at first it appears it will be yet another assassination in a temple, you quickly realize your target is wearing the same outfit and mask as four other priests. As such, it's your job to identify the right one by his cough. A simple task, as the temple has only a handful of guards patrolling. However, if you are to kill the wrong one, the other three all rush to the nearest barracks for protection, and suddenly the quest becomes more challenging, as you have to make your way past far more guards to get to your target. It's an excellent spin on the loop the game has established, and I truly wish the game showed as much creativity with all its assassinations. This makes you feel like you're stalking your prey, waiting for the perfect opportunity to attack. You know, like an assassin. After getting the kill, you part ways with Aya again, who must go a sea for Cleopatra, while Bayek heads to the Fayum to find his last target, the Crocodile. And here once again, the game does manage to vary up its narrative loop. Where previously you had contacts that were helpful, unhelpful, and familiar, here he's flat out missing. The game does know how to vary up its structure, specifically throughout this second act. While each target meets that basic sequence of meet contact, find out about target, get them, each of these steps are brought about with a twist every time. After some investigating, you find your contact Hotofres. We share a common interest. Wait, Bike has a badge? I thought it was pinned on him. You know, right there, in this same shot. Whatever. Your contact is hunted and forced to hide on his ship. So he sends you to his wife for further help, but not before giving you a Delta Deliver to his daughter, essentially dooming her. You find the wife, who is confident she's not threatened by the crocodile. You are sent to recover a ledger, only to realize too late that Shadia stole it first. You scramble to find her before the crocodile's men, but deep down you know it's too late. The game really plays up this death, 
throwing more to pull at your heartstrings than most other quests. You deliver to her a gift. She interacts with Bayek in a way that brings out true joy. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you learn to climb like that? That looks like fun. <laughs> Everything is played in such a way that you get attached to her in little time. And then the game takes glee in making you come to terms with her death slowly, tying gameplay to the situation. You run back and forth across town, wasting time before finding her mother, crying out towards the water. Sadistically, the game makes you use Senu to mark Shadi as objective marker, which happens to be in the middle of the lake, at which point that sinking feeling, no pun intended, really overcomes you. And then you're required to swim all the way to her lifeless body, surrounded by the corpses of other unfortunate souls, as a slow motion cutscene of the grieving mother is played. It works. For a series of events that occur in such quick succession, the gradual build-up really does give weight to the self-contained episode. Would we be more affected if we'd known Shadia and her parents for longer than 5 minutes? Sure, but for the allocated time, this works quite efficiently. Each beat builds on the previous, rounding out this self-contained tragedy well. Maybe that's why this area was used in the demos when the game was first announced. Yet I can't help but feel something is missing, and I think it has something to do with the soundtrack. When it comes to the soundtrack, I have nothing bad to say about Sarah Shashner's work. I've always thought the best Assassin's Creed soundtracks were the ones that managed to blend the music of the historical eras the games were set in with a more modern, anachronistic sound that represented the animus. A blending of history and sci-fi, if you will, what Assassin's Creed is, or at least should be. The Esper Kid was a maestro at this, perfectly blending the mandolin of the Renaissance with more industrial sounds. And other sequels followed this style, particularly Unity, which Shashner worked on, blending a synth sound to more classical orchestrations. She is incredibly talented, managing to take old musical styles and making them feel modern, exciting, and emotional. And I'm extremely glad to say she kept this going with Origins' soundtrack. As historians don't know what Egyptian music used to sound like, she was given more room to work creatively and came with a score that uses horns with the synth. This mixture had not been used in any other Assassin's Creed games, which really helps Origins' sound stand out within the franchise as a whole. The soundtrack ranges from intense to mysterious, all the while breathing life into the world and the time period. No, my issue with the soundtrack is how it's used. The sound team were given these incredible pieces of music that worked for the setting and are genuinely emotional and exciting, but don't seem to give them any moments to shine. For a series that bred some of its most iconic moments through musical emphasis, using light motifs to highlight characters and their relationships, it's incredibly disappointing. With the exception of one moment, the music is never used to highlight the action. Bike's horns appear seemingly at random, and no other character or location has any distinguishable light motif. Compare this to Revelations, or my personal favorite composition of the whole franchise, Unity's Versailles for Sore Eyes, otherwise known as Elise's theme. It constantly returns, reorchestrated in ways that fit the scenes she is involved in. Comparatively, Origins' soundtrack feels a lot less thought out, more a combination of individual great songs than a musical dialogue with the action. What if Shadia had been given a recognizable upbeat tune to turn into a melancholic version of it as we approached her lifeless body? It would have added even further weight to the scene. Instead we have a random piece of music that occasionally also plays when in the open world, not really tying the scene together emotionally. The sometimes bizarre use of music really does detract to the punch of certain scenes. The music is good, but the game lacks a consistent use of its score. The Cracked Wall is an incredible song, it gets my blood pumping and ready for action every time I hear it. 
But why is it the music on the loading screen? A moment when literally nothing is happening. Musical cues seem to trigger at random, not syncing with your actions, creating a disconnect between the player and the game. I, I mean, look at this. I'm rushing to save Shadia and... Hello to Shadia at the lighthouse. I need to get there now! Nick! Nick! No grin. They have burned our farm. Nothing. Or this scene that just sounds naked without music. Shouldn't something be playing here? Maybe something like... Yeah, that's better. And this shyness to use music extends to the use of music in cutscenes. With one horrible exception. But we'll get to that later. Anyways, having failed at saving Shadia, you promise her parents to avenge their daughter. This could be an interesting moment where they question Bike's methods, as it brought them only pain and suffering. But no, Hodafres just goes with it yet again, ensuring the player never has to think about the consequences of the protagonist's actions. You learn that Shadia was drowned by gladiators in the employment of the crocodile, leading your investigation to Crocodilo Palace. There you meet another old friend of Bayek's, Kenza, who coincidentally happens to be a gladiator. Using this opportunity to join the fray, you two climb the ranks in the arena together. And this is another quest I really like. As far as forcing the player into combat, the infiltration of a gladiator ring is a great excuse. Not only that, but between combat encounters, you're given moments to rest and recover, during which you can question other fighters and investigate. This allows the developers to slip in some foreshadowing of elements to come. A sick beast named Septimius and his clan were going to use me. Turns out, letting the plot breathe with proper pacing leads to better storytelling and better quests. Additionally, Kenza is actually a likable ally, as you fight alongside her for more than a single battle. The animations as she and Bayek revel in the crowd do convey their friendship well. Come the end of the quest, you do feel her disappointment that Bayek didn't entrust her with his true goals. Their short but realistic conflict helps flesh them out, as Bayek puts his quest before his friendship, hurting his bond with Kenza in the process. The intimacy of the discussion contrasted with the roar of the crowd adds to the sense of time pressure, as everyone watches. The quest also allows for some excellent pacing, when in round 3, Kenza must leave you on your own, adding extra challenge to the fight ahead. And finally, you fight the two Gauls in a boss fight. After dealing with some wonky hitboxes, you defeat them, and they reveal that Berenike is the crocodile. And it was she who drowned Shadia, not them. I'm sorry, who is Berenike? This person has literally never been mentioned. Also, why does the gladiators not killing Shadia mean Baek would let them live? They still admitted to having worked for her, a masked one, like the billions of other guards and mercenary Bayek has killed throughout the game. Suddenly being in the employment of a masked one makes you innocent in Bayek's eyes? I get it makes for a more dramatic sequence, as our hero goes against the will of the crowd and refuses to kill quote unquote innocents, but it also makes no sense in character or in gameplay. You leave the arena with your newfound information, and Hotofress apparently knows all that transpired. Honestly, he's only here to lay down all the backstory for Berenike the game had forgotten to give you. It's quite comical, actually. He just shows up, exposition dumps you, and then leaves, basically saying, Well, it's nice to see you, now I'm gonna go home to mourn my dead daughter. You know, Hotofress, maybe it wasn't worth traveling all the way down from Fayum and leaving your mourning wife alone just to say ten sentences. I counted. But I guess you do you. You go to Berenike's villa to kill her. And in horror, you realize Kenza is her bodyguard. Kenza? Is this the luxury you sought? To be a slave to an enemy of Egypt? The character you fought alongside, grew to like and then betrayed. A character who has been a friend to Bayek for years is now fighting against you. What does this mean for her character's morals? How will he deal with this clear conflict? How will he balance out who he is and what he wants? <laughs> I'm sorry it had to end this way, old friend. May you find peace in Ma'at's embrace. What? That's it? How am I supposed to care about any death, any action, when the character takes it all so lightly? One line where Baik shows no grief or regret at this kill of an old friend. He showed more mercy to those gladiators he'd only just met. And don't tell me it's the animus changing how things played out. Even if you kill Berenike first, Kenza still goes for you. The game just lets you not deal with the consequences of it by forcing you out of the animus automatically. I knew you'd come, old friend. Perhaps I was always meant to die at your hand.
So the canon option is the one where he kills his old friend and shows no grief or regret at doing so. Although in the Hidden Ones DLC, a papyrus states she's still alive and well, regardless of your actions. So who even knows what's canon anymore? Certainly not the developers, who keep shuffling back and forth on what their game is even trying to do. This is the laziest form of storytelling in an RPG I've ever seen. It doesn't tell a set story, nor does it let the player influence the narrative through his own decisions. Nothing you do ever matters, and the entire narrative suffers because of it. So we're awoken from the Animus by Dana. It appears Abstergo don't like it when employees go off the book, poking their nose into the memories of the wrong ancestors, and so they've sent agents to kill Layla. For some reason, these guys are armed with bows and arrows instead of, I don't know, a gun? This would make sense if Layla was in a crowded area, and they were trying to kill her silently, not drawing attention, but they're in an abandoned cave, in the middle of the desert, while a sandstorm is happening. So why? Seriously, Ubisoft, you couldn't port one line of code from Watch Dogs so that these enemies could fire at you with rifles, thus distinguishing them from those you encounter in the Animus? You know, highlighting the differences and similarities between the present and past, you know, the contrast the modern day sections used to do so well. History is the study of change. Change is life. When things become static, it means they're dead. As it is, it feels lazy and makes the modern day in this sequence far less special. Anyways, Layla tapes the hidden blade to her arm and uses it without losing a finger. Yeah, I can see how Altair's modifications were really needed. She kills these trained professionals who collectively show as much intelligence as a toddler. However, Dina, Lacking the magic of the bleeding effect gets killed. This understandably upsets Layla, who... I understand why you thought I had to die. But did you have to kill my best friend? Seems to take it in stride that the company she works for will murder its employees if they fall out of line? Wait, 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 wait. What? Wasn't the whole point of Abstergo that it was a cover for the Templars and their more nefarious schemes? In Assassin's Creed 4, they made video games that rewrote history in their favor. It was literally an analog of Ubisoft, as the devs made fun of their own company's questionable business practices. Abstergo's employees knew they worked for a corporation hell-bent on profit. Nothing more. Can you believe how beautiful this building is? I don't know, it's kind of sterile. I always feel like someone's watching me. I feel if you worked for Ubisoft and suddenly Yves Guillemot sent a hit squad after you, you might be more than a little confused and not immediately go, yeah, I deserve that. Layla's reaction is so understated it's bizarre and then veers into comical. They went through the whole process of creating a new protagonist, one who could serve as a new entry point into the modern day. She should have uncovered Abstergo's misdealings, dealt with the shock of it. But no, to her a company murdering employees seems logical. The fact that she's so nonchalant about the whole process and deals with the problems so easily really makes Abstergo seem like a bunch of bumbling idiots, rather than a monster corporation that the assassins can't manage to put a stop to. It gets even worse when the game tries to make Layla seem cool as she leaves a message behind out of spite. She calls out the head of the Animus Project, Sophia Ricken, because the game dates back to a time before Ubisoft realized no one wanted to remember the Assassin's Creed movie. But in the message she says this. I even witnessed the origins of the assassins. What? No, 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 you haven't. Bayek hasn't even founded the Brotherhood yet. What the fuck are you on about? There has been no mention of the assassins. Why would you know about this super secret organization that influences revolutions from the shadow? Is this game pulling a memento? Is this modern day told out of order? Because now I feel like I'm losing my mind. Look, I can deal with retcons to lore, modifications or reinterpretations of past games. It comes with making a prequel, but the game is taking it a step further and retconning itself. I'm not gonna lie, that is an impressive level of ineptitude, but it lines up with the game's MO of showing things, then claiming something completely different happened. At least she shows a minimum of responsibility for Dina, her best friend's death. But rather than dealing with it in any sort of way, she sends herself back into a trance by going into the Animus? Why? Fuck you, Abstergo! I'm saying this through! Layla, what are you seeing through? You were reliving Bike's memories to test out your animus and then got hooked on his story, wanting to see where it goes. But you were never actually searching for anything specific. You proved your animus works. You're good. You're done. I don't see what you could possibly gain by venturing back into the machine that puts you unconscious when trained assassins are trying to kill you and know where you are. Every time you've woken up, it was thanks to Dina. Now that she's dead, what's to stop another group of assassins from coming in and just killing you while you're in the Animus? Did you at least set traps, an alarm, something? No. Yeah, no wonder William Miles gets the drop on you. 
it's really convenient that he showed up and that no other team was sent by Abstergo to check and see why the first one never returned. This entire section is so contrived to keep the story going, it would be funny if it weren't so sad. This modern day had so much promise, only for it to crash and burn spectacularly due to a complete disregard for every rule of storytelling in the book. I could not have imagined what the future had in store for me. Back in the main game, Baig returns to report to Cleopatra, having received a letter from Aya indicating they have to kill even more people to avenge Chemu. However, despite seeming well at ease, Bayek is actually growing wary of running errands for the Queen. I'm still looking for the men who killed my son. The Order is neutralized. Uh, Bayek? If the Order is neutralized, that means you've gotten the men who killed your son. That was the whole point of this adventure. If you believe that the Order is dismantled, why are you assuming that you haven't gotten your revenge? Also, you already know there are two more members of the Order, the Scorpion and the Jackal, so the Order is still going. I have two more names. The Order can't be- And how many more names after that? Seriously, Bayek, I don't understand your issue here. This whole conversation is bizarre and comes out of nowhere. Why does Bayek suddenly not want to go after the members of the Order? The entire goal when going after the Order of Ancients was to find every last person who was remotely involved with the death of Remu. There were only five men in the vault. Bayek has now killed nine. I think we're beyond the point where you are trying to not spill the blood of additional people. Or otherwise, this whole quest has been Baik randomly killing people, hoping to find the ones who were at the vault. In one case, Baik is suddenly getting tired of working towards his only goal, and in the other, he's a psychopath killer without any real plan. The game can't decide if Baik wants to kill the single individual responsible for Remu's death, or everyone who was involved with it. And even if this were to remotely make any sort of sense, what triggered this sudden change of character? It's like the writers started feeling the conflict needed to be introduced to the story because they suddenly realized Bayek has not been challenged in any way from a narrative standpoint. Everything has been coming too easily to the hero, so suddenly he must take issue with how he's been proceeding. But literally nothing has triggered this change of heart. If the kills Bayek made had somehow shook him, made him question his goals and means to achieve them, this would make sense. But all throughout, Bayek has been presented as a man of honor, one with a single goal in mind, who would never even let a mountain stop him. He has repeatedly compromised his values for the sake of his vendetta, and he has done so unquestioningly. The memory corridors never revealed anything to Bayek to make him falter in his will. In fact, if you play the game in the order the game expects you to, the last confession saw him saying this. I will destroy everything you stand for, Berenike, and I will destroy all others like you! Yeah, that sounds like a man tired of fighting and searching to bring this conflict to an end. Baek goes on to claim his role as Magi means little to him. This badge means more to you than it does to me. Which again, just baffles me. What have all these side quests been for then? Does he care for the people or not? Because none of them had anything to do with Remu's killers. So suddenly, Baek is selfish, using his connections to Cleopatra to avenge his son, and he just sort of stumbles his way accidentally into helping people? No, that's not it, because literally within the same conversation, he explains this. Our land is being oppressed greatly. I realize we cannot let the order rise again. Oh god! This game is retconning its story beats faster and faster. Soon this game might make things not happen before they even occur. This entire argument is nonsensical, as Bayek actively goes against his own goals and motivations for the sake of introducing the first elements of drama 20 hours into the campaign. Cleopatra then plot expositions us that she's being hunted down by Venator, a proxy for Lucius Septimius, a real-life Roman soldier and general. But Bayek first interrogates one of his soldiers in order to learn more. Shit-giving is my job. Wow, what a line. Hope that 13-year-old on the writer's team got paid the big bucks for that one. My brother Septimius killed your son. Wait, really? That's how we get the reveal? Who the hell is Septimius? I know he was mentioned by Kenza, but there has been no hint at the existence of this character for the majority of the game, and Cleopatra literally just gave us all the information we have on him. You can't just introduce a character as major as that without giving him, you know, any kind of presence in the story. I know he killed Remu and that's very sad and everything, but we don't even know what this guy looks like. We've never interacted with him. And now he turns out to be our big bad? The guy we've been trying to find since the start? I should feel rage, want to find this guy. But overall, I'm so detached from who he even is or what he's like that I just can't bring myself to care. 
And it winds up being Flavius who killed Remu anyways. Flavius killed your son. So the game keeps shifting the blame of who killed your son in the hopes that it will get you invested into assassinating them. But it doesn't. Bayek's motivations never change, and there's no drama or character development throughout, making for one of the worst stories I've ever experienced in any medium. Ever. I also love that we beat up this Roman, but are never even given his name. You only find out later from a letter he's called Livius. This guy was a member of the Order of Ancients, and the one who reveals the identity of the big bad, and the devs didn't even deem him worthy of a last name. Not that it matters, he never returns after this one scene. Yep. Just walk him off screen, he's served his purpose. A moment of silence, if you please. You then go investigate Septimius' attempts against Cleopatra's life. You go to the local brothel and... I would like to speak with your legendary twins. Speaking is what you call it. I suppose we all have our thing. Can someone please take the keyboard away from the 13-year-old? Please? How did we go from- Like many young women, I was drawn to the church, but grew disillusioned by the believers of the city. Men hold God only as an idea in their heads. Not in the depths of their hearts and bodies. Men must know how to love in order to reach salvation. My girls and I provide that to our congregation. No church would agree with me, I realized. So I created my own. To this. They had a rough night yesterday. So don't speak too hard with them. Hmm? I remember when this series was mature. Put forward complex ideas and characters in ways that were easily digestible to young crowds. It humanized its characters and then shy away from complex issues such as the nature of revenge or even prostitution. It made the characters more memorable and real. Now we have this. They just play off the whole topic as a joke, an easter egg. Like fuck man, what else is there to say? So you stop the attempt on Cleopatra's life and return to the palace where Aya is waiting for you. Bayek! <laughs> Ah, you smell of the sea. Oh, you mean Snoo Snoo! Unfortunately for Bayek, before they can do the dirty, their reunion is interrupted by an attack by Venator. I guess rather than coming up with a new plan, he just decides to bull rush the palace. It doesn't go well for him, and everyone's fine. I am fine. Nothing hurts anymore. I want to bring that edge, that, you know, that spice. Because Ptolemy's attacks on Cleopatra are becoming more frequent, she sends Bayek and Aya to warn Pompey of the danger. On the trip, Aya actually gets to discuss things with Bayek. Septimius is the shit eater. I want to bring that edge, that, you know, that spice. And of Potinus? Oh my god! They did it! They actually did it! They claimed the scene happened before it ever did! I have studied this game for hours, across several playthroughs, and never, not once before this moment, is it mentioned that the scorpion's name is Pothinius. Time for a little history lesson. In real life, Pothinius was a eunuch who served as regent for Ptolemy XIII. He encouraged the young ruler to not only start a civil war against his sister Cleopatra, but also to kill Pompey, sending the mercenary Lucius Septimius to obtain his head. These two characters are actually real-life characters, unlike every other member of the Order so far. But I don't expect most players even realize that, when literally no time has been spent showing their influence over historical events. Everything was laid out on a silver platter to the team to make compelling and narratively relevant characters that could be villains while staying historically accurate. But the writers literally skipped their entire introductory scene and hoped that we didn't notice. Well, I did. Tough luck. It feels like they wrote the story, then remembered they had to maintain a semblance of historical accuracy. So they shoehorned the real-life characters Pothinius and Septimius without putting any forethought into their placement into the narrative. And uh, you know, it's a game, you want to engage with these historical figures without dishonoring the, the true history of them. It's kind of extraordinary the lengths to which this game no longer even cares to make you follow a proper story or conspiracy. Seriously, how does Bayek know about this guy? At least if Aya was the one who mentioned him, we could believe things happened off screen. 
But that simply isn't the case. Instead, our main character, who we have spent hours with, suddenly knows valuable information without letting the audience know how he came about it. The rest of the conversation just further pushes the writer's sudden need for Bayek to have an arc. He indicates he hopes for life to return to normal once their revenge is done, while Aya points out to him they can never go back due to the ongoing civil war. We are parents. We were parents. I love you, Bayek of Siwa. But what are you of now? You reach Pompeii too late, and you don't really care because of how little relevance to the narrative he held. So comically, the queen immediately switches gears and decides Caesar is her new best friend before the corpse even grows cold. No, it can't be. Where is Caesar? Caesar's never been mentioned so far. After spending hours delving into nothing of meaning, suddenly the game is introducing politics, and it's doing so in such a half-assed manner that nothing lands. It's even more confusing when you remember that there are no records of Cleopatra ever reaching out to Pompey for an alliance. So why even waste time on this worthless character? Is it so that we get to meet a few more historical figures, regardless of relevance and necessity? You could have spent the time to actually delve into our antagonist, or Caesar for that matter. But the game is literally straying away from history for the sake of introducing characters that don't matter in the grand scheme of things. Remember when people complained about the games becoming too Forrest Gumpy, as characters like Connor stumbled their way through historical events that stretched the definition of an assassin? I believe we are on course. Well, at least there they treated the characters with a minimum of respect and accuracy. Here it's done for the sake of adding another pin in that we recreated the past argument, regardless of quality. But never mind, time to recreate Cleopatra's meeting with Caesar. You get to randomly play as Aya again. I mean, Bayek is here with us. So what do we gain from playing as her instead? We have a new shoehorned in naval section, as Cleopatra sails to Alexandria in the most conspicuous way possible. But at least this scene ends with the tragic sacrifice of Foxidas. As your fleet gets overrun by that of Ptolemy, he gives our heroes and the queen a chance to escape unseen in a raft. This is quite touching, as the mercenary who questioned Cleopatra's right to rule and had only joined for the money now sees that there is a larger cause at hand. He sees his greed was irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. We see him hit by an arrow as his crew members fall one by one to an army that outnumbers them. But he does it with the same joy and energy he always had. He actually survives this, doesn't he? What the hell? What was the point of this encounter? Why present this scene as if it's a losing battle, when the next time we see him, he's fine? We don't even know how he got out of that situation. What is the point of any of this, outside from the developers reminding you they'd rather make a pirate game? This doesn't make the character more badass by showing he can take an arrow like it's nothing. No, all it does is show me how thick everyone's plot armor is. What would be badass would be to see him evolve, to fail, and die, hence raising the stakes for our characters, and showing the civil war actually carries a heavy toll. But no, nothing ever goes wrong for our heroes, stakes can never be raised, and nothing ever matters. You somehow get to Alexandria unnoticed, and just like in real life, the queen hides in a carpet. This portion's fine, all it is is a glorified cutscene. The slip into a hostile area through a disguise is now a common trope for the franchise. Though once again, I feel Origins kind of misses the point of these quests. In previous games, they felt special because your character was clearly putting on a role. The game had you find a disguise, then you would act the character, creating situations that were often charming and funny. What part of France are you from? Montréal! You worked towards the con, and then were given the satisfaction of playing it out. Unity tied this element of social stealth by giving you a disguise ability you could use during any mission, adding depth to the mechanics, perhaps at the expense of character. But in Origins, you barely feel like you're tricking anyone. Aya, Bayek, and Apollodorus all waltz in wearing their usual clothes. All they need to do is drop their weapons and claim they're from Heliopolis. There's no build-up, no preparation of the con. They just improvise it on the spot, and the guards just fall for it. No questions asked. Let's just lead these complete strangers to Caesar as he stares at Pompey's severed head. I feel like the infamous Megi hunting down the members of the masked ones, wanted by the Philakotai, and his wife who is wanted for murder in Alexandria, might be somewhat recognizable by at least some of the guards. And the characters don't even really try to hide their identity. Who are you? You look like a hippodrome racer. Huh. I am. You should see me race. The C1 warrior. Yeah. Okay, sure, Bayek. Really working that disguise. 
So you reach Caesar, and within one conversation he falls for Cleopatra and drops his alliance with Ptolemy. Again, it's quite comedic. At the start he's all, Now let us discuss our alliance. With Ptolemy. But then Cleopatra waltzes in, they have a discussion off screen that we don't get to witness, and after a fade to black, Ptolemy is gone, and Cleopatra is living in his palace. Aya, oh yeah, dear one, thank you for coming. All is well with great Caesar. These scenes are less than a minute apart. The game is completely skipping any sort of drama or character development. It just makes Ptolemy seem ridiculous. Here we have the ruler of Egypt in his palace, surrounded by his guards, and he just storms off like a disgruntled child, which I know he is, but still. This is both the first and last time we see him alive in the entire game. I feel that one of the game's main villains should have had a bit more presence, at least throughout this one scene. We've been destroying his statues all game, talking shit about the Ptolemies, and we finally meet him, and this animation is the best the game can muster? There's no threat here. Ptolemy could have been a maniacal child, hell-bent on power and manipulated by the wrong people, but instead, he's completely unthreatening and even less charismatic. This just makes the entire civil war feel more like a joke than a proper war affecting the people of Egypt. With that over and done with, the next day, Bayek is shown just chilling while Aya talks to Cleopatra. The queen wishes to give Caesar the right to see Alexander's tomb, but a collapse caused by an earthquake has blocked the door. They got it right. This way is completely blocked. That earthquake must have altered the structure. So you investigate an alternate way in and... Oh, hi there, Bayek. Nice of you to drop by for this cutscene. Again, why bother showing he was outside the palace and distinctly not with Ai in the first half of this quest if the devs want him to be present for the second half? Could no one make up their mind or be in agreement on anything throughout this game's disaster of a production? Th this was a challenging production, for mm -hmm. sure. You venture through the sewers and eventually reach Alexander's tomb to open the door for Caesar. Um... Look, I'm no engineer, but I'm pretty sure that if a door is blocked because of a structural cave-in, then it wouldn't open from the other side. So how does this even work? Was the door deformed, or was it just locked from the inside? And if so, how? Why do I even care? Clearly the devs don't care, as this scene ends before anything of interest can happen. Instead, you get distracted when Ptolemy captures Romans that you must go save. Here you get your second story mission set in the Acre garrison. What? Why? Alexandria alone has three garrisons. You've copy and pasted content all across the map so that you could boast about how much content there was, yet in the story missions you recycle locations? It's even more ridiculous when Bayek goes, Taking on the entire garrison will not be easy. Mate, you literally assassinated Gennadios here. If anything, this should be a cakewalk now that you've leveled up. You find the emissary who reveals Septimius is planning to besiege the harbor to retake the palace of Ptolemy. Hey, there's Pathinius. We finally got to meet him. After 40 minutes, we finally got in 10 seconds of out-of-focus screen time. Look, it isn't much, but at this point, I'll take what I can. You return to the palace, and the siege begins. Caesar needs a brazier lid in the lighthouse to signal his soldiers, and this extremely bizarre moment arises when he doesn't seem to trust Aya to achieve this goal, requesting Bayek do it instead. The most crucial part of the plan. Put this into the brazier of the pharos. Give me the powder. Caesar thinks a woman cannot do this job. What about Caesar's character so far indicating he didn't respect women? On the contrary, he admired Cleopatra's boldness, leading him to ally with her. Great lady, your audacity is equaled only by your beauty. Why is the game suddenly introducing this concept that Aya experiences misogyny when she has literally captained the ship? Once again, the game is now suddenly introducing desperately needed drama into the story, but doing it without weaving it into plot, characters, or even themes. It's all slapped together without any forethought or utility. But whatever, I guess Aya now needs to prove herself as a warrior, as you fight your way up the lighthouse in a sequence I absolutely hate. I've already touched upon how the lack of music makes the entire parkour section fall flat, but even from a gameplay perspective, it's aggravating. At this point of the game, you've gotten used to playing as Bayek, using the abilities and weapons you've acquired for him. But then here, suddenly out of the blue, you're playing as a different character. If your Bayek uses dual blades, then you're lucky, at least the playstyle is similar. But if you got used to using swords, shields, axes, spears, scepters, or anything with special stats, well tough luck. Better learn on the fly. You're also missing chain assassinations, instantaneous overpower abilities, alternate bow types, 
every gameplay change this game made for the sake of being an RPG was in the name of player choice. You know, we felt that by going more RPG, it allowed players to kind of more specifically craft the kind of character they want to play it, yeah. gameplay-wise, and, and even why we went to a quest structure is to allow players to kind of consume the game as they want. Yet here, the game is actively punishing me for choosing to play as I like. It's forcing me to use a playstyle I don't enjoy, and doing so with a character who's probably weaker than my overleveled Bayek is by this point. And fine, if you want to highlight how different Aya is from Bayek through mechanics, that's fine. But then why did Aya get a hidden blade? Do those things just grow on trees now? Does Cleopatra just have a stock of them in some cupboard in her palace? What was the point of Bayek's blade being the same one Darius used, if the apparatus can just be easily imitated off screen? I feel like a new hidden blade might be safer than a nearly 400 year old one. Oh shit, is that why it cut off his finger? The mechanism was just messed up by centuries worth of rust? Aya didn't need to lose her finger. And why does she even need a blade anyways? She's not been assassinating. She's been traveling the seas. So why give her one? The game has non-lethal melee takedowns. The devs are trying to contrast their, and I say this lightly, two protagonists, but they can't even fully commit to that, instead giving Aya a weapon she shouldn't even have. After a miserable boss fight, the game tries to fake out Aya might fail by having her attacked by a guard. <laughs> Ubisoft, you're supposed to cut to black when the blade is coming down, otherwise the edit lacks any sort of tension. This is basic cinematic language, you should know this. So after the game tries and fails to make you believe Aya could die to a single guard, she lights the brazier and proves Caesar wrong. I can't believe you trusted a woman to do something of such importance. The die is cast! <laughs> Glad she's surmounted the patriarchy. Many men have doubted Aya. All have found themselves dead by her blade. This theme was properly introduced and concluded, makes for a very satisfying arc. It doesn't. But with that done, Bayek and Caesar escape the city. Yeah, Bayek's body language is really selling me on this intense chase. This turns into one of the most ridiculous sequences of the game, as Bayek fends off enemies in pursuit with a bow, as things escalate all the way to an elephant chasing them. I'm fine with this, Assassin's Creed always had moments of ridiculousness. However, can someone explain to me why the fast bow fires slower in this sequence and only this sequence? I'm shooting as fast as I can, Roman! Oh god, the game is not only becoming inconsistent with its narrative, but also its gameplay mechanics. God help us all! Also, you can't stop the elephant by shooting its driver. You can only shoot the animal itself. That makes sense. Great consistency all around. But it comes to an end in a fittingly bombastic fashion, as Caesar invites us to join in the Civil War efforts. We then cut to... three days later in the middle of a battlefield. No, please, don't start time jumping again. You can't even keep your narrative straight when telling it linearly. I don't think this is gonna help. Anyways, you witness this battlefield populated by about five NPCs. I mean, look at this. They're all huddled as if surrounded, but literally there's no one around. This doesn't feel like a war. There's no stakes, not from context and not from buildup or even from visuals. Hey, at least this guy seems to be having fun when getting stabbed. You're told Pathinius is nearby, so you head to the waypoint and get locked in an arena boss fight. Cool. The most underdeveloped villain in the history of gaming is given an extended fight where you kill his elephant mount. The game doesn't seem to care either, as you don't get to personally assassinate him. You bring down his elephant, and apparently this also kills the rider. You could have done something neat, where Pathinius was wounded from the fall, dragging himself away, at which point you could coldly walk up to him and stab him. You know, like Arno did. Twice. But no, sure. The elephant's health doubles as Pothinius's. I guess I should have expected it. It's what the UI told me. At least that didn't lie. And that's what I've always prided myself in, is, is writing characters who have humility and are uh, characters that you care about, even if, even if they are villains at times. So after that disaster of a boss fight, you're given the location of Septimius, the man I guess we've been searching for all along, and... Oh god. Oh god, please, no! Why? Why do you do this? Another boss fight in an arena? This is ridiculous! They barely even bothered to put any content between these! No, all the assassinations, almost every single one, is still can be done in stealth. It's so obviously telegraphed too, with only one way in and no way out. 
Origins, why won't you let me sneak or at the very least assassinate my targets? Why are you forcing me time after time after time to enter combat against them? It is so lazily thrown together. Why does having his camp laid out like this serve Septimius in any strategic way? Why can't Bayek trick him to leave? Why not just blockade him until he runs out of resources? It's a small tent, I'm sure that won't take long. We need to make a fight system that allows us to do boss fights because it works. Look, I tried to be positive about this game's combat, but I'm just gonna say it. The mechanics are not solid enough to warrant multiple boss fights in a row like this. Bosses are extremely inconsistent with how they telegraph their attacks. Some have proper windups and cooldowns, but a lot of the time, the game seems to expect you to anticipate attacks rather than actually react to them. This forces a defensive playstyle as the player spams dodge preemptively, rather than using their skill to time a dodge properly in reaction to an animation. So once again, it just becomes a question of their numbers against yours. Who has the better DPS? The enemies constantly have the same moves, and it feels like all these drawn out battles play out the same way. This is denying me choice and agency as to how I wish to approach situations in this quote unquote RPG. It doesn't make me feel like I'm an assassin, and above all else, isn't fun. The fight isn't even satisfying narratively. This is our first meeting. Yes, I know he killed Haimu, but I don't even know this guy's face, and I definitely don't know why he acts the way he does. Yet the game is framing this as if it's a great climax. Ah, we finally fight. It's not. It's a fight that I feel about as involved in as all the other murder I did in the name of Hemu. There is nothing that distinguishes Septimius from every other masked man, or even any other enemy throughout this game. So why does the game treat him so special? Because he's the one who drove Bayek's blade into his son? He killed my son! I don't know, it rings hollow to claim this one guy is the most important and personal kill, when Bayek has now murdered 10 other members of the Order in the name of his son, without any sort of introspection. So after a dull fight against Septimius' infinite spin attack... You call this an attack! You defeat him. However, Bayek is shocked when Caesar stops you from killing him so that he may have a Roman trial. Um, let's go back two minutes ago. I will distract his men while you capture him. We must know what he plans. Bayek knew he was to be kept alive. If he really wanted to kill him, he punched him in the face four times with his left arm, the one armed with the hidden blade. If he really wanted to kill him, he had several chances. I get he's an emotional character, but honestly, it's just getting annoying now. The game constantly uses the he's emotional excuse to make Bayek act in ways that seem dramatic, all the while avoiding having to do proper character work. This may also be why the game keeps using slow motion, in order to just show off the characters screaming incoherently and acting strong and imposing, but not actually having to give him anything to say. Oh, he killed the father of a child? He's emotionally driven. Oh, he killed a grieving mother? He's just so goddamned emotional. If he actually were emotional, these actions would affect him, but instead he shrugs them off as, it is what I must do. Vengeance is my creed. As stated before, the game is terrified by the prospect of making you think. So instead, the characters never actually react emotionally to the kills. They just act emotionally when killing, making for a thoroughly lackluster character, one who's well performed, but has no actual depth. And so I must stain my hands with another priest's blood. The Oda is everywhere. To protect Egypt, I would kill a thousand priests. You and I are pledged to violence. Now. And always. While this is all happening, Aya watches as Ptolemy dies to some crocodiles. Great. Yet another assassination that I don't get to be involved in. Maybe I'm nitpicking here, but if an Assassin's Creed game makes a point of showing a shady character, takes the time to name him before I even know my protagonist's name, I expect to get to assassinate him later. But instead, the game pulls a bait and switch, and it has him die without my input. Look, I get Ptolemy reportedly drowned in real life, so he has to die on the Nile. But why are we not responsible for this death? Historical accuracy never came at the cost of players' enjoyment of the story. I mean, Charles Lee really died of a fever. Yeah. I can see that fever really got to him. So much, in fact, it stabbed him in the gut. Historical accuracy was always selective in Assassin's Creed. At the end of the day, the player's role in it was king, as creative liberties were made possible through the conspiratorial nature of the franchise. 
when one of the main premises of your game is that you shouldn't trust everything you hear, everything you read. What's that your ancestors said? Nothing is true. Why limit both yourself and the player? Because otherwise, if we're going to talk about historical accuracy, how about I mention that Siwa was at the time called Sektam, and the name Siwa was only first used in the 15th century. Or that Alexandria had at the time a population between 500,000 and 600,000. Why does this matter? Because during the French Revolution, Paris had a population of at most 650,000. So where are my giant crowds, Ubisoft? We know you have the technology to do it, to make a more historically accurate Alexandria, one with giant crowds of Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans. This city should be as big and busy as Paris was in Unity, but it feels emptier than Jerusalem did back in Assassin's Creed 1. Or how Cleopatra is depicted as a promiscuous queen. I will sleep with anyone as long as they agree to be executed in the morning. <laughs> This cliched depiction finds its roots in Roman propaganda. It's truly distressing to see a franchise that used to promote a critical approach to history actually fall prey to nationalistic calumny. The franchise always highlighted that history is written by the victors, and what actually happened may not conform to what you believe. It encouraged approaching any historical knowledge cautiously. Yet here, it seems Ubisoft weren't capable of doing so themselves. For all their boasting of historical accuracy, Ubisoft couldn't even create a Cleopatra that didn't conform to the cliches born of centuries worth of disinformation. And uh, you know, it's a game, you want to engage with these historical figures without dishonoring the, the true history of them. Or can I mention how Egypt couldn't cultivate orange carrots? All that was available to them was purple carrots. So what's this Ubisoft, huh? My point with all of this is that claiming this portion of the story is unsatisfying because of real history is disingenuous when the accurate elements are cherry-picked. Assassin's Creed has never been about historical accuracy. It's about capturing the feel of an era through the gameplay, the world, and the narrative. But don't take my word for it. Well, hi, my name is Patrice Desley, and I'm the creative director of Assassin's Creed 2. Uh, doing our research, we could also say, okay, this building was not exactly like it is now. If I take an example, the facade of the, of, of the Duomo in, in Florence wasn't built at the time. And, and the facade that you can see now, if you go there, is from the 19th century. It's, it's gorgeous, but we cannot use it. But since it's Assassin's Creed and it's like a work of fiction, uh, we bend the rules a little bit about that to make you know, the game look uh, as good as possible. The historical aspect was never a limitation. It was a tool used to enhance every aspect of the game. And no one would complain if creative liberties were taken for the sake of making a better game. Yet here, it feels historical accuracy was used as a defense for any flaws in the experience. Oh, this character's death is unsatisfying? That's because it's how it happened. Oh, the cities are not fun to parkour? That's because that's how they were built. Oh. There's no social stealth, because the population back then was too small to allow for it, which as I stated, is completely false. They could have built the cities to be fun to explore. They told a dull story that involves mostly fictional characters, but still history is at fault for that? I mean, Flavius, the game's main villain and final target is a fictional character. It's not like the presence of Cleopatra, Caesar, or Ptolemy affects most of the game's story, as Bayek hunts down the fictional members of the Order of Ancients. So how is historical accuracy to be blamed for this disaster of a narrative? Look, I hate to do this, but I think we need to talk about the game's lead writer, Anna Mercier. Before this, he had never worked on an Assassin's Creed game. In fact, most of his experience had mainly been in theater and film. I won't question his skill as a writer, as I've not been able to view any of his plays. However, that doesn't change the fact that he was severely unqualified to take on a project of this magnitude. Assassin's Creed is one of the largest video game franchises on the planet. Handing it to someone with no experience in the video game industry, and whose work in film has been... ...of questionable quality is a strange decision. Writing a video game handled by a team of hundreds for a major corporation is a very different beast from writing a play for a small troupe. There is a pipeline that you need to work in and maintain through proper communication, and it seems quite clear to me that Mercier was not comfortable in that environment. I believe it's very telling that when interviewed less than four months before the game's release, Ashraf Ismail could barely remember the lead writer's name. Um, like, who is the story writer for AC Origins? This info actually came out just like in the past like 24 hours. Yeah, Alain Mercier. So we actually have a giant team of writers 
Uh, I think I'm going to misquote the number. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't say a number because I'm not 100% <laughs> sure. But yeah. uh, at some point, we were almost 13 writers. How are you supposed to tell a coherent story that ties gameplay together when the team is that divided? Ultimately, I don't know who's to blame here. Is it Mercier for not managing to make his voice heard in the new environment? Is it Ismail for not caring more and not reaching out more to the writing team? Who knows? I wasn't there. But it does explain the schizophrenic nature of the game. No wonder so many cutscenes play out like plays, as characters break the fourth wall, or as two characters awkwardly stare and emote at each other in what seems like a confined space. Even when they could move, walk around in the open air, they still just stand there. This feels like Mercier's theater experience taking the forefront, forgetting to take advantage of the potential of video games. Theater writing involves a lot of telling without showing, as it's impossible for a crowd to view small, minute details in the environment. But in a film or a game, you don't have that limitation. You could tell just as much story through clever cinematography as through words. The point is, the two mediums are incredibly different, and I don't think Mercier was capable of using the narrative potential of games to his advantage. It also explains why cutscenes alternate between the static style and ones with actual cinematography seemingly at random. Perhaps there was also communications issues with the cutscene director Félix Etienne Roque. So once we realize this, the question becomes, why was Mercier hired? He was the artistic director of the Théâtre Sainte-Catherine in Montreal between 2010 and 2016. While this is a fairly prominent theater in the city, what does this have to do with video games? He also produced a handful of low-budget films that feel low-budget. Epic, yeah, I usually write in the genre of epic. This is my preferred genre. Okay. And on his website, he adds he worked as a quote-unquote satellite team on Far Cry 3, Deep Down, and Thief. While Deep Down never released, and his name doesn't appear in the credits of either of the other two games. Trust me, I checked. So who is this guy, and where did he come from? I got involved in the project as a... I've worked with one of the cinematics directors before. Oh, well, there it is. There it is. It's pretty open about it. Nepotism it is. Look, once again, I'm not putting into question his skills as a writer. What I am putting into question is his ability to work within a large team on a multi-million dollar project in a medium he'd never worked on in an official manner before. I actually agree with him that bringing Punk's sensibilities to Assassin's Creed is exactly what the franchise needs right now. I have no doubt his initial ideas for the game's story were strong. Right now there's more infrastructure than there's ever been in our society. Let's take away some of that, you know? However, it seems fairly obvious something was lost in the translation to the screen. Ubisoft gave the narrative reins of their largest franchise to someone who was not even familiar with the games industry. No wonder the narrative is an incoherent mess of conflicting ideas and cut content that cannot even keep its own story straight. When you compare the marketing to the final product, it's like two different games with two different stories. Make an art. 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 It's, uh, well, frankly, it's embarrassing. Tell me, did you ever really believe in the creed? After yet another time jump, we get a huge reveal. Cleopatra and Caesar are ruling Egypt, with Apollodorus at their side. They give a rousing speech to the people and, um, ex excuse me, sir, you appear to have stepped in the shop. I'm not sure you're supposed to be here. Who are you exactly? That was my reaction when first watching this cutscene. It's actually Septimius, who's been pardoned by the Queen. This reveal is so poorly thought out, it's amazing to even consider the number of people who must have looked at it and thought this was fine. At this point in the game, we have never seen Septimius' face. He was always wearing a helmet, so why should this slow pan as he steps into frame and all I see is that his face should mean anything to me? I don't associate this face with that of Septimius, completely ruining the work put into the cinematography. This shot takes something that could have been dramatic and just makes it confusing. But honestly, at this point, I don't know why I'm still expecting anything from this story. We get a scene where Bayek and Aya express their anger and sense of betrayal to Apollodorus, who simply answers politics be politics, and there's nothing he can do. Speaking of cinematography, wow. This isn't my game or my inventory choice is causing this. This is the shot the team decided was worth having in one of the most essential sequences in the lead up to the creation of the Brotherhood of Assassins. Every time I think this game can amaze me more with its incompetence, it does. But Bayek and Aya, betrayed and defeated, gathered our greatest allies and their best friends. The people that will stand by them always, and who have also been deceived by Cleopatra. 
And together, they realize the only solution is to... Uh, uh, what? What? Ex excuse me. Hello? Uh, I'm sorry. Bye. 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 But, um... I, I don't mean to be rude. I, I know you have a big moment here, like, uh, you know, creating the Brotherhood of Assassins and all that, but, uh... Who the hell is this? Where did you come from, and why is everyone acting like I should know you? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Tahira, an old friend of Bayek's from Siwa, one deemed close enough to him and his current plight to be a part of the Assassin Brotherhood when it's founded. Turns out this character is found solely in side quests. You know, I would applaud this game's approach to non-linear storytelling if I believed it was done purposefully and not just the result of gross mismanagement of the project. Th this was a challenging production, for mm -hmm. sure. Instead, we wind up with the story where you can reach the culminating moment of the game and have no idea who characters are. In fact, if you own the DLC, you can witness Tahira's participation in the creation of the Brotherhood, witness her die, and then meet her for the first time. In that order. How they decided to include this character here while cutting corners everywhere else in the story is absolutely insane to me. Tahira is the one at the end who chops her finger out of respect for Bayek, starting a tradition that will last almost 13 centuries. Why is so much weight being put on this character that I can miss out on? Why not have Hotafres or Henut be here? We actually meet them in the main campaign. They have a reason to be mad at the Ptolemies and the Masked Ones. As Fayum, their land is under their control. But we fought together to put Cleopatra on the throne. Now this was a mistake, my friends. But at least it brought us together. No! No it didn't! Stop gaslighting me, game. You can't just say things happened and expect me to go with it. But beyond poor storytelling, this scene doesn't work. Baye claims this is all his fault, that he should never have trusted Cleopatra to help him. I was wrong! I am responsible. Baye, buddy, all you've been doing for the past five hours is remind us how little Cleopatra served your cause, how little you care for her politics, and how much you'd like to just leave and do your own thing. How long before the Queen stops impressing Caesar and starts impressing us? This isn't a revelation to you. This is vindication for your warnings to Aya over the whole game. From the start of the game, you were done with the Ptolemies. I am Magi to no Faro. And we are Magi. We do serve and protect, but we walk alone. I share your hatred for Ptolemy. But remember, Cleopatra is a Ptolemy. She's the better of two evils. From the start, you were hesitant about working with Cleopatra, and the only reason you did was because your wife said it would be neat. But Cleopatra? She's been declared a criminal. <laughs> By a treacherous brother, yes. But now, you're acting like it was your mistake, and one that you must now amend? You were right. I trusted the wrong goddess. Even Aya says it's her fault. The logic of creating the Brotherhood is fine. Bayek wants to fight the spread of corruption born from backdoor politics by working as an opposing shadow organization that holds the people's needs into consideration. It makes sense. Until you remember, that was exactly what Bayek was doing before joining forces with Cleopatra. Many quests had him working with others to overthrow oppressors, removing corrupt officials from office from the start. Him working with the queen against his better judgment to please his wife didn't change that. Before joining her, he did it. After joining her, he did it. And after being betrayed, he still does it. The reasoning to create the Brotherhood is fine, but the motivation is all wrong. And yes, I know it makes for a more dramatic story if Bayek was betrayed by Cleopatra. Sorry! We gave her everything! But the fact of the matter is, the game presents this more as an expected outcome than something unforeseen, making the scene not land in any emotional way. It also doesn't help that he claims his acting up emotionally to the death of his son was a fatal flaw. When my boy died, I fought back with rage and anger. But this only made them stronger. The game never warranted this moment of self-reflection, and the motivations of the character don't change after this moment. We cannot stop now, Aya. We have yet to find Hemu's killer. He's still going after those who killed his son before this, after this, and probably to this day, honestly. This entire game, there has been no stakes, no consequences for any actions, thus no dramatic turns and escalation, and thus here, at the very end, there's no catharsis. The game has made a point all throughout to make sure Bayek was never in the wrong, so that the player was always in the right. 
but that means that upon reaching the narrative climax, the moment the character should overcome his flaws to put an end to the conflict, there is no emotional payoff and it rings hollow because he has no flaws to overcome. And the fact that the game tries to convince you Bayek has learned from mistakes he has made and is changing in reaction to recent developments when he was always in the right is honestly insulting. It wants to have an emotionally resonant arc, but never put the effort into crafting a character who could allow for it, leading to this anticlimactic disaster of an ending. The creation of the Brotherhood has nothing to do with ideology either. For a series called Assassin's Creed, you'd think the Brotherhood might involve something philosophical, maybe an eponymous Maxime, one whose various interpretation has been at the heart of every game in the franchise. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. For if nothing is true, then why believe anything? And if everything is permitted, why not chase every desire? Once, I thought that meant we were free to do as we would. To pursue our ideals no matter the cost. I understand now. Not a grant of permission, the creed is a warning. Yeah, that's the one. Guess what? It's completely absent from this game. This fundamental realization on the nature of the world and society is one that Bayek and Aya never come to. They don't care for free will. Whenever they talk about the Brotherhood, they talk about murdering those who deserve it and defend the poor and downtrodden from the shadows. My creed gives the meaningless meaning and shapes the formless. Without it, I could not kill. Vengeance is my creed. That is not what the creed is. That is what the Brotherhood does. But the Creed has nothing to do with that. The Brotherhood does what it does because of the Creed, not the other way around. Yet here, the game is saying exactly that. Bayek and Aya see the Creed as justification for killing, an excuse, instead of seeing the Creed as something so important, so valuable, that they are willing to kill in order to protect it. Bayek and Aya kill people before observing the nature of society. To them, it's about fighting those who manipulate the powerful from the shadows by also working in the shadows, not about defending people's freedom. They care more about helping the people than they actually do about their free will. The two simply happen to be related by happenstance. And I promise that for all the songs of Egypt, I will be the father I was not that day in Siwa. So with that fundamental philosophical basis for the franchise missing, what even was the point of telling this story? Oh right. And the soundtrack makes things even worse, trying to tug at my heartstrings but only making me angry. To the Brotherhood! The Brotherhood! So there's been an ongoing trend in the franchise to turn Ezio's family into the main theme of the franchise, the theme for the Brotherhood, if you will. This was never intended to be the case. Ezio's family wasn't loved because it was the theme song, it was loved because of moments like this. It is a good life we lead, brother. <sighs> At best, may it never change. And may it never change us. get shivers because the song was composed for that moment and used perfectly to highlight its themes, the world. It was unique to Ezio and his story, which is exactly why it's so fondly remembered. It served the tragedy of the story, the irony of the character's optimism contrasted by the game's title and the sadness of the music. It instilled that feeling that nothing would ever be this good again. It was never intended to be the theme for the franchise. In fact, once Ezio fully avenged his family at the end of Brotherhood, the song was only played very sparingly, more as a reminder of what had come before for the character than a statement of who he still was. It was a neat way to show his growth. The grief of the past was mostly gone, and this allowed Ezio to start a life of his own, putting behind him all the mysteries and conspiracies in order to be happy, which was one of Revelations' core themes. The end of the road. The song wasn't shoehorned in Revelations unnecessarily, as it no longer made sense for the character. And for a long time, the franchise understood this. 
Assassin's Creed 3 and 4 both had incredible soundtracks, tailored to their protagonists and their struggles. But around Rogue, Unity, and Syndicate, things started to shift. Ezio's family began creeping back into different songs. But these hints were subtle enough, neat little easter eggs, a reminder of what had come before. Ultimately, the new music was still given the priority, and the time to shine in its own right. It was a nice little way of giving Ezio a quick tip of the hat. But Origins marks the moment where Ubisoft declared Ezio's family to be the definitive, end-all, be-all Assassin's Creed theme. It's used several times across the game, from pivotal moments like the creation of the Brotherhood to the goddamned inventory screen. And it makes no sense! At least with the other games, you could argue Ezio had come before and had an influence on the European Assassin Order, hence why echoes of him could be heard in the new themes. But this game is set 1500 years before Ezio is even born. He should be nowhere near this outside of easter eggs. The song is called Ezio's Family for God's sake, not Brotherhood of Assassins or Assassin's Creed theme. We have an Assassin's Creed theme and it's amazing! God, I'd wish they'd bring that back. By using the song this way, Ubisoft are now declaring Ezio's family to be the theme of the Assassins, and are implying that Ezio's family was really the Assassins all along. But this only cheapens both Ezio's character arc and his tragedy. The song was the perfect representation of the family he lost and the sacrifices he had made. Through Jesper Kidd's brilliant orchestration, Melissa Kaplan's wondrous vocals, and the strategic placement throughout the games. This is why when the song stopped being used, it was simultaneously satisfying and tragic. We knew Ezio had finally outgrown his anger. He had moved on thanks to the Brotherhood and his newfound family. But that new family could never completely replace the one he had lost. It was the theme for Ezio's lost family, not the one he found. And now Ubisoft is completely undercutting this devastating aspect of the character through their whoring out of this song. They use the song to create the illusion of emotion by association through nostalgia, because it's easier to do that than come up with new impactful ways to use musical cues that tie into the themes and story. Moments where the action and the soundtrack work in tandem to become greater than the sum of their parts. It is the most lazy way the developers could use music to try and hide in essential scenes, and they do it not once, not twice, but four times at arguably the most crucial moments in the story. That is to say, the creation of the Brotherhood. To the Brotherhood. The creation of the Creed. A new Creed. Ours is finished. The ending of the main game. and the ending of the first DLC. You might think I'm going on and on about this point, but I believe this is a very important one. You see, while the game is rife with retcons and changes to lore, most don't affect the intent and themes of previous games. This one actually changes the interpretation of older characters and games. It compromises the hard work of creators that came before, and twists the stories they wanted to tell into something they were never intended to be for the sake of cheap nostalgia thrills. I clapped! I clapped when I saw it! I know what that is! Did you clap at any of the new moments and memorable characters? Were there any? No! I love Ezio's family. We all do. I love listening to all the different covers and variations fans make online because it's a great song that triggers a lot of nostalgic memories in me. But that doesn't mean it should be shoehorned anywhere it can be. The song worked because it was built with the Italian Renaissance in mind, for Ezio's tragedy, and it fit that setting and themes. I don't blame Shashna for this. Like I said, this has been a trend across the last few games, and it's clearly a marketing and branding push by Ubisoft, one they didn't feel the need to use until the games dropped in popularity. And they need to stop before they start ruining some of their most popular and widely loved games years after they are released. So yeah, that's the foundation of the Brotherhood of Assassins, the big moment the game was leading towards all along. Ooh boy. No ideology involved, no creed, just a let's murder the rich and powerful gang.
All we get is one cutscene including characters we don't know, that we haven't interacted with in hours, who share little in common, and have never met each other. It fails to coherently tie into the game's themes, and in fact undermines those of prior installments. And once again, the game completely misses the point of Assassin's Creed as a franchise. One of the most wonderful things about the franchise was how it approached our relationship to the past, to history. The series was literally about revisiting the memories of our ancestors in order to better understand and affect the present. At its very best, the franchise showed how different generations influenced each other, going all the way back to Adam and Eve. In the original game's lore, the first assassins were literally biblical characters dating back to the very start of humanity, and their fight went on to inspire others down the line. Kui Long, Wei Yu, Altair, Amunet, Iltani, Leonius, whether they were officially assassins or not, they influenced each other. They all inspired each other and helped make the creed become what it was. For instance, Darius used the first hidden blade, which further generations adopted. But in Origins, Baik knew nothing of what came before. It presents the creation of the Brotherhood as his own independent ideological decision, rather than one influenced by the work of others that came before, thereby limiting its actual reach. It underplays the importance of the older assassins. It reduces the scope of the series' conspiracy rather than expanding it in any meaningful way. Yes, the Creed has always been presented as an inevitable, a sort of yin and yang relationship between order and freedom, at odds and in a tug of war for balance. But by presenting Bayek's story as the moment the Creed actually took form, it downplays the importance of prior generations, making everything in the past seem less impactful. And you just have to look at Odyssey to see that. Its story seems superfluous, because we know any realization or philosophical decision made by Cassandra will not actually have any influence on the Brotherhood. Origins cut off anything prior to 49 BCE from having any sort of effect on the franchise's overarching narrative. Where in the past, it was implied proto-assassins influenced the Brotherhood's beliefs, now it turns out they were only retroactively discovered. I can imagine the conversation. Hey guys, it looks like these guys were doing stuff fairly similar to us before we existed. Eh, that's a neat coincidence. Let's build a shrine to them even though they have no relation to our organization or even its founding. Great idea! There used to be an idea of lineage, of how generations upon generations had some form of influence over each other, from the start of humanity to the present. Masyaf, Monteregioni, the American colonies. It's all happened before. Now that relationship across time and space has been destroyed, making the Assassin's Creed universe feel smaller than it ever did. And it didn't even have to be that way. It's an ancient blade that killed the tyrant Xerxes. A weapon of justice. The game had created itself an opening, but it chose to ignore it. We're told about the death of Xerxes at the hand of Darius. If this had in some way or another inspired Bayek, this lineage could have been maintained. But no, he never takes interest in the past of the Hidden Blade, the beliefs behind its existence. All he sees in the blade is an ingenious weapon, not a symbol for a fight that has been going on for centuries. <laughs> ingenious. The stupid change in the thematic core of the franchise really comes to a head in Odyssey, where Darius is introduced and revealed to be just another assassin, using the Hidden Blade, the Leap of Faith, and wearing a hood while fighting the Order of Ancients. He is, for all intent and purposes, an assassin, but his work in no way influences the Brotherhood's creation. The creation of the Brotherhood is an incredibly malicious form of retcon, because technically, Ubisoft didn't change any events that occurred previously. Because if this is the, the birth of the Brotherhood, what about the assassins before this time, like Darius and Eltani, and we know they're there, this, uh, this holds <laughs> true to it. Yeah, Darius was still around. Yeah, Adam and Eve stole the Apple of Eden. However, these retcons did affect the spirit of the franchise, where it used to be about lineage and generational influence, now it's about random people discovering each other's lives without studying how they affect each other. It causes so many narrative issues too, such as why does Layla even care about Bayek's story? She has no connection to him, no reason to be invested outside of the bleeding effect, which is about as shallow of an explanation as you can get. I'm not much for politics. <laughs> He's not much for anything that requires deep thought. From this point on, you rush through the game, experiencing the exact same mess of story and gameplay you've been enduring. Aya still reads like a sociopath who takes pleasure in killing rather than seeing it as a necessary evil. Gods, ahead! <gasps> Another pile of bodies will prove our point. Oh. Finally, someone we can kill. Apollodorus is killed by Flavius for trying to stop him from getting a piece of Eden. Who is Flavius, you ask? Why, Caesar's bodyguard, who's been in the background. 
never interacting with our characters in any way. Salve, Lord Caesar. I will make the order. But once again, the game plays up a narrative that never occurred. It was Flavius all along. He brought Caesar and the Romans here, hoping to take complete power. We trusted him. We were fools. Why can't you believe that? You've never spoken to the guy. It's not like you were close or even knew each other. Hell, you were only in Caesar's company for a few days, but whatever. Apollodorus dies and I don't care. You return to see what stopped Flavius from opening the vault but arrived too late. You find Hepsifa, Bayek's friend from the beginning of the game, dead, and I don't care. I've not seen him for over 30 hours, and even when we did spend time together, I didn't exactly feel close to him. And again, I don't care. I just don't give a neck anymore. Yeah, same Bayek. But hey, at least Bayek has a reaction to the Isu technology here. Bayek, how are we dreaming? We have entered the Duat. Who could imagine such a land as this? No man should approach this close to the gods. You bury Hepsifa and have a conversation with Aya in front of Chemu's tomb. Of course, they talk about murder instead of spending a moment of remembrance for their son. Flavius is headed for Cyrene, and Septimius for Alexandria. I will kill Flavius. Wouldn't want these parents to ever share anything about the life they lost. Baya can react to the grave, but at this moment, when I is here, you can't trigger any dialogue. Yet another missed opportunity to develop the characters and their bonds. Every time I think of you, I think of Hemu, and everything we lost. Me too. So for now, we kill. Next kill is all that matters here, and always. You head to Cyrene to kill Flavia, still meeting new characters. I am Bayek Osiwa. We're in the last hour of the game, why is my protagonist still introducing himself to people? Where has Priscilla been all game? She seems interesting, has a cool look, but clearly she won't serve the story. The Brotherhood is already founded, and she's cursed to be an outsider to it in the limbo that is the post-story endgame. As you head to Cyrene, you see Flavius has bribed officials to promote his cause and pitch the people against you. Maybe now that the Brotherhood is a thing, the game will actually have a notoriety mechanic. Anyone stealing Silphium will be executed! Do not touch! Do not touch! Taking Silphium is punishable with death! But no, you can't interact with them. You can kill them, but the game yells at you for that. So instead, you make your way to yet another temple, what is that, the fourth one this game? And find Flavius. And fuck you. You're gonna force me yet again into a boss fight? I did everything to stealth my way here, to the point that the assassinate prompt appeared before the cutscene decided Bayek was a moron who can't sneak up on anyone. Is it too much to ask to be given the opportunity to play my Assassin's Creed game like an assassin? You already removed social stealth, now you're gonna also remove stealth? This whole thing is comical when your objective is assassinate Flavius, but this is what's going on on screen. Yeah, this assassination went smoothly. Also, wasn't Bayek supposed to work from the shadows now? Yeah, that worked out. The boss fight sees Flavius bringing back the ghosts of those you've killed. It's a shame I barely remember any of them and care about even less of them. After killing him, the game goes yet again for some half-baked drama, as Bayek claims he can't kill Flavius because it would be him losing his son for good. I can't do it! I can't! I can't do it! It's alright, Papa. No. I will... I will lose you forever. You know, maybe the scene would work if one, Bai hadn't brutally murdered so many to get to this point, and two, he hadn't already thought he'd murdered his son's killer at the beginning of the game. Die! And be done with it! It was you who murdered my son before my eyes! Seriously, back then there was no issue with closing the deal, but now because we're at the end of the game, suddenly it's an emotional process? Nothing in this story has been about Bike's fear of losing the memory of his son once his vengeance is done, about him having to learn to finally let go. It's probably what the game wanted to be, but Origins lost sight of its objectives from the moment it started, and it never took the time to set it up. He never dealt with these feelings as far as we know, never shows any doubt in his rampage. It was always about being a poet of the kill in the name of his son. It is worth the loss to slay this snake at last. There are others to whom I must deliver justice. I wish to bring my son to the afterlife where he belongs. He didn't want to remember his son. He got rid of nightmares haunting him about him. He constantly expressed his desire to free his son's soul and his hopes to be reunited with him in the afterlife one day. I hope you get to hunt with your son again soon. So do I. 
So it's insulting that the game thinks it can get me to relate to his plight, now that we approach the finishing line. You return to Aya to explain that all is done. Their son is finally at peace. I have gone to shit to get our son out of the Duat. Him was at peace. However, she feels she must go to Rome and put an end to the order of ancient spread over there. This is Brutus and Cassius, our Roman brothers. No. Bad Ubisoft. Bad Ubisoft. Fuck you. Stop it. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. You introduce a legendary character in the Assassin's Creed universe, one whose existence we've known since 2010, but was always treated with legendary status, and give him one line? Ah. You are the famous Magi. Thanos never ceases to speak of your exploits. No introduction, no role to play in the story, he's not even wearing the goddamn armor of Brutus from Brotherhood. He just looks like every other NPC in this stupid game. You added him for the sake of nostalgia, and you couldn't even do that right. Cassius doesn't even get a line. Bayek is naturally upset at his wife leaving him forever, as they have one more conversation, where they realize they must sacrifice their personal lives for the greater good. What are you of now? A new creed. Ours is finished. And you know what? In theory, I don't hate this narrative arc. Bike was always emotionally driven. He acted rashly for the sake of his son and his people, serving as a surrogate father figure and protector to them. But only them. I will keep these fools at bay. Odd way to speak of your countrymen! Any who would give up on our people is no countryman of mine. As such, now that his son is avenged, he is more than happy to let things rest. Aya, you are the one joy left in my life. I want you at my side again. Aya, on the other hand, was always more calculated, seeing the larger picture. He will be more fodder for the Devourer. And then we return home. We will only return home with Cleopatra in our company, to show the Sea Ones what has changed, what we have changed. She went after the Order of Ancients to stop anyone from suffering the way they did, not out of a personal vendetta. She lifts my gaze to the horizon. I will never stop mourning what we lost. Never. But I must make a world that is larger than our griefs, so that no mother ever again lives what I have lived. The betrayal by Cleopatra, her would-be goddess, opened her eyes to the reality of the world. She now sees that innocence will always suffer as long as men are allowed to wield power unchecked. Tyranny must be fought actively to save the freedom of the people, and the future of the world. As such, there is no more room for personal attachment. She must be fully committed to her cause. Essentially, Aya moved on from Chemu's death, choosing to focus on bigger and greater things, while Bayek made it a part of his identity. And this dichotomy between the two of them would have been interesting if explored properly. Together, Bayek and Aya represent two different aspects of the creed. Bayek is the emotional, familial aspect, the one that makes it a brotherhood and keeps its concern for the innocence to the forefront. In other words, he represents the everything is permitted aspect of the creed. Meanwhile, Aya is focused on the larger picture. The end justifies the means. She sees the risks in objects like the Pieces of Eden and realizes her worldview was flawed. She represents the other half of the creed. Nothing is true. Basically, their dynamic is very similar to what Syndicate did with the opposition between Jacob and Evie, but the themes function far better in that game than in Origins for one simple reason. Screen time. For the narrative to work, we need to understand what makes Aya tick, what she believes and why she believes it. It's fairly easy to understand Bayek's motivations. You'd hope so, after playing him for 98% of the game. But Aya? Ultimately, we know nothing about her. Her relationship with Bayek and Rem was never presented by the game and we play her so little that we never get a proper grasp on her motivations. Instead, the story is entirely told through Bayek's POV, and so we understand her through that perspective, and it makes all the difference. Sure, their views differ on Cleopatra, but Bayek never notices that they're drifting apart. Foxidas has entrusted me with... Why don't we take each other here? In this reed boat. Take advantage of these rare moments between us, before your new job steals you away as savior of all Egypt. You make jokes, but it is not funny. They never talk it out the way Haytham and Connor did. So for him, and the player, all the moments of intimacy and overt sexuality are just that of a healthy couple. To him, as soon as their son is avenged, things will return to normal. However, if you were to tell the story from Aya's perspective, it would be very different. Suddenly the story becomes that of someone who has never really loved her husband, but instead loved the son they had together. 
When that was taken from them, she tries making up for the missing element through overt sexuality. Throughout the game, she refuses to talk about Remu, and instead keeps Bai quiet by offering him something he wants, i.e. her body. But we only have each other, without Remu. Let us be together, us two, each to each. But as things grow worse, as Cleopatra betrays her and her whole understanding of the world is flipped upside down, she comes to the realization that her relationship with Bai can no longer last. Their son, the thing that kept them together, is gone. Instead, she chooses to focus on a greater cause, leaving behind the life she once had in order to protect the people. But we never get that perspective. The only way to truly appreciate it is to play through the game, read the prequel book, and the sequel comic. By choosing not to let us play as, or at the very least understand Aya more, this entire major story beat falls completely flat. And it's easy to see that with the number of people who call Aya cold and heartless. The game never presents her in a way that she can be relatable. And it's bizarre. The game knows we should care more. It wants us to. In the modern day, Layla writes about how she was screaming when they split up, but also understood both their stances. Layla is a surrogate for the player, but she simply has a different experience from us. We don't have the bleeding effect. It takes more than a handful of missions to make us relate and understand Aya. You need to give more screen time. Syndicate understood this, splitting its missions fairly evenly between the two protagonists. But here, Ubisoft chose not to, compromising the entire thematic and emotional core of the story. Instead, the scene exists yet again to justify the existence of a piece of assassin iconography, namely their logo. I always thought it was just a stylized rendition of the Hidden Blade, but turns out it's the imprint of an eagle skull in the sand. You know, it would mean a lot more if the game had ever pointed out this eagle skull was important to Bayek because it belonged to him. If you look in cutscenes, the son is always wearing it. So his father wearing it throughout his revenge and then giving it up is a touching moment of character growth and also a cool way to symbolize how Hemu influenced the Brotherhood's creation. Shame the game never acknowledges it. There are definitely spots where it could, but the game refuses to let you in on anything of substance. What is that necklace you wear? An old eagle skull. I hope it brings us luck. This isn't show don't tell, it's don't show don't tell. The developers are treating character motivations and development the same way you would an easter egg, which negatively impacts the emotional apotheosis of this story. So without reading additional material, good luck picking up on it. Speaking of which, now might be a good time to mention the Juno plot thread the games had been following since 2012. Yeah, that also got resolved in a comic book and appears nowhere in this game. We a multimedia franchise now. Fuck you for expecting a video game franchise to have its overarching storylines resolved in video game format. The game narratives should stand on their own and be enhanced by external media, not use the additional content as crutches to patchwork the mess Ubisoft have ruined themselves in. The franchise has just become a corporate machine with no artistic vision or integrity, designed to trick people to buy Ubisoft's mess. And so Juno, uh, is, I, I, we know, is really, really, and was really, really important. So we knew it was important and we needed a, a sense of closure for this story. Uh, but that was not, and that couldn't ever be the core uh, narrative of uh, one big game. And so at least I think that now there is a sense of closure for this uh, narrative uh, line. Uh, we know that some people would have preferred to have that in games, but at the same time, especially with Origins also, we knew we wanted to, uh, to attract and to bring newcomers to the franchise. At least they're open about it. Better buy those spin-offs to get the full story. Go give Ubisoft that sweet, sweet fanboy money. Having split up, Aya heads to Rome to kill Caesar, and you start the quest Fall of an Empire, Rise of Another, which shows such a misunderstanding of the philosophy of the franchise, it's actually disgusting. Claiming the assassins are an empire flies in the face of everything the Brotherhood stands for. They were an organization that explicitly encouraged free will and thought and fought any supreme authority. The entire point was that you should never blindly follow in the footsteps of a leader. It's what Altair learned, it's what Ezio learned, it's what Connor learned, and it's what Arno learned. The franchise proved that dogma and nationalism were dangerous to the people and the assassins themselves. So to describe the assassins as an empire, the very thing they choose to oppose is embarrassing. For all their supposed push towards punk sensibilities, the developers really don't seem to get the movement's actual values. It's even more comical when you think for three seconds, and remember that the Roman Empire didn't fall into 476 after Christ, 500 years after this game. 
This is even delved in the sequel comic, in which Aya realizes that killing Caesar really didn't do much to help the people, instead starting a period of violence that ended with a stronger empire establishing itself. So well done, Aya, really showing off your strong strategic planning for the future of the Brotherhood. So really, this quest name is just wrong in every sense of the words. I know this is starting to become really nitpicky, but I'm honestly just so done with this game. After another naval battle, Aya gets to Rome and- Don't jump in the arena, don't jump in the arena, don't jump in the arena- God damn it, Aya! Great, another forced boss fight. Our second one against Septimius, that is identical aside from the setting. Previous games did have forced combat sequences, but they were fewer and farther between. They highlighted particularly emotional fights, such as fighting your mentor, fighting your family's killer, fighting your dad, fighting your mentor again. It contrasted them with proper assassinations. But here, the game's ending is just a gauntlet of forced fights. In fact, the last four targets are defeated in unavoidable boss encounters without any thought put into pacing. My son's heart. For your life. I thought their son was avenged, I thought that was the whole point of going to Rome, that they moved past personal matters to focus on the larger picture. Remo is at peace. May he walk in the field of reeds. I guess we needed to undermine the game's themes even more. Why not? Who cares? I don't care. I don't even care. Die. So Caesar is the king of the order now. Caesar is the father of understanding. Wait, no, I lied, I lied, I care immensely. I always thought the Father of Understanding was a metaphor, a sort of personification of the values of the Templars. Their belief was that everything needed order. It made sense that they would believe in a greater power driving them, as otherwise they would be contradicting their own values by achieving power through their own free will. But now, turns out Julius Caesar was the Father of Understanding? How does that make any sort of sense? The game seems to imply he's being manipulated by the Order of Ancients, as his close advisor whispers into his ear ideas of grandeur that would help them stay in control. The people love you, Caesar. You're a god. <laughs> the Senate will not bow so easily. That parliament of clucking hands. Let me be your wolf. Everything in the game indicated the Order leached on to whoever is most powerful and manipulatable at a current time. So at the start of the game it was Ptolemy, and after the Civil War it was Cleopatra and Caesar. Why would Caesar be the father of anything for the Order? But wait, in the Hidden Ones DLC, Rufio says this. Caesar built a strong Order. So he was actively working with the Order? Helping them spread across the Empire? He's now their public figurehead and architect, which makes him the guiding father? When did this power shift happen? When did he go from working with them to joining them and becoming their leader? If he was their leader, why did Septimius actively oppose him in the Civil War, going behind his back and attacking his men? Or did it happen later? The game certainly doesn't know, nor is it ever going to explain any of this. You can't just skip over important plot points like this, especially when your entire finale rests on this development. It's quite telling that Darby McDevitt, the only person at Ubisoft to remotely still understand the franchise, has tried to distance himself from this stupid line as much as possible by giving the vaguest answers. This whole thing is made even worse when you remember that in actual history, Caesar's policy was to give land to the people. He was a member of the political party the Popularis, which literally translates to favoring the people and his land reforms redistributed it to the poor, leading him to be loved by ordinary citizens. Meanwhile, the conservative political faction of the Optimians, which translates to the best ones, of which Brutus was a member, were opposed to this. This elite aristocracy despised Caesar for his repeated affronts to the status quo, and it led them to orchestrating his assassination. But don't you notice something weird? Yeah! Caesar's ideologies were way more in line with that of the assassins, and Brutus would fit far better as a Templar. In previous games, this discrepancy didn't matter. It added to the conspiratorial aspect of the franchise. It gave you a sense that something happened behind closed doors, and even though Caesar should be a good guy on paper, he was actually puppeteering things from the shadows. And this sequence was the last chance to tell us what that was, so let's see what Origins has to say for itself. We want a Rome that offers justice, peace, and land to all its citizens, not just the privileged few. You are just as privileged as I am. Wow! That is genuinely insulting. They flipped their ideologies! The game has put no effort into showing us why Caesar would be the villain, or why he would join the Order of Ancients, and instead of trying, just straight up misrepresents history. In order to frame Brutus as the good guy, and Caesar as the villain, 
they literally switched their political ideologies. It's like the writers couldn't be bothered to do any research and just settle for the laziest, dumbest, and most offensive representation of real world events they could come up with. And uh, you know, it's a game, you want to engage with these historical figures without dishonoring the, the true history of them. And again, there wouldn't be a problem if you stayed true to this legendary historical figure and showed that Caesar used progressive politics to disguise his tyrannical ambitions. But that's not what they did. Ubisoft are literally pulling an Abstergo and rewriting history in a sanitized, convenient way that fits the focus-tested needs of their product. This is what the villains were doing in Assassin's Creed 4. But now, well, nothing can ever be controversial or spark any sort of moral, ethical, or political quandary. Not here. Not anymore. While your mind is still processing that mess, you have a neat little stealth sequence through the court of the Roman Senate. It's neat, a nice callback to how Assassin's Creed 2 also ended with you going to Rome for a mission. You then have one last sequence of pseudo-social stealth that you actually can't fail, again reminding you of what the game should have been. You approach Caesar and... Why? Why? This whole game the assassination prompt has been F. So why does the game end with it being the E key? I know this isn't an issue on console, but seriously, it's baffling. On the PC, the game just breaks its own rules for the very last assassination. One final middle finger to anyone who actually wanted to play as an assassin. It's like the game is saying that assassinations don't actually matter, and that your input in them isn't important. Aya kills Caesar herself, completely undermining Brutus's role in the matter. But she said, Requiescat in pace, Caesar. That's the Ezio thing, guys! Look, we love the lore! Ignore all the other elements we retconned or undermined. Though in all seriousness, this memory corridor is actually good. It's simple, just a defeated target speaking his mind to his killer. No explosions or dramatic theatrics, it's much more understated, and it actually makes the kill feel more real and impactful. You could even see it as our protagonist finally being at peace after avenging Remu, something that is actually somewhat maintained with the memory corridors found in the DLCs. Okay, that's actually a nice touch. After that, Aya then threatens Cleopatra for the future, ensuring she always takes the people into account under pain of death. She then sends a final letter to Bayek to close things off and... I have renounced Aya. Oh no, oh no, I no, have no. killed oh, Aya. Don't you do it. I am now the hidden one. Don't you dare. Known as Amunet. Why? Why? I don't understand. Are you actually evil or just plain incompetent? So for people new to Assassin's Creed, Amunet was introduced in Assassin's Creed 2 as another mythical assassin, who killed Cleopatra using the poison of a snake. And here, as one final stupid reference, they reveal Aya is destined to become this great character for no reason. Why did Aya need to be Amunet? It's not to give the player the option to kill Cleopatra, as apparently they thought such an iconic kill, one that had been teased for nearly a decade, was worth saving for a comic book rather than the game. All this does is steal the legendary status from Amunet as a figure. It makes the universe feel smaller, as Aya was responsible for the assassinations of Julius Caesar and Cleopatra, rather than the responsibilities being split between her and Brutus. And it's handled incredibly lazily, with Aya just breaking the fourth wall, speaking into the camera. No effort put into proper suspense, narrative, or natural developments, like the closing of a play rather than that of a game. The creators just give you the information and you're supposed to squeal in delight. I clapped! I clapped when I saw it! Imagine instead of having Aya tell us she now wanted to be known as Amunet, we had gone in a section set years later with the simple objective, assassinate your target. The player would wonder what their real goal was as they stealth their way across to the waypoint. And then at the end, when you reached it, BOOM! Your target is Cleopatra. Every player familiar with lore would have lost their minds as they realized themselves that Aya had become Amunet. The reveal would have become far more dramatic and less confusing for newcomers by removing the lazy artificiality of the final speech. And it would have given us the satisfaction of witnessing this iconic assassination. But no, it's never even mentioned throughout the game. All Aya does is speak to us and do the vanish into the crowd cliche as the music cuts awkwardly. The way the revelation is handled only confuses new players and disappoints old fans like me by making Amunet a far less mysterious character, one who's underwritten and poorly represented in her own game. Just had to check that point off the clipboard, no matter the context or the quality. So there's your story. The origins of the centuries-old conflict between assassins and Templars. What an anticlimax. A mess of a story, where everything could have worked on paper, 
is presented in a way that nothing that happens relates to anything else in the game. A cliché narrative told in a poor fashion that was more concerned with introducing assassin iconography than in delving into the franchise's philosophy and themes. The game seems more concerned with showing us the founding of the Brotherhood than the birth of its ideology. The series is all about the Creed, it's always been about it. It's right there in the title! Everything else was fluff! The Hidden Blade was just a useful weapon for the Brotherhood's needs. The Leap of Faith was a mechanic to give players a means to get to street level quickly without taking fall damage that was explained as a way the assassins could show they had no fear. The logo was just a calling card for the assassins to recognize each other that didn't even make that much sense in practice. The games never even tried to justify the presence of the eagle iconography. According to Jade Raymond, it was just to highlight the bird of prey nature of the assassins, something that was never acknowledged in lore. If you think of what he's doing as an assassin, he's scanning the area, picking the key moment, going in for the kill and getting out. And that made us think of a bird of prey. So that became really the inspiration for Altair. It's why no one cared when Edward could do a leap of faith without training, when he instantly became accustomed to using the hidden blade. These are what gave the franchise its feel, but it wasn't its soul. The soul came from the philosophy of the creed, the belief that free will and questioning authority were things worth fighting for, the belief that while we should be free to act as we wish, that means we should be held responsible for our actions. And this story is completely devoid of any such thought. Bayek founds the Brotherhood as a means to enact his revenge while helping the people of Egypt. It's created purely reactively rather than as a result of a philosophical realization. And this is at the core of every flaw in this story. When you think about it, what did Bayek learn throughout the game? When you watch the final cutscene, is there anything that he does that he wouldn't have done in the past? Well, he's killing people incredibly viciously, like he did all game. He's got a soft spot for children and shows them kindness, but he was also doing that all game. He works in secrecy, except... I just wait in the shadows. He was doing that from the very start. He doesn't trust those in power, which he never did. I am Magi to no follow. He's over the death of his son, except not really, since he's still haunted by him somewhat. The game ends with him hearing Haimu say, Papa? Jump. Indicating the death of his son still drives him in moving forward with the Brotherhood. Maybe he's put his anger aside for the greater cause and helping the people of Egypt? No, wait, he's been doing that all game. He's doing it with friends now? No, he's worked with various people all across Egypt. So what did Bayek learn? Nothing. He ends up where he started. And the only thing that's changed is that his wife left him. And even that is undermined by the fact that they're buried together in the game's modern day section, indicating that they'll get back together at some point. He walks a child home, something he couldn't do with Haimu. But that's closure, not an arc. He failed Haimu in order to save another child, not because he was a bad parent. That's Shanjira! I said shut up! Run home to your mother. Shanjira will be fine. I will take care of it. Magi Bayek! Go! Now! I'm scared! I don't want to go home alone! Oh, Hemu, just do what I say! Please! As a person, Bayek is fundamentally the same from start to finish. A man who wants to do good by his people, even though he knows his era has come to an end, and there's little he can do to stop it. His worldview is never challenged, and he is never affected by his actions or that of those around him enough to actually undergrow any growth. He simply doesn't have an arc. And that would be fine. You can write characters without arcs. Just Right has an excellent video on the subject that I encourage everyone to watch. He explains that in that case, you need to show how a character's ideology clashes with the world he inhabits. You need to show how their actions affect the world around them, as they show through their convictions why they are in the right and everyone else is in the wrong. In the other movies we're looking at, the protagonist's efforts are evident in how they change the story world. But their influence is also evident in how they change key supporting characters who are typically allies. Bayek needs to be the impact character, the one that empowers others to have arcs. But that never happens here. Bayek helps people, but he never influences their ideals. As stated before, so few quests have follow-ups that you never get a sense of how his cause is shaping the land. He saves lives all the time, but you never feel like he's changing them. And yes, I would agree the founding of the Brotherhood will affect the world, but once again, one, you would never know that without playing the other games, and two, Bayek's founding has little to do with ideology beyond tyrants are bad. 
So it's hard to argue the bike symbolizes anything for the future of this world. Aya is the closest thing this game has to a character with an arc, but is Baek's founding of the Brotherhood what makes her change her perspective on politics? What pushes her to get involved in conspiracies and eventually sacrifice her life to fully commit to the cause? No! From the start of the game, she saw the larger picture, choosing to work with Cleopatra to stop anyone from suffering as she did. We have seen the Order's evil now. I will never stop mourning what we lost. Never. But I must make a world that is larger than our griefs so that no mother ever again lives what I have lived. When she was betrayed, she decided to take matters into her own hands, to deal with tyranny on her own terms. I will destroy Cleopatra for what she has done. The game tries to make you think Bayek had a role in this. You were right. I trusted the wrong goddess. Recall that Cleopatra was more than a friend. Yet I trusted her too well. You helped me see my mistake. But she realized the error in her ways after the betrayal happened. It's disingenuous to claim Bayek had a role in shaping her view on things when the thing that really swayed her opinion was her mistake catching up to her in the first place. Whether Bayek was there or not, she would have come to the same realization. Cleopatra used her for personal gain. Additionally, she and Bayek were in disagreement over what the future should hold for them, as she wanted to split while he wanted to return to their old way of life. We could never have been. Everything has told us our love is impossible. You are right. Something bigger has called us. But our love lives in the Duat. Only now we are letting go. Let the gods decide. And this division winds up separating them. So you can't argue Bayek was her impact character when the final act is built around their conflicting perspectives on how to move forward. And the game realizes this. Why do you think Aya gets the closing speech? Because she is the one forced to confront realities and adapt to them. Aya has understood that you have a new reality. Aya's world is turned upside down when Cleopatra, her queen that she has absolute faith in, betrays her for personal gain. The reality that those in power care not for others than themselves hits her, and she thus decides to adapt to the world of conniving conspiracies with the Brotherhood. This is to the point that she promises to, and eventually does, murder Cleopatra, a woman that she once considered a goddess in human form. This is character growth, a character arc of a human turning disappointment and betrayal into newfound strength and beliefs. Aya learns from her mistakes and challenges, and as a result makes decisions that fundamentally change who she is, and in the long run, impact the world. So why is she not the main character? I mean honestly. She kills four of the main game's 13 targets, including the last two. She's far more influential in the philosophical and political stance of the Brotherhood. She undergoes far more growth as a character, and is generally more challenged by the society she lives in. Ubisoft, is it because she's a woman? Look, I have no objections to games having male protagonists. Game developers should tell the stories they want to tell. But Ubisoft, and Assassin's Creed in particular, has had this increasingly bizarre relationship with female protagonists for a decade now. Where Liberation, a spin-off game on the Vita, had a female lead, but that was okay because it was a spin-off and didn't count. The main game still had a male protagonist. Then Syndicate comes out, and we finally have a main female character. But it's still okay, since you also get to play as her brother. And Odyssey has a canonically female lead, but Ubisoft still gives the option to play as a male character in the name of player choice. In fact, it's now confirmed that Cassandra was supposed to be the only playable character. But no, can't ever commit to a female lead. Origins is the same, as the female lead who you play for five missions crammed at the end of the game has more to do with the narrative than the male protagonist. And the same can be said for Layla. The game heavily implies she's gay, Layla, are you with me? Habibti! I told you not to call me that. But did you have to kill my best friend? Why did she? Oh, Habibti, I should have listened to you. But never actually commits to exploring this facet of her character in any way. Ubisoft just use her to queer bait audiences into believing their work is inclusive, but it's all half measures to appear progressive without actually taking any stance on anything but I'm still expected to clap and cheer at their push for inclusion? No, Ubisoft, you don't get brownie points for including a woman for part of your game, when in the last 20 years, you've only fully committed to a female protagonist in a flagship title in two games, Beyond Good and Evil in 2003, and Child of Light in 2014. 
Your games have consistently undermined female roles and, ah, uh, well, will you look at that. Many higher-ups at Ubisoft that worked on Assassin's Creed turned out to actively oppose the inclusion of women in the company's games. They ingrained a sexist culture within the company in such a strong manner that when the news leaked, they were fired for it. They actively opposed having Aya as the protagonist of Origins, even though the team's original intent was for Baik to die early on, handing the bulk of the story to her. I walk on your water. Yeah. That quote takes on a whole new meaning now, doesn't it? It doesn't even make sense. Sex sells. We've known this since at least the 1870s. So the only explanation for this push by the marketing team is blatant sexism, a complete disdain for women and their qualities, and a complete disconnect from current social trends. I am speculating here, but I believe it's very possible Darby McDevitt, lead writer on Assassin's Creed 4 and Revelations, was supposed to be the writer for Origins. We know he helped with the conceptualization in early stages, and it would make sense that the experienced writer would want the main character to be Amonet, the mysterious fan favorite. But around two years before the game's release, the project was shifted from Aya-centric to Bayek-centric by the higher-ups at the company. I think McDevitt either willingly dropped out of the project or was pushed out for wanting to tell the story of a woman. We were told he was working on a brand new IP, but that never saw the light of day since now he's working on Assassin's Creed again. So the question becomes, did that IP ever exist? Either way, he left the project, leaving the team without a lead writer, at which point a friend of the animation department with little to no experience in the industry was brought on in a panic hire to fill the void. Of course the game's story became a mess, as it was repurposed by an outsider into something it was never intended to be. Ultimately, Ubisoft, if your dev team wants to tell stories about female characters, let them. If they want to tell stories about guys, let them. The point is, let them tell the stories they want to tell. Don't force them to haphazardly recount the journey of a woman through the eyes of a different character that's barely affected by the story. And if your market research states that there absolutely needs to be a male protagonist, then write the story for the male character. Don't keep the secondary characters at the core of the game's actual conflict. The team was forced to remove almost all traces of Aya's role as the game's protagonist, but they didn't change the game's original Aya-centric story and didn't give Bayek any arc specific to him. The end result is that by the end of the game, Bayek, our supposed main character, seems worthless. If your game ends and the lead is all like, Well that just sort of happened to me, I mean I didn't even participate in that. Then there's a problem. This wishy-washy, will kind of let them play as a woman but not really attitude is insulting to the audience and only harms the overall narrative by being unfocused, less engaging messes of clashing themes and intentions. Throughout this entire essay, I've done my best to be respectful and understanding of the hardships the team may have gone through when making this game. But on this topic, I'm just gonna say it. Fuck the higher-ups and the marketing team that compromised and ruined the work and intentions of hundreds of writers, artists, and designers that poured their heart and souls into this game, as well as many other games Ubisoft has produced over the years. Oh, and I almost forgot about Layla. We get one more moment with her where William Miles shows up and offers her to join the Assassins. Does the name William Miles ring a bell? Assassin? How do you know about the assassins? Bayek and Aya refer to themselves only as hidden ones, and you shouldn't even know who William Miles is. Whatever, like, that's it. No conclusion, no resolution for existing loose ends. Just the promise they'll be flying to Kyra at some point, but not in this game and not even the next one. It's baffling to me that a game that opens with a disclaimer about being made by a team of different ideologies and backgrounds could come out saying so little about modern day. This disclaimer used to mean something. It was a badge of honor for the franchise. This was Ubisoft taking a stand and stating, yeah, we're going to some weird places. We might say things you don't like, but we don't care. And it made sense. The games dealt with some heavy themes that tied into our current world events. The franchise took a magnifying glass to world tensions and politics and created a satire of it, where everything was even worse. Mega corporations owned the world. Democracy must die to ensure the stability of the world. Capitalism will end it. Revolutions and wars were manipulated by shadow governments, all of which was grounded with real-life pictures of these events. Real-life individuals and events were tied to the imaginary aspect of the games to point a finger at their wrongdoings. I mean, Hitler being a Templar is an obvious choice, but Henry Ford, Winston Churchill, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt also? The hero of capitalism, the defender of the United Kingdom, and the man behind the New Deal were also on the side of, or at least manipulated by the bad guys? Now that was a bold statement for a blockbuster game. 
The conspiracies of Assassin's Creed worked because the modern day sections were essentially a satire of the real world, where everything was exaggerated, and thus even more obviously corrupt. A shadow corporation. They aren't listed anywhere, no stock options, nothing above the boards, but their members have holdings in other companies. Coke, Kraft, the pharmaceutical industry, Detroit, Wall Street, basically every company above a certain size has ties to Abstergo. So? They're on their way to running the entire world. They have people in government too, for Christ's sake. Everything was interconnected by the Assassins and the Templars, which made it simpler to draw the dots between events that seem unrelated in real life. It encouraged you to look outside and question whether what you were being told was actually what was in your best interest. Hello, Comstatic Customer Support, Diana speaking. I'm calling in reference to your HD cable service. Uh, there seems to be some kind of picture between the channels. It's not the guide channel. It has my name on it, my son's name, and a list of things we like. My credit card purchases, loans, travel. But now we have a meandering storyline where nothing is said besides you're good, those against you are bad. The characters you expect to betray you do, and your allegiances are never put to the test. You are never challenged to reconsider the world you inhabit or the media you consume. It's really baffling. In interviews they claim Mercier was hired for his punk sensibilities, and I'm all for that. That is exactly what the franchise needs. The will to say a big fuck you to the establishment. To challenge its audience to wake up and think critically about the world around them, for better or for worse. But the team's goals were clearly not focused on this. Which brings me to Ashraf Ismail, game director on the project. The guy made a name for himself by being the creative director of Assassin's Creed 4, Origins, and the soon to be released Valhalla, as well as seeming to be an all around swell guy. Oh, oh no! no. Oh, no. Oh, no. no. But even without that issue, and it is a huge one, I still don't think the guy should have been directing Assassin's Creed. Now hear me out. He's incredibly passionate about video games. He was capable of working under the pressure of being the figurehead of a million dollar project that hundreds were working on and still managed to deliver a final product that was at the very least playable. That takes skill and talent. But he doesn't get Assassin's Creed. When you look at the games he's made, there's the one where you play a pirate, the one where you play a warrior, and now the one where you play as a viking. None of these are about being assassins, or even settings that fit with those mechanics. Just watch this interview he made for Assassin's Creed 4. We wanted to, we felt that there's this opening to make the definitive pirate experience in video games. There's not many pirate games out there, and the really amazing ones are quite old now. At this stage of the industry, you know, when we're talking about blockbuster games, if you want to make a pirate experience, like, you, you have to, you, you have naval, you have cities, you have natural environments like jungles and caves. To do, to do all of that justice, you know, it's, it's a huge feat. And we have such a solid foundation on Assassin's Creed with knowing how to build cities and with AC3 having, pushing the, you know, navigating in the natural environments and the naval, we felt that there was time to do a pirate game within right. the AC universe. It's blatantly obvious Ashraf wanted to make a game about the golden age of piracy, something he was given the chance to do under the condition that it fell under the Assassin's Creed branding. When asked here what he loves about the franchise, this is what he said. What do you think it is about this franchise that has resonated, that, that people still care about? What are the core things that, that keep this going? I think the, the most obvious stuff is, um, you know, we're, we're, we're one of the only series that plays with history mm -hmm. in a very credible and direct way. What he loves about Assassin's Creed is its potential as a historical anthology AAA franchise. Its potential for historical tourism, for recreating these historical worlds. Probably the most immersive simulation of ancient Egypt ever created on planet Earth. It's pretty wild, right? Yeah, it, it, you know, that, that runs through my mind quite often that I think uh, going inside the Great Pyramid, I was thinking, you know, I think this is the closest I've ever had in a, an experience in a game or even, uh, you know, film. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's cool that we're able to bring that to life. And that's a big part of the appeal, but not only. Assassin's Creed at its best is also about the philosophy of free will versus order. It's about hiding in a crowd in order to get closer to your target, about escaping through complex parkour, and all this was wrapped up in centuries worth of conspiracies, all intertwined in deep lore. His games have all been lacking that. He uses Assassin's Creed to explore different time periods and different types of historical warriors, not to explore the fantasy of being an assassin or to look critically at current political events. He should have been working on a single player version of For Honor, not Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed 4 is one of the best games in the franchise, but the more I look at it, the more it seems to have been a happy accident. 
The entire game's narrative is about a character who wishes to be a pirate, but over the course of the adventure learns there is a higher cause, and joins the assassin. The opposition between wanting to make a pirate game and making an assassin game was very much at the core of the narrative, making the opposition and gameplay click. Even the modern day was something that was very close to home for Asha, as it poked fun of game development. On the development side of things, I mean, we had a lot of fun with it. Uh, you know, we were making fun of Ubisoft. So, oh, so, hey, <laughs> look at that! <laughs> we were making fun of ourselves, we were making fun of game development. Uh, you played as some developer doing research, constantly being talked down to by management and higher-ups who constantly compromised the true potential of the story you were uncovering. These are things I'm certain he battled with on a daily basis at work, so of course this comes through nicely. But it all seems to indicate that he was feeling limited by the franchise. Kinda makes the quest where you killed the Italian diplomat with Ezio's voice more of a statement than a fun easter egg. Dio Dio, he's revolting! <laughs> He wanted Assassin's Creed as we knew it to end, and wanted to explore history without that burden. But then he gets a bit of creative leeway for Origins after the success of 4, and all of a sudden, things take a turn for the worse. Social stealth is removed, the philosophy and feel of being an assassin also. The conspiratorial and political aspects of the franchise in both the modern day and the past are all but dropped, and what little is left has events recontextualized in ways that don't change the events that have taken place in this world, but do take away from the spirit and scope the series used to have. These are not things that interest him. What Ashraf saw in Assassin's Creed was an opportunity to recreate historical settings and explore various historical iconography. Look, Ashraf loves games, and he clearly loves history, but he has no interest in the political side of Assassin's Creed. In the games he's directed, the closest we've gotten to actual additions to the web of interconnected events being manipulated by secret organizations has been references to Ubisoft's Watch Dogs games. Twice. That's been confirmed by both Azaizi Aymar, the head of Assassin's Creed content, and Darby McDevitt, the best narrative director currently at Ubisoft, that these are easter eggs and not to be taken as canon. So it adds nothing to the actual narrative core of the franchise. I 100% believe Ashraf included these with all the good intentions of the world, as a tip of the hat to the Watch Dogs team, because he knows how difficult it is to create a AAA game in the industry. But when these fun references to game development have come at the expense of some of the most complex and interesting aspects of the franchise, I really must question its future. Ashraf removed all the elements that made Assassin's Creed, but didn't replace them with anything. It would have been fine if his new vision for the franchise had brought something new to the table, but it didn't and the final product now just feels soulless. I think yeah. there is this element of inclusiveness and diversity that's inherent to the series that I think does draw in a lot of people makes and global. makes them feel comfortable. Yes, exactly. I'll go no more a roaming with you, fair maid. I have walked from one end of the earth to the other. I'll now look at the game's downloadable content quickly, but I won't stay on it long. Mainly because I know people will say the Hidden Ones fleshes out Bayek's conclusion and the creation of the Brotherhood, but the game should have stood on its own anyways, and not require me to spend an additional 50 bucks in order to obtain the full story. And also from a gameplay standpoint, they don't really offer anything new aside from new regions and a higher level cap. So first we have the Hidden Ones. Set four years after the main campaign, this DLC is an epilogue of sorts to the main game, and should probably have been included in order to round out Bayek's story. It sees him respond to a distress call from the Brotherhood in Sinai, currently at war with Rome. A short intro shows that Bayek has become a sort of legend of sorts, defender of the downtrodden, like Zoro, whose achievements are sung by the people. Listen, let me tell you of him, the legend of Siwa, the shadow who is Bayek. Bayek, Bayek, Bayek. Mm, Bayek. Sounds like quite a man. And look at that. They actually made a proper title card. One with charm and emotional buildup. This already makes for a far more appealing presentation to the world. We meet with the local assassins and go about dismantling the Roman oppressors through assassinations. Along the way, we meet strong, driven warriors and initiate them into the Brotherhood. Your standard Assassin's Creed pair. But it all has a bit less heart put into it than it did in earlier games. Take the initiation ceremony sequences, for instance. 
The leap of faith is still used as a sort of baptism by the air into the Brotherhood, and the parallels between Bayek telling these lost souls to jump and him telling his son are fairly emotional. Jump. What must I do? Jump. However, in previous games, it took a while to see assassins get to this ritual. You had to train them, manage them, send them on missions in order to slowly improve their abilities. You saw them grow as they unlocked more skills that you actually saw them use. And during all this time, they never used the leap of faith. They would run away, jump off buildings, but never do the leap. The leap only came once you trained them up to the level of Master Assassin, and it was their final test to become a true assassin. Here you just meet a character for one quest and then make them do the leap. It lacks a sense of emotional payoff, especially given as they never return in gameplay later. You run around Sinai helping capture the hidden ones of rebels and kill three enemies spread across the region. I really like the contrast between Bayek's down-to-earth nature compared to the admiration all the initiates have meeting their founder. It is an honor to meet you, mentor. No formalities, Kashta. We are both equally hidden ones. Taira said you would come. Who is my target? It's only fitting for Bayek. He was always ambivalent to the existence of the Brotherhood, wanting only to return to his old life. Of course he wouldn't see himself as a big deal when he sort of accidentally stumbled into becoming the creator of this big thing. You work alongside the leader of the local rebels, Gamelat, and I also like the dynamic going on here, with Gamelat looking to start a war while Bayek must explain that the Hidden Ones are not an army. The Hidden Ones have no place in battles. But, we can help the Rebellion by eliminating the Roman leader. He instead chooses to help from the shadows, targeting specific enemies, while Gamelot chooses to spotlight. Yet they respect each other and view each other as strong allies. Soon they become heroes of the people. However, their actions have two consequences. The death of many civilians who become martyrs to the cause, and the placement of a spotlight onto the Hidden Ones. This of course doesn't go down well. The Assassin's Bureau is discovered and destroyed. Bayek is captured and crucified, only to be saved in the nick of time by Aya. Hamunet! <sighs> by Hamunet. And their reunion is one two normal people would have. Put some clothes on. Show some decency. <laughs> um... Is the game making fun of how they would always have sex upon meeting? Because I feel like that's what's happening here. How is it that Bayek and Aya- Hamunet! Amune, God damn it. How is it they feel more like a real couple now that they've split up? They actually talk about their thoughts and feelings without having to slobber all over each other at every opportunity. It's weird. It reinforces the idea that the developers wanted their relationship in the main game to be framed as unhealthy, but they failed at ever hinting at that. Anyways, she scolds Bayek for bringing too much attention to himself. The same happened with Brutus and Cassius. The more known we are, the less safe the Brotherhood is. Would have loved to have seen that game, but sure, I'll read a comic instead. However, their mistakes are actually given weight and consequences when Tahira dies. Don't let our creed fade. <coughs> Her words inspire Bayek to begin creating the core values of the creed as he starts questioning the longevity of the assassins. Every assassination leads to a reminder to Bayek that the order is eternal. The order is eternal! The Order is eternal. The Order is eternal. You see this distress him as he begins to question the utility of the Hidden Ones. He fears that all his efforts, all his sacrifices will prove worthless. Eh. Have we done good? They will have peace until the Romans send another general. It is endless. As such, he realizes the Hidden Ones must become more than just a group of killers. It needs to become the center point of an ideology. We must make the Hidden Ones as enduring as the Order. The Creed must live beyond anyone. Baik realizes that the Brotherhood lacks that symbolic core, that Creed, that will allow it to last. He sees that the Order of Ancients is built on principles, which means it's not tied to one individual. You can kill me. But you cannot kill us. By comparison, the assassins admire Bayek and Amunet as symbols of their cause rather than any sort of ideology. They're committed to their leaders, not the cause, as the game repeatedly shows. So following Tahira's last request, 
Bayek realizes the creed must become more concrete of an ideology, one with rules and tenets that can outlast him. It's a shame the values of the Hidden Ones weren't more developed before this point. It would have made Tahira's commitment to their essentially non-existent creed not seem as much like an arbitrary plot point. This also makes the main game's creation of the Brotherhood feel even more lackluster, as the creed really only got created four years later. Bayek and Aonek go after Rufio, and come across a village massacred in the process. It's revealed that Gamelat has been purposefully letting civilians die in order to create martyrs for his cause. He has constantly been looking for symbols for his revolution, singing the praise of Bayek. He focuses on image rather than action to attain a reaction from the people. To him, the ends justify the means, but to Bayek, his entire cause is about protecting the people, so he can't abide by senseless deaths. And this betrayal works! The DLC built up a Nihali from the start, before revealing he goes against your values at the end. Even better than that, their reasoning actually makes sense. You see where he's coming from. His intentions are good, but his methods are not. As such, when you head off to fight him in the only forced boss fight in the DLC, you're filled with conflicting emotions, and it's disappointing in a good way to realize Bayek can't reason with him. We fight on the same side. No. Yeah, we simply fight. In death, Gamelat sees the error of his ways, and he and Bayek agree the Hidden Ones shall never purposefully harm innocents again, creating the stay my blade from the blood of the innocent tenant of the Creed. In a final scene, we learn Gamelat's death has overshadowed the Hidden Ones' actions, returning them into obscurity. This is represented really well by the bard switching his song from one about Bayek at the start to one about Gamelat at the end. And Bayek and Amunet make a speech to the camera about how the creed must outlast them all. And as such, its principles must be upheld at all cost. Our tenets need to be passed on to those who have taken our oath, so they have a true creed to study. When I return to Rome, I will not speak of heroes. I will speak of discipline and perseverance. They have realized that discipline and ideology will allow their influence to be everlasting, much like the Order of Ancients. They need a creed to ensure the legacy. And as one final goodbye, Amunet reassures Bayek that this is the right route. We have done good. Bayek has finally set the assassins on a path beyond one of mindlessly fighting against authority. The DLC is good. It's what the entire game should have been. Are characters making mistakes and creating the core ideologies of the Brotherhood as a reaction? They are the decisions that should have led to the creation of the Assassins. The smaller scale of the story makes for a far more coherent narrative than anything found in the main game, with actual thought put into presentation and pacing. There are themes here that don't contradict themselves and the narrative arcs, if a little rushed, are very much present and enjoyable. The team were obviously capable of creating something at least decent. So why was the main game such a mess? I can only speculate, but I think Origins had an incredibly difficult production cycle. Th this was a challenging production, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. I think their reworking of the game mechanics and the quest structure proved harder than the team anticipated, even with an extra year of development. And this couldn't be helped by the reworking of the plot to place Bayek at the forefront instead of Ayan posed by the marketing team. As such, in order to release on schedule, a lot of content had to be cut, leading to the nonsensical plot, the mechanical shallowness, and the unappealing presentation. But with the DLC's reduced scope, the team were allowed to refocus, iron out any communications issues without having to worry about the core mechanics. They didn't have to figure out how to implement mechanics or how to rework an entire narrative into something it was never intended to be in the first place. And this gave them the opportunity to create something at the very least closer to their original vision for the whole game. And it led to an at least passable product. But again, I'm only speculating here. As for Curse of the Pharaohs, well, well, it's mainly an excuse for the developers to put in Egyptian myths into the game. Much like the tyranny of King Washington, this DLC is mostly a fever dream taking place in Bayek's head. Thing is, King Washington still served a purpose to the main game, exploring the psyche of its characters through the lens of an alternate history. Here, everything feels superfluous. I mean, you as Bayek physically head to the Field of Reeds, and you don't bump into Hemu? That seems like a huge oversight. It would have been the perfect way to bookend Bayek's story, as he says one final goodbye to his son in the afterlife. Though the DLC was not developed by Ubisoft Montreal and like the main game, but instead by Ubisoft Sophia, which might explain why it generally feels disconnected from the main game. 
As the team switched, the focus went in new directions, creating this severe lack of cohesion with the main game, especially when compared to the hidden ones. In general, the worlds you explore are still beautiful, perhaps even more so than the main game, but the things just feel disconnected when the narrative has no impact on Bayek or even the franchise. The story ends with Bayek entrusting a piece of Eden to Sutek, basically a stranger. He trusts him to hide it, then not even in a quest, you can find his lifeless body, and the only reaction you get is... Sutech, he deserved more than this fate. And the relic is... gone. I pray to Amun he hid it well. It's not exactly an incredible bookend to the narrative, rather just a huge gaping loose end. Its structure also returns to the bizarre nature of the main game. Characters jump around, appearing out of nowhere in cutscenes that seem incomplete. This must end, Isidora. Sometimes their order seems wrong also. When first visiting the afterlife, Bayek has no reaction. He just goes through a portal without hesitating. No questions asked, because a marker told the player to do so. But then further into the DLC, Bayek enters a similar portal, and he suddenly questions its nature and only goes through when given a sign from God. It's kind of bizarre. And the DLC is rife with unskippable boss fights against the mummy pharaohs which are balanced for late game and just not fun to play against. They repeat the same unblockable, uninterruptible 10 or more hit combos. Trying to attack them at any point during the combo is instant punishment, leaving little time to get hits in during their cooldown. This repeats for far too long, as you spam the overpower and fast bow attacks that are the only way to deal decent damage. And these fights in no way add to the characters. Bayek once considered these pharaohs gods. Him meeting their spirit and murdering them should probably cause some conflicting emotions, but all the game musters up is vague musings such as Nefertiti, was she a pharaoh, or a god, or was he ever a god, or only a mortal? They don't tie into any sort of themes or morals that the story could put forward. Oh, but it does contain my favorite character in the whole game. Ooh, and you are? Looking for the scribe. You and half of Yebu, <laughs> but no one has seen him since yesterday. I need to find him. But why would I know where he is? I am only the one who pays his wages. Try the hunter's village. He has a taste for exotic meat, if you know what I mean. No. No, I don't. Hippo, silly! <laughs> thank you, Neb. No, thank you, Neb. And if you do find him, tell him he's fine. I don't know. There's something about the delivery that I just absolutely adore. The side characters here in general just have more charm than those in the main game. So, about my finder's fee? Oh, you could give it to me from the goodness of your heart. <laughs> Unless you already lost that on another bad roll of the dice. Take it with my blessing. Ha! Ah. Maybe it's because the presentation is generally improved, with cutscenes transitioning naturally from cinematic to gameplay without awkward pantomime conversations or load screens. Overall, the DLC is fine, but it does feel pointless. Not essential to appreciate anything about the game's narrative or its protagonist, but neat if you enjoy the gameplay and want to see Ubisoft's rendition of the Egyptian afterlife and mythological creatures in their full glory. It's the Assassin's Creed equivalent of a Call of Duty Zombies mode. At the end of the day, the DLCs are more of the same. They add some closure narratively, but definitely won't change your opinion on the game. They are mainly there to grant the player additional regions to explore in a higher level cap and try to make amends for some of the main game's most glaring flaws, but it's too little too late. Oh, Discovery Tour? Yeah, Discovery Tour is freaking fantastic. Turns out, removing all the gameplay and story aspects of the game so that all that remains is the beautiful world, heightened by interest and commentary given by actual historians and an expansive database of images and scans, makes the game far more interesting. You actually get to appreciate the detail put in the world by the artists without being interrupted by the game's lesser elements. You gain a true appreciation for this distant culture, something the campaign never took the time to do. Every good aspect of the game is pushed to the forefront, while its flaws are made basically irrelevant. Discovery Tour is a thing of beauty from a historical and educational standpoint. It makes the game's $70 price tag almost single-handedly worth it, but you can also just buy it as a standalone, which I do recommend you do. 
and I truly hope every Assassin's Creed game has a discovery tour going forward. It's just a shame that I can't say the same for the game part of this video game. brother. Requiescat in pace. How does it feel to have lived long enough to see all of your favorite franchises go down in flames? Feels great. <laughs> so why do people love this game? Assassin's Creed Origins is not the worst game I've ever played. It's mechanically functional, with good voice acting and incredible artistry put into its world. In 2017, depending on who you asked, you would be told Assassin's Creed hadn't been good since 2014, 2013, or even 2010. People were excited to see a new game in this franchise, and they actually wanted to like it. Assassin's Creed is an incredible concept for a game, a historical anthology that blends action, stealth, and parkour in these unique worlds, tied together by complex lore and emotional storylines. When Origins arrived, it was new and different for the franchise, in a setting that's severely underutilized in all media. People waved away any narrative or gameplay flaws the game had, or the fact that Red Dead Redemption, Witcher 3, Breath of the Wild, and Horizon Zero Dawn had all done it better years before, because they wanted to like this game. People latched onto the game's intent, its pitch, rather than the final product itself. But I couldn't. I wish I could stand here and tell you I loved it, that it was the perfect reinvention of the franchise. I tried, trust me, I tried to like it, but I can't. In fact, I've never despised a game more than this one. While Assassin's Creed was on a rocky path for years, attempting to reinvent itself with varying levels of success, Origins was the moment the franchise as I loved it was put to rest for good. And it was done by a development team with the talent and experience to know better. It frustrates me to see people continuously defend Origins, when every flaw Odyssey and Valhalla have finds its roots way back in this game. The nonsensical themes and narrative, the removal of social stealth, the dumbed down parkour, the needless retcons, and the makeup as we go approach the storytelling. It all started here, with this game. But old fans ignore this and new ones deny it out of blind adoration for a flawed product. Personally, if I have one good thing to say about Origins, is that it taught me to appreciate all the games that came before it, even the ones I used to be ambivalent towards. It sucks. I remember a time where Assassin's Creed was something new, something mysterious, something exciting for the medium and the entertainment industry at large. A time when it pushed technological boundaries to bring to life worlds we could interact with in new ways. A time when it was a franchise that had a vision, a fantasy it wanted its players to experience and engage with, and it committed to it in every way it could to make it shine, through writing, animations, mechanics, you name it. A time when I loved this franchise so much, I convinced my parents to take me to Venice on holiday, and the next thing they knew, we had this picture of me. Yes, it was badass, the game, not the picture. And the graphics were unlike anything I had experienced at the time, but it also had a purpose, an actual view on the world, on society and politics, and would make its stance known to the player. Maybe it only amounted to capitalism and big corporations are bad, but honestly, look outside and tell me that's not even more relevant today than it was back then. Assassin's Creed was a blockbuster AAA game, but it also had narratives and themes it wanted its players to engage with. In 2007, I can only think of a handful of mainstream games that committed as much to challenging their players' worldviews. Over the last decade, we've seen the industry evolve, as new boundaries are constantly being pushed forward in new and exciting directions. Game creators have been expanding the horizons of the industry, and dare I say it, the art form, dabbling in new types of stories and creating characters of increasing complexity. And to see Assassin's Creed, one of the instigators of this evolution in game storytelling during the 7th console generation, fall so far behind and become the very thing it used to mock and criticize, is truly heartbreaking. So many franchises reinvented themselves this generation while staying true to their origins. Why couldn't Assassin's Creed? The franchise used to be a pioneer, something unique and creative, 
Now it's yet another game with nothing to say. A power trip made for everyone to sink $70 and then never think of again. A game about running around a pretty and vibrant world in order to kill things to get loot in an endless loop with little regards to actual narrative or social commentary. And it seemingly doesn't want to be anything else. The blockbuster franchise that used to poke fun at mass-marketed products designed to distract you from the horrors of the world around you became exactly that. A faceless product. A logo slapped on a flashy setting designed to wow you enough to overshadow how shallow it actually is. Maybe I'm just old, clinging on to the past, refusing to let things change. But 10 years on, people still remember Ezio and his home in Florence. Why do you think Assassin's Creed merchandising still references the Italian games and never the newer ones? 10 years from now, I have no doubt people will remember Origins' rendition of Ancient Egypt, but I seriously question whether the same can be said for Bayek or Aya. If you enjoy this game and its story, I'm glad you have something that brings you joy and entertainment. In spite of all I've said, I still love Assassin's Creed. It's not like the old games have gone anywhere. They'll stay there. I just don't love this franchise in the same way I once did. I'll always keep track of the games out of the corner of my eye and have a slight twitch of excitement when they announce a new installment, but the speculation and anticipation is no longer there. Origins made it clear that Ubisoft's vision for the franchise no longer has anything to do with the one I loved, at a narrative, mechanical, and philosophical level. I will always hope the franchise I loved will one day return. The thought lingers in my mind like an image from an old dream. And here, at last, I discover a sad truth. That though Assassin's Creed has long been gone, it will also never return. And that just hurts to say, after growing up with these games, their characters, and their worlds. Requiescat in pace, fratello mio.